good good morning um, good afternoon good evening to the participant here and those that are following uh, virtually we will start our first session of the day and um, this session um, the morning session is um, innovation at the UN for 10 billion people. And then the first session, we will have two uh, speakers. The first speaker is Manfredi Caltagirone, International Methane Emission Observatory at UNEP. And our second speaker will be Bernhard Bass, Human Settlement Officer, Regional Office of Asia and the Pacific and Sub-Program Coordinator, Climate Change and Urban Environment, UN Habitat. So we will first listen to our first speaker, Manfredi uh, Caltagirone. Manfredi, you have the floor. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks for, for, for the invitation. I'm gonna try to share my screen so that I can uh, show a few slides, if that is possible. Can you, can you see my, can you see my slides? I see a UN Habitat. Yes, yes we can see your slide now. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk yeah. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to present the work of UNEP on on methane mitigation and in particular the work of that, that we put forward in, in the last years on the International Methane Submission Observatory. Um, so let me let me start by reminding everyone why methane matters. Uh, as, as these audience certainly know, we're not on track to reach the 1.5 degree target uh, of the Paris Agreement. And methane, uh, as we all uh, have realized in this first week of COP, uh, following especially the announcement of the Global Methane Pledge earlier uh, on Tuesday, is, is an important part of the short-term solution to climate change. Uh, it's high, the, the, the high global warming potential of methane and, and its short duration in the atmosphere uh, give us an opportunity to turn down the thermostat as we decarbonize our economies. It allows us to buy time. Um, and so uh, where, where does methane come from? Um, energy, agriculture and waste are the three, the three main sectors. Uh, responsible for anthropogenic methane, uh, methane emissions, that is around 60% of the total emissions. Uh, but the energy sector, uh, in particular the production of coal, oil and gas, is the sector with the highest reduction potential, most of which is, is actually at a low uh, or, or no net cost. Uh, and because the, the, the product, methane, can be, can be then sold uh, and, 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 and so resources can actually be, uh, you know, can, can, are available for, for those collecting the, the methane that otherwise would be, would be vented. And so the, the, the highest reduction potential in, in the energy sector is why EMEO will work uh, first uh, to catalyze action in, in this sector and then move to, to agriculture and waste as, uh, as, as area of, uh, of other potential reduction opportunities. Uh, so now let me be extremely clear. Uh, methane, is, methane mitigation is not a substitute uh, for uh, or a reason to delay the carbonization efforts uh, to how, the, the, in the words of the UN Secretary General, to delay putting an end to our addition to fossil fuels. Uh, but it is a key action to put our societies on the least cost pathway to meet the 1.5 degree target as noted by the IPCC in, in its latest report, the year six. So methane emission, methane emission mitigation is a necessary action under any decarbonization scenario, but it is not a reason to delay uh, decarbonization efforts. Um, so what, what is then that, that IMEO will be doing? 
One of the main problems with methane mitigation is that we have not a good enough idea of when and where methane is released in the atmosphere and how much of it it is actually released. Uh, methane has historically received less attention than CO2 and, and accountability for emitters has lacked even more than, than in the case of CO2. So NMEO wants to change this and, and provide accurate data to stakeholders, be those governments, uh, oil and gas and coal companies, civil society, uh, as well as agency to those that can actually reduce methane emission at the asset level. Uh, the problem is that until now emissions are largely estimated, not measured. Uh, and we know, uh, thanks to the work of many organizations over the last years, that these est estimations underrepresent the, the size of the problem. Uh, in the United States, a country with one of the best uh, uh, greenhouse gas inventory globally, peer-reviewed scientific papers confirm that oil and gas methane emissions inventories underestimate measured emission by 60%. Uh, and a series of studies that UNEP coordinated in the last years uh, around the world confirmed that, that the same is happening in most countries. Uh, some studies showed measured methane to be 25 times, 25 times the amount uh, that, that, that was reported. And, and these obviously uh, create difficulties in targeting action, understanding where to, 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 to actually uh, go and mitigate emissions. And, and EMEA intends to revolutionize the way methane is measured and, and, and integrate accurate data from a variety of sources to create the first global public data set of empirically verified methane emissions at an increasing level of granularity and accuracy and with clear indication of, of the uncertainty. Uh, data is, is indeed the foundation to, to be able to target and accelerate actions on, on methane emissions as noted. However, data needs to be combined with other important priorities, including science, transparency, and, and implementation, action on the ground. And this interconnection is, is really the basis of the theory of change of the International Methane Emissions Observatory. Uh, through its data-driven approach, IMEO aims to progress against these three key goals of closing the, goal, the knowledge gap, provide accurate, unbiased, and up-to-date information, and raise awareness and increase the capacity of governments to actually act on methane mitigation. We won't have time to get into the details of the different functions of, of INEO, but let me just say that it intends to provide unbiased, precise information that are able to catalyze targeted mitigation actions and hold governments and companies accountable for their commitments, including indeed the, the Global Medium Pledge. So how, how we will be doing this uh, is by integrating data from principally four sources. Uh, companies report uh, under the Oil and Gas Medium Partnership 2.0, peer-reviewed scientific data, national inventories, and, and satellites data. I'm going to touch very quickly on, on these four sources uh, of, of data and, and start with the Oil and Gas Medium Partnership that is a, that is a UNEP-led led transparency initiative under the, the Climate and Cleaner Coalition that currently has over 70 member companies uh, across the, the, the entire value chain, covering around 30% of oil and gas production uh, globally. Uh, companies have agreed to report all their emissions from operated and unoperated assets following a robust methodology that will lead them in three to five years to actually report measured emissions reconciled using bottom-up and top-down methods. Uh, we don't have time to get into the details, but let me confirm this is an extraordinary change compared to previous transparency initiative and, and allows for a standardization of, of reported emission uh, across the oil and gas industry. Uh, so EMEA will be receiving asset level data from all these jurisdictions around the world. We, we, we have a good coverage uh, at the outset and indeed we intend uh, increasing the, the, the participation in the partnership and, and, and welcome the participation of other uh, oil and gas companies uh, that, that will be providing data. But, but obviously we won't be uh, 
we won't be relying only on self-reported data from the industry, even if uh, through an agreed uh, and robust methodology, but, um, but, but we'll be integrating, EMU will be also integrating uh, data from scientific studies. Uh, EMU has already begun and, and will continue to fund scientific studies around the world, uh, building on the approach and the success of the meat and science studies that were performed under the Climate and Cleaner Coalition over the last years. And here there are some examples of, uh, of, of studies that, that, that have already been published or, or areas uh, in which papers are, are in preparations. And, and you can also see the, the, the scientific principles that, that, we'll, that we'll be using. Um, this is a map with an indication of uh, areas where we already have conducted studies and, and the green dots are uh, actually where uh, we are planning and, and uh, already started the, the, the planning for, uh, for additional studies. And then finally, uh, the, the, another important source of emission, of emission data uh, will be satellites. And, and there are a variety of, of satellites that are uh, already in orbits, already launched, or, uh, and many others that will be launched shortly that have the ability to, to identify methane. Uh, and, and their main difference is really about the scale, uh, um, the frequency, uh, and, and the precisions of, uh, of, their, of their observations. And, their, and, and the connections of all these uh, uh, satellites will, uh, with the other sources of data will be able to provide us this uh, um, very precise uh, and, and direct um, estimation of, 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 uh, of methane emissions uh, globally. Uh, we indeed uh, intend partner with the methane ecosystem. We, we believe IMEO uh, should be central to this by, by providing uh, data that, that this larger ecosystem can rely on. Uh, and and the, indeed, the, the IMEO has been already highlighted uh, in the Global Methane Pledge uh, initiated by the EU and the US uh, has the, the instrument to create a sound scientific basis for methane emissions calculations uh, and delivering on, on the objective of the Global Methane Pledge. Um, it has been launched uh, recently at the beginning of the week at the G20 Summit uh, in Rome that for the first time recognized methane as not only an important contributor to, to climate warming, but also one of the quickest and most cost-effective ways uh, to, limit, to limit climate change. And I knew in particular has been singled out as an important initiative, uh, able to provide high quality scientific data that can again target and accelerate uh, methane action. Uh, and then on Sunday, uh, at the occasion of the launch, we also released our, our first annual report uh, that describes the theory of change and, and includes uh, initial analysis on the reports uh, of emissions done, done by companies in this first year of the oil and gas media partnership 2.0, uh, recognizing that despite the best efforts of those companies, the quality of the data is still fairly limited and, and work needs to be uh, done in, in the future to increase the, the accuracy and, and granularity of, of this data. Uh, this is my last slide and uh, just, just to summarize, IMEO wants to position itself as a trusted source of, of integrated methane emissions data uh, and wants to work with partners at every level, from the policymakers to those who have agencies to reduce emission at the asset level, partnering with the different societal, societal actors uh, that are working in, in the methane ecosystem. Uh, its theory of change and role has been endorsed by the G20 this year. Uh, and we'd be very happy to, 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 to engage with you further uh, and discuss how your organizations can, can contribute to, to these efforts. Um, here, there are a few links uh, in case you want more information and indeed don't, don't hesitate to get in touch uh, uh, through the IMEO uh, email address or, or indeed with uh, my email address here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Manfredi. Um, I, I have one immediate question. I think in the current context of this uh, global methane pledge, um, we know that you, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So you have first to measure if you want to, to manage. So will the 
International Methane Emission Observatory play a role in this global methane pledge? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's uh, that's that. I think is 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 one of the key elements, as as you said, to to be able to uh, not only credibly uh, confirm that the emission reductions have been achieved, but critically to target and accelerate actions in these decades that that we have. The the, the task at hand is 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 quite extraordinary. Uh, Thirty percent reduction by 2030 is indeed a very ambitious target that will be requiring the engagement of many actors and to be able to coordinate these actions in a way that is the most effective uh, to actually reduce emission reduction will require a much better understanding of the underlying reasons why methane is emitted in the first place, but critically where, how much and when methane is emitted so that, so that different actors can use this information to, to then really target and accelerate action in, in a way that uh, can lead us uh, to these ambitious targets. One additional question from my side. Um, to achieve this ambitious objective, do we have already all the instruments in place? So meaning the technology, the right policies, the right financial instrument, is everything in place and just need to be deployed, or are there new instruments that need to be created? Well, I, I think it really depends on on which sectors we're we're discussing. In the in the energy sector, uh, technology exists. The, the International Energy Agency confirmed that uh, we could achieve a 75 percent reduction of methane emissions with current technologies, and and also that 50 percent of these emissions would be achieved at zero net cost. So uh, actors would actually make money pretty quickly uh, with, with avoided wasted gas. Uh, in the energy, uh, in the waste and agricultural sector, the, for, for the waste sector, technologies exist, but there is also uh, really an issue of, of what, is, what is sent to, to the lens field. And, and, and UNEP is working quite a bit on, on zero waste. And, and food on, on food waste because it's, it's actually the organic waste that produces methane. So we need to, in the first place, reduce the amount of organic waste that goes into the landfill and where 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 methane is, uh, is is emitted. In the agriculture sector, the reduction potential is much lower, and so we need more uh, we we need more technologies, we need more studies, we need more actions to to identify. Uh, opportunities for for meat and mitigation. On the other side, the system is much more complicated, for example, than the energy sector. There are 500 million farmers uh, and that, that you need to go and, and, and work with to reduce emissions, while there are maybe 300 uh, important or relevant energy companies that, that could achieve the same result. In a, in a sector, by the way, where technology and finance are largely available. So it really depends by the sector. Uh, the, 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 the reduction potential in the energy sector is higher because technology, finance, and capacity is higher. Uh, but, but indeed, to achieve this 30% reduction, we need to work on the three sectors. Uh, and so start with the energy sector where the reduction potential is higher in the short term and continue uh, research and uh, initial pilot projects in the other sectors so to, uh, so to identify the most promising solutions for, for waste and agriculture. Thank you, and I will um, turn to the public. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question to Manfredi? I see nobody asking for the floor, so Thank you, Manfredi. Now we, il we will uh, turn to our second speaker. Uh, Bernhard, you have the floor. OK, thank you very much, uh, Masemba. Um, Welcome uh, again also from UN Habitat to all of those are, who are here and uh, everyone who is participating remotely. Um, I have the pleasure to present um, maybe a 
somewhat broader uh, approach than uh, Manfredi has done, uh, which of course um, is a little bit more sectoral, but of course he's also looked into a very broad multi-sectoral uh, dimension, and I think this is really uh, where uh, innovation lies. Um, the next slide, please. And I think um, the next and the next and the next. Um, yeah, so maybe just to, to very briefly pitch uh, that, uh, of course, cities are um, very much recognized as um, not only centers of innovation, but also the centers um, the geographical locations, the governance uh, locations where innovation for climate action can happen and must happen uh, given the way cities contribute to climate change and how uh, cities, urban systems and in particular the urban poor are vulnerable to climate change. Next slide. Um, from a UN Habitat perspective, there are um, five main entry points uh, for our climate change action. Um, first, of course, cities and carbon neutrality and the importance for cities to contribute to greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, we are certainly promoting very much that cities fully align with emission reductions uh, by 2030 and then net zero by 2050. The numbers, of course, uh, can all be debated, but I think what cannot be debated is that, uh, that city-level action plans are needed, that cities need to have the capacities, that uh, cities also need to have the support. And even though I'm, I'm looking now a little bit uh, entry point by entry point, it's already very clear that a low emission development strategy needs to feed back into resilience and, for example, air pollution and uh, linking through that to quality of life more broadly. Next slide, please. Um, for us, uh, we support also the national dimension of uh, urban climate action that is at uh, various levels. That is uh, more traditionally the support to uh, national urban policies where climate change is one key entry point uh, that we promote. But um, of course, it's also the sectoral strategies, um, urban mobility, um, urban energy, uh, waste management, linking, of course, to some of the uh, dimensions that were highlighted in the previous presentation. We have um, more recently also very much engaged in the urban dimension of uh, the NDCs. We'll have a few sessions on that. I won't go too much into this, um, but uh, certainly very happy to note that now 84% of the NDCs address um, the urban dimension of climate change. The next slide, please. Climate finance, um, critical. Uh, we, we recognize, uh, of course, the importance of uh, this COP for increasing the commitments. The reality, of course, is that the, the needs for climate resilient and low carbon infrastructure is, is huge. Um, that doesn't have to come through international mechanisms. Of course, most of it will have to come through the domestic and uh, private sector finance. But this is a critical dimension uh, that, uh, that really determines all of our other components of work. The next slide, please. Um, of course, everyone talks about uh, the resilient recovery um, with the next slide as well. This is um, about green recovery. It is about resilient recovery. It's also um, the alignment of uh, the just uh, recovery, linking the climate justice and uh, the fair resilient uh, recovery. Next slide. Um, and of course, for us, the, the urban poor are very much at the center of UN Habitat's work. Um, and 
uh, building climate resilience there is, is a very large part of our climate change work, but also increasingly looking at uh, a green, low-carbon jobs and uh, also, for example, uh, low or zero-carbon uh, electrification in informal settlements. Um, next slide and next slide. Um, I will not uh, bore you with uh, the... Uh, uh, institutional approach of UN Habitat, just uh, suffice to say that uh, we have uh, four pillars of our strategic plan. One is climate change and uh, urban environment, but these are not implemented through one division each, but they provide the framework for cross-cutting uh, engagement. So every unit uh, in UN Habitat, in a way, needs to implement all four pillars of the strategic plan. Um, next slide. Um, I will zoom out and zoom in a little bit sectorally and uh, spatially in this presentation, but I do want to um, go back to UN Habitat's um, entry points for climate action um, and start with uh, the urban poor. UN Habitat has five uh, flagship programs. One is uh, the climate resilience for the urban poor, also with a global partnership uh, with, with uh, city networks, uh, think tanks and other stakeholders. Uh, critically there is that um, a lot of micro innovation can uh, be, be built there, uh, critical to build on uh, traditional resilience and, and provide uh, communities with the tools to scale up, but even more importantly, to also look into how community action and city level action uh, can uh, interact, can be directly linked uh, to ensure uh, that we have sustainable outcomes. Next slide. Um, UN Habitat um, has taken innovation uh, at the core of its uh, work. We have a, a new uh, innovation unit. Uh, innovation is very prominent in uh, the new urban agenda, which uh, is our um, overall um, mandate and, uh, of course, also critical in our strategic plan. Uh, next slide. Um, we have in, uh, of course, also a, a broad partnership with uh, many uh, UN agencies. Uh, we look at many different entry points uh, for uh, innovation and climate change, um, from artificial intelligence uh, to smart infrastructure, broader smart uh, cities, approach and, of course, data visualization uh, to both uh, get more stakeholders engaged through um, better engagement mechanisms, but also, of course, for better uh, evidence-based uh, decision-making. And uh, next slide, very much uh, linked to that. We have very recently um, launched uh, this partnership, uh, set up the uh, new United Nations Innovation Technology Accelerator for cities. So this is certainly um, a hub that uh, we are very keen on um, bringing into the climate change uh, conversation. Climate change, of course, is, is mainstream, but the entry point is at the moment uh, not uh, climate change. Um, but what's happening there is that, uh, that we are developing really from an innovation perspective an entry point for integrated sustainable urban development. And I think this is really at the core of the conversation today that we are not looking um, only at um, climate change mitigation or greenhouse gas emission reductions or resilience um, or a particular sector, but that we're looking at uh, integrated systems that uh, provide the right uh, breeding ground for innovative uh, approaches. Um, then um, a few smaller examples, um, if I may, with the next slide. We have um, a... Um, next slide, sorry, I think there's some, and one more click, yeah. Um, 
So we have a, a Climate Smart Cities Challenge um, launched uh, last year, or really uh, that has come um, off the ground in the course of this year um, with a, a relatively broad uh, partnership where um, cities apply. Um, we match them with um, describing their particular uh, innovation challenges or their, their gaps in terms of uh, um, moving climate action forward uh, and we match those cities um, with uh, innovators, with the right kind of uh, private sector, public sector, think tank uh, partners and of course uh, expertise from UN Habitat. Um, next slide. And uh, we have been working um, now with these uh, cities um, I think for uh, six, seven months to, to really very clearly define their challenges, initial um, opportunities, and we are now in the process of that matchmaking to really accelerate um, climate innovation. Um, this is a small start um, with, with these four cities, but uh, it provides um, a good overview in terms of the global ambition. We want to work in different cities um, with different challenges, um, of course, globally uh, diverse. Next um, slide. Our next slide, please. Um, our our flagship uh, initiative in terms of uh, climate change uh, innovation. Um, to zoom out again, is uh, the Innovate for Cities um, conference uh, that uh, that we have. Uh, um, just uh, held uh, this year uh, in the middle of October, um, of course, uh, with the aim to, to feed into COP, um, but the um, medium-term objective is, is to really galvanize uh, science innovation um, at the global, at uh, the local level, at the community level, to feed into the cities and climate uh, change a special report of the IPCC, which is uh, scheduled in the next assessment cycle. Um, so building those partnerships, getting more um, inputs, uh, not just academic papers, but uh, building that up uh, from, from communities and cities is important there. We've had uh, more than 200 uh, sessions. Um, uh, over that one week, purely remotely held, um, really five days uh, rolling sessions um, across all time zones. And this is something, uh, this is the second um, iteration, the first Innovate for Cities conference was called the IPCC Cities and Climate Science Conference that we held in 2018, um, which was then designed as a one-off, uh, but uh, UN Habitat and the Global Covenant of Mayors um, have decided to take this forward. Um, next slide, and I'll go through those quickly in the interest of time, but uh, just to, to flash some of the key um, entry points um, that uh, we had identified in 2018 as the gaps, both in terms of uh, science and uh, research, but also in terms of the city needs. Um, which you see in this uh, ring here, um, very broadly on, on sustainable consumption, production, finance, uh, informality, uncertainty, urban planning and design, uh, built uh, green and blue infrastructure um, with these, these cross-cutting issues of uh, models and data, health uh, systems approach, digitalization, scale and governance, um, and uh, the implementation mechanisms around them. And uh, yeah, you can see the data uh, of the uh, participation in the conference that we had in October. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some of the key messages that specifically uh, relate to innovation mechanisms. Of course, the entire conference was focused on uh, innovative approaches. Um, maybe just uh, to, to highlight that um, the um, 
that, as I've said earlier, really the systems approach is critical. Yes, there are uh, technological innovations, um, but, uh, but these require investments into people, um, into uh, systems uh, thinking. And um, it's also, I think, maybe with a little bit of a bias from this community, again, reconfirmed that cities are the hubs of, of innovation. I will be quick. Uh, next slide. Um, so these, these messages here um, are even further amplifying the message that it is innovation in cities is uh, only partially about technology. Uh, there is a recognition that maybe 90% um, of the technology is in place uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by, by 40% um, by 2030. Um, but um, the process, the social innovation, the, the capacities, the governance systems that are needed for uh, the processes to, to further stimulate um, emission reductions, but also resilience and sustainable urbanization are critical, and those frameworks need to be uh, put in place. Um, role of national governments, um, of course, critical. Uh, whilst uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm and dynamics at the city level to, to advance this agenda, um, of course, cities um, in isolation can certainly uh, not uh, achieve the goal set out. Um, then maybe let me let me move to the next slide, uh, which is also uh, the last uh, slide uh, of this presentation. Um, took to very briefly summarize how we see our uh, work in terms of uh, uh, innovation for climate action to move forward. Um, Yes, there is a technology that's an important starting point for innovation, um, but we need people-centered approaches. Um, if that is uh, smart cities, uh, as you've seen before, if they are technology-oriented, very often those um, frameworks that are put in place die very quickly um, if they are really about sustainable urbanization as the starting point rather than technologies, they can move uh, further. If um, an integrated approach is taken, a systems approach um, that looks, uh, of course, at uh, the, the key elements of climate action, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, but again, is people-centered, looks at all the elements that uh, make up uh, sustainable development uh, in the city or local level, um, then uh, we, we have, a, again, a much better chance to also achieve the climate uh, ambitions. And last but not least, um, Cities cannot do it alone. National governments are important, but ultimately it's about much broader stakeholder uh, coalitions to find ways to achieve uh, all of the uh, objectives of sustainable, low carbon and resilient uh, urban development in an integrated manner. Thank you. Thank you, Bernhard, for this uh very insightful um, presentation. So um, as a, I have some follow-up question and then I can ask the, our participant whether they um, would like also to ask some question. So um, generally people are talking about smart city and um, I would like to go back to the quote from, from, from Einstein saying that smart people uh, solve problem and wise people avoid problem. I'm wondering to what extent we should not move from, let's say, a framework of smart city 
to a framework of smart and wise city. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to, to think. I, I want to give you a, a concrete response uh, rather than, than a philosophical one. one but, but I think, of course, uh, you're right. And I think for, um, for the way we have seen uh, many smart cities approaches, they um, try to tackle specific problems with a technology solution. Um, and that can be perfectly fine. Um, and that can be a smart solution, but it doesn't make it a smart city. And I think that's, that's critical. And that's um, only part of a, of a response to your answer, because of course that is still dealing um, with the problems, um, rather than really um, m transcending that and seeing how can we um, avoid um, problems, how can we uh, really build uh, sustainable cities um, and where technology is a part, but it's not about uh, problems, uh, problem solving, but uh, livable cities, sustainable cities, um, equitable cities. Um, I think the challenge, um, or I think the beauty of uh, smart cities is that it is um, potentially an integrator as a word. Um, we are all struggling um, with comprehensive partnerships where the public sector feels comfortable, where um, private sector feels comfortable, where um, everyone can come together. And smart cities, in some cases, has uh, provided that framework to get partners engaged. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. And to conclude with that, um, the, the wisdom needs to be at the center there. It's not about um, then providing um, just an entry point for the private sector for smart traffic systems. That does not um, solve really the issues at hand that deals with uh, some symptoms. So I, I totally agree. So I was wondering whether maybe um, being able to describe the, cit the city of the future, where we would like to have um, our children, our grandchildren living, and 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 um, using a backcasting approach to see what need to be done to get there, could not be a, a solution where you will put, let's say, more more wisdom because. This is a longer term planning, and then maybe many problems could be could be could be solved. And I'm wondering also whether you 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 you, you touch upon these two points: innovative governance and and social innovation are not key to build these uh, uh, wise cities. Yeah, no, I think you um, again. That's uh, that's critically important. Um, the challenge very often is that, that cities have maybe 10, 20, 30 sectoral plans. And most of those um, are not anywhere near a futuring um, approach. There is not much um, backcasting done beyond maybe a, a fairly broad vision statement that looks at uh, what what the city of the future could look like but but that's not a concrete description but it's a, it's a, a vision statement um, so I think that um, that really poses two problems a that is um, very often the, the future not clearly described very often of course also limited by uh, political, um, horizons in terms of elections, but it's also still a, a very difficult to bring all of the sectors together. So yes, you're absolutely right to, to envision the future um, of cities is critical, happens in many cities, but I think um, what is very important there to note, out of the 10,000s of cities, um, it's very few cities that 
can can do that for their own city, um, and therefore. And, and maybe that's also not even the right approach because you need to have, of course, um, a global approach or at least a regionally territorial approach. But, uh, but the challenge is that um, to, to catch up with the very rapid urban development in small cities and, and building in a futuring approach there, um, that's not happening in most uh, cases. We have engaged... Um, at the national level, uh, in terms of national urban policies, where we try to provide these kind of frameworks, where we try to um, look at the, the issues really much more long term, uh, have a 2030, 2050 vision at um, the global, uh, sorry, at the national level, um, and, and really looking at a, a country wide uh, spatial approach and, and see the, the city dynamics there. I have another, it's time now. Oh, you want to take, ask a question? Okay. Thank you, Berhant, for the presentation. I'm Carlos Ruiz from the UNFCCC. Uh, my question is relating to the uh, message by the Secretary General not a few days ago. He was declaring the day for adapting cities for climate and resilience. And uh, we were looking into this message, the announcement that actually today, where we are is we have one million uh, inhabitants that are living in informal settlements. Uh, on the other hand, he also mentioned that uh, only 9% uh, of the climate finance goes to cities for adaptation and resilience. So there is a strong mismatch in that context. And if we look at the principles on the screen on how to promote innovation, so it seems that there is a space really to amplify the role of uh, incubators, accelerators, not only on collaboration moving forward, but also on innovating finance for climate. So uh, in this context, what, how do you see the future? What are the needs and how to fill this innovation uh, gap, particularly on the enablers that will mobilize finance that is needed for resilience. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Carlos. And, uh, and you're all asking very broad and, and uh, difficult questions. Um, I think, of course, these, these are the facts that we deal with uh, on a daily basis. Um, our, our emphasis, as I mentioned, are uh, on the uh, one billion uh, people in informal settlements um, who are particularly vulnerable and, as you say, receive um, very limited uh, external support. Um, so that those, those are definitely the facts uh, that uh, we're dealing with. Um, we very often hear that um, a large part of the climate finance problem is that uh, the projects aren't there, there are no fundable projects, but um, a fundable project that uh, is about uh, climate resilient informal settlements or informal settlements upgrading is um, at the moment, of course, um, in most cases, extremely difficult to, to develop. And it's not about little projects when we are dealing with uh, one billion people in informal settlements. There is um, of course, inherent risks, um, almost by definition, not, not everywhere. Um, tenure security is not there, therefore nobody wants to, to invest um, to get uh, one billion people uh, out of uh, informal settlements. Um, to, to do that through external funding mechanisms uh, is therefore very difficult. And the methodologies for climate finance are, of course, just generally much stronger for mitigation than for resilience. Having said that, the, um, there are two opportunities. Uh, one of them is that housing uh, generally is um, been catapulted back on the agenda uh, through uh, COVID-19. Um, the way people live, the, the, the densities, um, the, the crowding, all of that's uh, being uh, rediscussed. And of course, um, informal settlements, upgrading, um, 
is, is also more generally back on the agenda from a climate change perspective uh, because of the resilience, because of the, the way we see disasters uh, strike, uh, informal settlements, and um, many countries have started to, to develop uh, much more comprehensive uh, housing and informal settlements upgrading programs. So I think really the importance is, is to, to break down these silos in terms of uh, addressing uh, COVID-19, in terms of um, addressing uh, informal settlements, in, in terms of addressing uh, climate change, but bring those together. See what uh, the mechanisms are, enable communities, which uh, very often is not done as an entry point. It's, uh, it's very often about uh, the, the property rights as a starting point. It's uh, providing um, a broader policy enabling environment. and that uh, can help uh, access to finance. And so I think, again, we are back to a systems thinking. Um, and now I think it's the time because we have these, these entry points. Um, the urgency is just much clearer to many than it's been maybe two years ago or five years ago. Thank you. Thank you for this this very interesting discussion. I'm uh, a planner actually from Canada. Most of my work is in the north, but we I've worked on climate action plans for 60 plus cities of all sizes. Um, and I think we're seeing an increasing rejection of the concept of smart cities, um, that it is more of a, I would say, a sort of a capitalist imposition of um, uh, profit-seeking enterprises on, on cities. And we just saw this play out in Toronto where the community rejected uh, a major initiative by Google. Um, it's in, it's a, a subsidiary to develop a, a, a very large area on the waterfront, and um, and we're seeing that play out. I think uh, across cities. Not to say that there isn't a use for technology, but that it has to be um, driven by wisdom rather than by a, a profit-seeking motive. I think. So I, that's one interesting piece that I, that I noted here. And I think in terms of the long-term vision, most of the projects we're working on start with a 30-plus year plan. And we use climate as the uniter. Because if you look at climate, you have to look at housing. You have to look at transportation. You have to look at finance. You have to look at poverty. You have to look at equity. And so climate is this really powerful unification piece that crosses all of the sectoral analysis that is happening within cities. And it forces you to look long term because the built environment is so durable. And if you make the wrong kind of investment, then you're into major retrofit endeavors, which are incredibly costly. And then I think the last point I want to make is that we're increasingly seeing integrated approaches to mitigation and adaptation where we can retrofit homes to reduce emissions, but at the same time increase their resilience or elevate them so we address flooding or on and on, and so we can actually um, really have synergistic approaches. Um, so th there's, a, there's a few things to throw at you. Um, my, my response is, is very short. I couldn't agree more. Maybe I, I framed it a little bit uh, differently. I think maybe one point that I would like to, to add um, to, to what you've said is, of course, we have um, SU and Habitat supported integrated climate action plans that are about uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, what I haven't highlighted here so much in terms of uh, the, the innovation entry point is, is really this a uh, very massive push, uh, push now for nature-based solutions as, as an un other integrator that, that uh, has a very strong social uh, justice dimension um, and adaptation and mitigation uh, dimension. But, but one of the um, frustrations in a way um, that we've been having for, well, I've been working with you in Habitat on climate change since 2008 is this, this somewhat artificial debate, climate action plan versus a broader uh, city development plan, development strategy, or an integrated master plan, or whatever they're called in, in those locations. And, um, um, and that's in a way very unfortunate because again, to create another silo um, uh, is just not helpful where we can use uh, climate change um, as an entry point and as an integrator, as you described, perfect, to develop a broader plan. 
Um, but the, the, the political will, of course, is, is not everywhere uh, the same as you've described it for Canada. And just to then maybe also um, zoom out a little bit, we have um, now also the experience from a number of countries where there was not much interest in national urban policies, but where we used um, climate change as an entry point there, it was all of a sudden easier to bring in young people, to bring in um, other communities that, that would normally not be interested in, in urban policy. So I, I think all your points are well taken and, and just to add a little bit to that. Uh, yes. Hello, uh, I'm Shrey Goel. I'm the director of uh, Mega Cities Short Docs uh, Film Festival. Uh, so we, we host documentaries from across the world from uh, working on urban issues. And we found that uh, uh, solutions that some cities have found, solutions that work for certain cities, innovations, they can be adopted by other cities, but they're just not connected. They just don't have those kinds of platforms. Uh, so, so there is uh, uh, a lot of reinventing the wheel that goes on in multiple places. So there are cities in South America who could learn from solutions in cities in India uh, and so forth. And even between, uh, so there is a lot of room for South-South collaboration, uh, from South-North collaboration, twin city programs. So does the does UN Habitat plan to work on connecting cities with each other? So basically, the way, the way CTCN does with the other kinds of climate innovations. So what is your, uh, uh, what are your ideas on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, point. Um, and, and of course, there are already too many platforms that uh, try to provide that. That can be useful for, for some cities if they are connected with um, other cities, but we don't create that, that global uh, network. So um, whilst for testing certain approaches, we, we do that. But in terms of a broader, um, I don't know, network policy approach from UN Habitat, we work um, very closely with the Global Covenant of Mayors, with the uh, 11,000 cities that have uh, signed up there. We work very closely with uh, the city networks that, that are under that uh, GCOM uh, network of networks. Um, we, we certainly... Um, promote an integrated approach to um, the, the planning uh, and, and the joint learning in terms of uh, technology and planning approaches, uh, but also um, the, the monitoring, um, reporting and verification that comes with that because that can um, really accelerate that uh, joint learning. Is it easy um, to create a functioning network of 11,000 cities, no, but um, um, it doesn't prevent those those city-to-city -city partnerships. Um, it can promote those, and maybe that's where some of the action uh, happens. And certainly the, the Innovate for Cities um, conference that, uh, that I've mentioned, um, the first event was much more academic-driven. Um, with this event, we try to really have uh, city practitioners, city policy makers in every session, um, global north, south, every continent. So, so it's certainly something that we are trying to promote on that level as well. So thank you. Thank you, Ben Hart. Um, and maybe just to add to his question, so probably the new UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub that will also join the network that is already in place will contribute in broadening and uh, yeah, making accessible experience from some cities to, to other cities because this is extremely important, this ex exchange of, of experience. So thank you, Ben Hart. And I apologize, Masemba, that I didn't pitch that. Of course, we, we will uh, collaboratively move that forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move to our next session. Um, with um, the UNIDO presenting. Maybe just before um, UNIDO, I would like to um, take three minutes to present this um, initiative, Global Innovation Hub, 
for the next session. So my name is my name is Masamba Choi. I'm the executive of the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. The Global Innovation Hub has two components, a physical component, which is in the form of pavilion, like actually what we have currently. So at each COP, we plan to have um, such type of gathering, such type of dialogue, where all the relevant um, players that could contribute in uh, innovation for climate, for sustainability, have this opportunity to be together and, and co-create, um, co-innovate, um, and implement radical collaboration. Um, and then we have uh, a second element that is in the form of uh, platform. So this is the beginning of a movement. And what we are really looking forward to see is to have um, all these different stakeholders joining this very important um, movement. So now I will give the floor to um, yeah, presenting on behalf of Unido Peter. Yeah. Thank you so much, Masamba. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Schneering. I'm the founder of Future Clean Tech Architects. We're a climate innovation think tank located in Germany, working on the energy transition. It's a pleasure co-hosting this event on key R&D needs together with UNIDO. And uh, my colleague from UNIDO, ITPO Germany, is here as well. I think you need to switch it on. Uh, welcome, everyone to this event. My name is Vanessa Völkel and I'm the deputy head of the UNIDO Investment and Technology Promotion Office in Germany, in Bonn. And UNIDO is a specialized agency of the United Nations dedicated to sustainable and inclusive industrial development. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Vanessa. And as uh, we would like to see the first slides on this because we have prepared something. We've just finished a large um, ceremony last week on, on, on clean tech and sustainable land management, actually together with UNIDO. And today we would like to focus on the key results uh, in terms of R&D. So this will not be the summary of the main call, the global call by UNIDO, UNFCCC and UNCCD and FCA, which will take place tomorrow. There'll be a separate session. We'll inform about this later. But today we want to look at the key uh, requirements, the key demands in R&D. And for this, we would like to show you how we have structured this and, and what's so special about the uh, interfaces uh, and the sector coupling between this. So if we could see the next slide, we have completed this um, award uh, uh, last week and we're still um, in contact with all the uh, winners and hosts who will be speaking live here tomorrow at COP26. And this whole thing was structured according to four categories. And um, we've seen uh, exciting applications from across the globe, basically, for these four categories. And Vanessa, I think we would just like to walk uh, participants briefly through this uh, to tell them what it's been about. So can you maybe share an idea? And maybe um, we can see the next slide then uh, on, on where applications came from, how many participants there were. Could you add a couple of things on this? Sure. So the success of this global call, it built on a series which started last year with the UNIDO global call, which was at that time administered by the UNIDO Investment and Technology Promotion Office Italy, which started a global call uh, looking for private sector solutions to combat uh, the for solution for the COVID-19 pandemic. And this year, with the relevance of clean tech and sustainable land management topics, it was the idea to target the private sector globally. And there was a huge response on this. We nearly received 300 applications. And given the fact that it was directed only to the private sector, this is a huge number because um, these solutions had to be in the four categories, decarbonizing, growing urban environments, companies could apply for another uh, category, clean and efficient energy generation and storage. Thirdly, solutions for circular production and industrial processes and sustainable land management because the land management category is also 
with soil health and so ever very relevant if we speak about reducing carbon emissions and to combat the adverse effects of the climate change. Um, so these 300 applications we got from 71 countries from five continents and there were solutions from um, second life energy um, recycling like um, second life battery from electric vehicles to uh, very innovative building materials using inferior sand material or combining photovoltaic solutions with um, farming. So, but we will hear more about these solutions tomorrow. But um, one fact also to mention is that we had among all these applications 35% from women owned or women led. So there were really strong applications also from this. And all this we could generate together with UNFCCC, UNCCD, and via the network of the Investment and Technology Promotion Offices. Absolutely. So it was a very diverse group, not only of applicants, but also of organizations co-hosting this and, and stakeholders supporting this. So now you see this chart here, or this animation which we've done, and it, it's a puzzle. It consists of four parts, as you can see, and we'd like to show you how we think about it. But before we play this movie, I would like to ask our team to show the next slide, because bringing together not only the categories in the sector coupling, but we've been bringing together people who work on the process, so actually decarbonizing. This is in a state library um, where we've been discussing uh, private sector innovation, breakthrough innovation only, with Toyota Motor Foundation and others. Next one, please. Next picture. You can see in a, in a co-working space where we met. Um, if we can see the next slide. Somebody? <laughs> Thank you. So here's people from industry, heavy industry, meeting with uh, developers who are uh, working on technologies to decarbonize industrial processes. And w I would like uh, our team to play the first movie, the animation of the four puzzle parts, because this is meant in a symbolic way. As you know, we speak in these four categories, but even when discussing the, the, the applicants and the winners, we found out that many work on two sectors. It's not possible to, to look at this in an isolated way. So when we look at this, uh, at this animation, which will hopefully play soon, we will see the puzzle parts coming together and sort of being developed separately in a way um, because all these fields are interacted. And I, I would like to show I would, well, we would like to share with you some findings on these four parts in the session today. So if we could see the next slide, please. Um, we, have prepared, um, uh, we have prepared an overview. This was the, this was the ceremony. Next one, please. Um, the four categories basically make up, uh, uh, we focus very much on the hard to decarbonize sectors in our, wo in our work. Next one, please. Now, that's the sound of the movie. <laughs> we don't want to hear this. So if you think of it in research areas, for example, at FCA, we work in eight specific areas, out of which four, which are highlighted here, fall into hard-to-abate sectors, which are particularly difficult to develop and scale. And next one, please. If you look at the scope of the global cause, so the competition we'll be introducing in detail tomorrow, um, the, if we look at the total emissions of, uh, uh, it's more than 51 gigatons CO2 equivalent meanwhile. But um, it's, if you take that as a ballpark figure, you can see how the four categories, land management, energy storage, urban environments, are located across these fields and how interacted they are in, in terms of the technologies they work that are being developed to decarbonize. Next one, please. Um, now, we can see, if we go through the categories bit by bit, uh, maybe we can see animation number one for the first category. I know it's a lot of small movies to be played here. Last, last week we had like a, a whole theater crew. Great, thank you. Thank you. And the slide was just right. So we're talking about decarbonizing growing urban environments. You can see it at the bottom. It's approximately 15 gigatons. So just as a ballpark figure, 51 to decarbonize, 15 uh, are in growing urban environments. Next one, please. And we've looked at it in detail. And just seeing the size of the challenge, you see on the left hand, 2021, 7.5 billion people, and the predictions for 2050, and the small symbols below is the is this amount of buildings that are being will need to be built and the electricity we will need to 
make living for all these people who are basically rising out of poverty and have the right to rise out of poverty to make this sustainable. So just to indicate the size of the challenge. Next slide, please. So what will we need to develop in the next 10 years, not until 2050? Things will need to be developed in the next decade. We will need to make massive uh, urban areas sustainably, be built sustainably, and technologies include, next one, please. Sorry, we don't have a pointer, so we always have to ask our team to do this. So we, we will need completely new urban ecosystems because the, the setup in these uh, in these areas will be completely different than now. There will be a lot of small producers of electricity, as you know. There will be different consumers. Oh, I have one. That's great. Okay. Does that work? That works. Perfect. One thing we also came across in the, in the call is evidence-based urban planning. We need artificial intelligence to plan and build these urban areas. Um, what we've also looked at just trying, great. Now, you know technologies like blockchain. Blockchain is a technology of DLT, distributed ledger technologies. These can facilitate a lot of these new electricity and energy markets. Um, and of course, the second field, the second category, maybe you can play the second animation, if you're so kind. We're still on time. <laughs> Please, let's, let's have a look at the, at the second category. So that's clean and efficient energy generation and storage. And it's, of course, the second part of the puzzle. Thank you. Now, what is, what is the challenge here? In, in clean and efficient energy generation, you look at the you look at the bar uh, at the bottom again. It's a it's approximately 14 gigatons out of 52. So again, a pretty big chunk we need to decarbonize. And in the end, there's a couple of particular challenges in this field. I'm trying to get to the next slide, but I'm asking somebody to to click this forward. So next one, please. Um, so in this field, category number two. We, we have just two charts to, to show the size of the challenge again. Right-hand side, you see the LCOE, levelized cost of electricity of solar compared to coal. Solar has seen an impressive learning curve, as all of you know. But if you look at the current share of energy consumption on the left side, coal is still, I mean, there's such a huge amount of assets still around that will have to be decarbonized. Next one, please. And then, with the rise of renewables comes the intermittency challenge. Because left hand, electricity supply in the US within one year. And you see a low in the summer. This is due to wind, if you look at this side here. So we will need not across the day storage technologies, which are learning very quickly, but we will need seasonal storage to get this job done. Next one, please. So technologies we are looking at. And then there's the overall electrification challenge. It's not about electrifying what's currently produced, but there will be massive amounts of electricity. Think about green hydrogen. Think about all the things we want to solve with electricity, also in industry and other applications that are currently fossil powered, or as we've seen with the growing population and building stock, it's not even there yet. There's a demand to be met by electricity that's not even there yet. Next one, please. So, We'll, we've been looking in the call and in our own work at very advanced storage systems on a month scale. Next one. We're looking at renewables that are less intermittent than solar and wind. Solar and wind are great technologies, very cost competitive, but intermittent. When the wind doesn't blow, when the sun doesn't shine, you're in trouble. So we're looking at things like wave energy converters, riverine, tidal, all these kinds of technologies, and ideally, and now next one, please. We're looking at some point of baseload power. So we, are, we would love to see renewables that can provide the same baseload power that um, coal power plants can or natural gas power plants can. And so coming to the next category, um, 
You see, it's, it, they are almost all the same size. It's 16 gigatons CO2 equivalent out of 51. And this is, of course, industry. And I see a lot of faces of people working on these technologies and developing solutions for this. So circular production industrial processes. Next one, please. We have a special guest today, so I'll go through this really quickly. I want to show you how much humanity and feeding the world depends on industrial processes. You see synthetic fertilizers. Ammonia produced from hydrogen, gray hydrogen, very fossil intensive. How much um, sustainable, I mean, how much fertilizer and food production is done with synthetic fertilizers where we need industry to grow the, the kind of food to feed the world in the end. So we very much depend on industrial processes. Next one, please. Let's look at one example from one industry. We're working a lot on cement. Cement is oftentimes called the hardest to abate sector. And by the way, I, I appreciate people taking pictures. We'll also make the presentation available if you like. Now look at one process. If you want to get cement in a conventional way, the problem is not the fuel. Just a third of the emissions is from fuel. And we're talking about several percentage points of global total emissions just from cement industries. It's like five or six percent. So you're, you're entering limestone into a kiln and you're, you're, you're sort of processing this at very high temperatures, and two-thirds are just released from the limestone. You have process emissions, not, not burning. You can switch this to renewables if you can, which is very difficult, but you would still have two-thirds uh, emissions. OK, next one, please. So what do we need? We need alternative building materials. Exciting topic for tomorrow, also for the second session. Next one. We need alternative ways of producing steel, producing cement, direct reduction with hydrogen, for example. Next one. Um, cement with carbon capture as a process, and this is a spoiler for tomorrow. Cool alternative ways of building houses and infrastructure and using it again to build it somewhere else if you need other applications. So be sure to be here tomorrow at 1, right? 1.30? 12.30. 12.30. Be here better 12.15, so. Okay, next one, last category, and then we have another guest on stage. Just, this is not our special field. We had our colleagues from UNCCD supporting this. Um, it's sustainable land management, but the share is really high. It's, again, it's 10 gigatons in this case, and just one chart on this, okay? <laughs> Look at the world's surface. So. Say 29% of the world is land surface, the rest is water. Out of this 29, 71 are habitable land. Out of this, around half of the habitable land we have, we use for agriculture. And almost 80% almost of this we use for livestock, but it just supplies 18% of the calorie supply to feed the world. So this is very inefficient. And and, and you know the share of emissions that are arising from this. And also here we have a very good solution tomorrow, which we're looking forward to. So with this, next slide, please. There's a couple of interesting technologies. I won't go into details. Next one. Um, with this, we, we were very much appreciated to have a special guest today, whom I would like to introduce and ask to stage. Um, it's Mr. Tarek Antera. He is the UNIDO Director of Energy. And I would like to give the, the word to you to maybe give a spontaneous intervention because you need us working on so many of these technologies. Your unit is doing such a great work. So please share your thoughts on this with us. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Vanessa, for the opportunity to be here with you today. Indeed, as you said, um, responding to the climate crisis is the greatest economic opportunities uh, for humanity today, actually. And, and we understood this uh, many years back at UNIDO. And what keeps us busy is actually the fact that we want um, an inclusive and uh, wide participation in the economic opportunities. We want everyone to benefit from the upside of responding to the climate crisis. So we are engaged with developing and least developing economies to create and enable uh, an ecosystem for young entrepreneurs, men and women, to participate in the upside and the windfall of responding to the climate crisis through innovation, entrepreneurship, and commercialization of these solutions. So we have developed the, clean, uh, the global clean tech 
acceleration program or innovation program in partnership with the global environmental facilities and more, more recently uh, with the adaptation fund to scale up these opportunities uh, for young women and men from all parts of the world to participate in providing the solutions, delivering um, uh, climate response, both on the mitigation side, but also on the adaptation side, and fundamentally also create economic opportunities, jobs, uh, prosperity in these countries. So what we see from the experience so far, and you rightly pointed out in some of the uh, um, technology solutions that are emerging is, is the time is really ripe today for, uh, um, for the innovation space around these um, issues because of the technology convergence. We have the convergence from um, the, uh, what we call the fourth industrial revolutions, big data, digitalization, that actually enable us to respond to some of these challenges much faster than if we were to do this 10 years ago. The second convergence is the, of course, the science behind new materials, uh, processing, bioprocessing, uh, and biosciences that actually also converge on the climate agenda and would allow us to respond to some of the challenges related particularly to food systems. And the, and the third convergence comes, of course, from this distributed solutions, so that the, um, what we call distributed generation, which also opens a lot of horizons for um, participation of community-based um, entrepreneurship, local entrepreneurship in the solutions. So, so we're not looking at economies of scale as we used to do historically in the past around industrialization. So, so these three convergences open tremendous opportunities for the innovation space to respond to the climate crisis. With this, I, I look forward to congratulating the winners tomorrow and, and uh, wish you good luck with, uh, with the process and continuing that process forward. Yeah, thank you, Tarek. That was really interesting to have also these insights about what UNIDOS works on this and the Global Green Tech Innovation Program. So, Peter, is there anything else with regard to tomorrow? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. And I, I really appreciate we have eight minutes left because I was when hearing that Tarek could speed, we were rushing through the program, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure having you. Thank you for, uh, for sharing this view in particular on the way because this is a point I think we would like to stress. It, it fits very well to to tomorrow's topics as well, it's the kind of collaboration we need. So this is something where we need a lot of interdisciplinary work. We've seen it in the call when sometimes we would not know which category to put an innovator in, because an innovator would work between disciplines, would work across sectors. He would take something from the, 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 the generation side, for example, and combine it with an industrial process. And so, so we, we believe that this is something where a lot of flexible new coalitions have to come up in order to develop things. Let's take one example maybe, and then we could come to details for tomorrow, but I would just like to add this. If you look at hydrogen, hydrogen is such a controversial topic. Any discussion here at the COP, people working on energy, you just roll in the word of hydrogen and it's exploding. So people get emotional, people talk about does it make sense in cars, where does it make sense? And from our perspective, this. This challenge is so big, and you've, you might have, arriving the last couple of days, you might have seen this very big advertisement on the New York Times that's laying around everywhere, where people say, where some companies say that this is the end of fossil fuels, green hydrogen will solve it. Yes, but it's a long way of being developed. It's still very costly, and, and it takes a lot of cross-border collaboration and driving down costs. And then the priority needs to be decarbonizing what we have already, and decarbonizing with hydrogen, what we cannot decarbonize in another way before we think about mobility solutions or things like this. So that was something that was interesting to us. Coming to the call again and to tomorrow, um, we have a special program. And this is we would like to basically present the winners and have them say their word and explain their technology from across the globe, right? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And it will be the winning technologies where we will see really scalable, innovative solutions and technologies uh, where you can, they are really readily deployable. So these business models, they can be scaled up, which was actually one of the most important evaluation criteria and the idea of directing this UNIDO Global Call 2021 to the private sector because actually there are so many ideas and solutions, but if they cannot 
be scaled up if they are not applicable in developing countries and emerging economies. And this is what was very important from the UNIDO perspective to see where is the potential for really reducing greenhouse gases uh, that these solutions work in developing countries and emerging economies. So this was the reason for searching for these fields, but also for directing this global call globally and uh, via all the field offices of UNIDO to identify solutions from Uganda and Zambia and Canada. And I think what is interesting at the end that it doesn't matter so much where the technology comes from. For example, one of the winning um, companies is from Canada, but having a solution where the head of the UNIDO Investment and Technology Promotion Office in Nigeria said, this is exactly with the artificial intelligence, modeling um, solutions for uh, growing urban environments and decarbonizing these urban environments, this is kind of solution what we need in Lagos, for example. So there is the matter of fact whether they are applicable. And um, yeah, we have beside the four uh, technologies, which are the award-winning ones, also around 25 or exact, to be exact, 23, which have been shortlisted by a jury of uh, six uh, jury members. So we will also give tomorrow more insights. So at the end, there will be many technologies or solutions uh, introduced at 12.30 tomorrow here at the United Nations um, Global Innovation Hub. So and it would be nice to see you here tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you, Vanessa. And before giving the word to Masamba, who's hosting this together with Carlos here, so, so great, this Innovation Hub, Global Innovation Hub. Let's give two spoilers. So two things mm -hmm. to make sure you'll, you'll turn up again tomorrow. One thing is you can see Lego style building blocks, you've seen a picture tomorrow in detail on how to build houses much more sustainably than, than it's done now. And a second one will be how to make use a, a second life of batteries. So what can we do with batteries out of cars or so and use them in a, in a way again that makes a lot of sense. Plus two very cool other solutions, agrivoltaics and on artificial intelligence in urban planning. So make sure to be here again today. And thank you everyone for the attention. Can play the trailer or? Yeah, we, so yeah, if, if, Masama, yeah. you, you want to, what's it about the time? Shall we still play the, play, the trailer for tomorrow? No. Oh, okay. It's, okay, next Good. speaker. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move to the next panel. Do we have our panelists in place? No. So we've got the. Okay, then I think we need to leave it like this, and we yes. have somebody. Then we just we need to just tell the others to get off the screen. Ah, Sorry, I've got my mask on. So it's starting now. Where is the camera? Where am I looking? Ah. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Hannah Messenger, and I'm the Global Events Strategist at the UN SDG Action Campaign. So it's a real pleasure to be here today um, to moderate the session where we're going to flip the script on what's possible and unpack ways in which we can remove the barriers to innovating for the future demands of the climate crisis together. So I'm delighted to be joined here by two very important speakers. Um, we've got Samantha Cristoforetti, astronaut from the European Space Agency. And we're joined by Ruida Ibrahim al Nuaimi, Strategic Partnerships Director from the Qatar Fund for Development. We also have another speaker, but he's running a little bit late, as it seems to happen in this busy conference zone, but hopefully he'll be joining us shortly. 
So just before we begin, a little bit about the UNSDG Action Campaign. We are a special initiative of the Secretary, Secretary General and our mandate is to scale up, broaden and sustain a global movement of people taking action to achieve the SDGs. So how we do this is we really focus on inspiring people to think differently, to really challenge themselves to think about what is possible. We look to mobilise people to take action and we look to connect people so that we can strengthen the impact of those actions together. So um, through that vein, I'm joined here by some of our incredible speakers that will be able to see that inspirational um, centerpiece of, this, of the strategy and then we'll move on to looking at how we can overcome barriers through mobilising and finally connecting. So without much further ado, I'd like to welcome Samantha. Hi Samantha. Hello, so great to be with you. It's wonderful to have you here today. So Samantha, I mean, as a trained pilot and astronaut, I mean, you've seen innovation and the kind of solutions that go beyond the horizons of what we, what we know here on Earth. Um, so my question to you really is, you know, from this experience, what do you see as being the big barriers that we currently have to innovating for future solutions? And what do you think there might, where do you see opportunities and we, where we might be able to have a breakthrough to solve these challenges? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm someone who had a very unique opportunity um, a few years ago, and I'm going to have that again next year, which is to actually um, live and work for uh, an extended period of time in space and really see our planet and the climate phenomena that, you know, are characterize our planet um, from that very unique orbital perspective and really have driven home for me in a present visual immediate way um, how interconnected everything is on our planet. So taking that perspective with me but also the fact that of course I'm a representative of the European Space Agency which is you know incredibly um, active on the forefront of the fight for climate change when I think about overcoming, overcoming barriers, maybe what I think about the most is the untapped potential of space technology to help in the fight uh, against climate change. Um, and and that is, it's a potential that is, I think, not enough known, um, even in the COP circles, in the climate circles, um, everything that especially space-based Earth observation can bring to the table. Uh, there are, of course, methods of measuring variables that are relevant and important for the climate crisis on the ground as well, but nothing can compete with uh, space-based satellites. We are able, with our Earth observation satellites, to provide um, long-term observation over many years on a global scale, you know, overflying every inch of the of, of the Earth's surface and the Earth's atmosphere, uh, revisiting the same places with high frequency and measuring with extreme high precision a diverse number of climate relevant variables that would just be impossible to measure Earth-based, either at all or certainly not on that global scale. Uh, with that accuracy and uh, precision. Uh, Space-based technologies are really part of our daily lives. I mean, sometimes we take them for granted, right? You know, the navigation services, the ability of, of phone to steer us as we find an address in our cities. Um, all that information that just as, as common people, as consumers, we have in our pocket. Well, our dream is to bring climate-relevant information in the pocket of all of us, but especially of um, decision makers. Um, and the ambition is really to, to scale this up, to make that next major step in making a space-based information available to decision makers. So the ambition of the European Space Agency is to create a digital twin. Let's see what that is. Uh, we all know that climate systems are extremely complex. You know, you have complex natural system and then the interaction of all the um, human activities. And that leads to consequences that are sometimes hard to predict. You know, the, the 
future scenarios are so varied if you imagine different kinds of intervention. And that can be overwhelming also for decision makers. So the idea is to take all the data that we have about our natural system, about climate, and especially uh, space-based data, and put it in one single integrated model with which we can not only understand the past and understand and monitor the present, but model and predict the future and the different scenarios and the different interventions to really understand how action and envisioned action turns into consequences. So, you know, we, we gather all the data and we used advanced digital technologies, you know, high performance computing and machine learning and, uh, you know, the broad field of, of data science. We, we, we make the space revolution meet the digital revolution to really be at the surface, at the service of, of the fight um, against uh, climate change. So, a few examples, you know. Um, Greenhouse gases, you know, one of the uh, big objectives uh, that has been uh, discussed and actioned upon at the, at the COP is the reduction of uh, methane emissions, uh, which are responsible, as we know, uh, for, I, I believe, about 30% of um, uh, warming that has uh, already happened. Um, you know, one, one major tool in the fight against methane emission is finding methane leaks, and it's certainly essential to have uh, space-based infrastructure observation satellites to find those leaks. So one of the ambitions, of course, and one of the possible tools is to uh, improve the um, capabilities of that uh, space-based monitoring. Let's talk about another topic that was, uh, uh, you know, highly discussed in the past days, deforestation. You know, when it comes to the lungs of our planet, space-based observation is also incredibly important for example, to observe illicit deforestation or to monitor the, the health of the forest. But also, uh, I, I would hope to, uh, to, to observe the positive impact of conservation and maybe restoration efforts for our forests and in general, our ecosystems and, uh, and landscapes. Let's talk about vulnerable communities. I mean, we all know that the burden of climate change, you know, the most serious consequences are often carried by um, uh, communities that are especially vulnerable um, because they are maybe the, the ones that have the least tools to then adapt and to be resilient uh, against climate change. You know, it can be um, communities in Asia which are uh, vulnerable to sea level rise and to flooding or communities in Africa who are vulnerable to deforestation or drought. Um, space-based assets can bring, because they are global, can bring the information, the understanding, the data where it is needed the most. Uh, and, and of course, it's our vision, and we already do, and our vision is to do it more and more as easier to cooperate in multilateral uh, settings, such as UNDP, World Bank, uh, FAO, uh, to really bring that, that information, what is needed, and, and be able to turn it into action. So the, the fight against climate change is increasingly waged from space. And it, it, that needs to happen on, on a number of levels. You know, one, of course, is this, the pure technological level. You know, I've talked about the digital twin. I've talked about improving, increasing, widening our Earth observation uh, capabilities. But then, of course, at the, at the policy level, we need to um, make it more and more so that climate research, climate understanding, climate data meets uh, climate action. And then I would add, uh, maybe again, bringing in my, my personal experience as an astronaut, um, having uh, lived on the International Space Station, we really have to keep in mind that, that orbital, orbital perspective. You know, I, I've lived in a facility in low Earth orbit, which is amazing. You know, we have an outpost out there in space, which I like to call it humanity's outpost in space, which is a product of international cooperation, of a joint effort of many countries, many agencies. It's been inhabited by um, uh, crews, crew members, astronauts from many nations now for, for uh, over 20 years. But even if we look at the Earth, you know, the, the reason COVID crisis and that race to produce and distribute a vaccine, I mean, has really shown how uh, 
you know, what amazing, incredible things we, we, we can do when, when, we, when we work, work together. And so um, technology is important, policy that is, you know, database, so bringing that um, actionable data uh, to the decision makers, and certainly that can-do attitude of us all human beings living on this planet, not as, you know, passengers, <laughs> but as crew members of our spaceship Earth. So, you know, we all roll up our sleeves and, and do our part. Ah, sorry. Thank you so much, Samantha. I mean, there's so much there to unpack. I mean, we've looked at the untapped potential um, as one of the biggest barriers, and I think that's a really interesting point there about how we can get the solutions from different people from different parts of the globe to come together. And then when we think about the kind of collaboration that brought the ISS to life, I mean, this feeds into, you know, the moonshot approach that we need for innovation to get there. If we're not mobilizing the minds and the the insights and the thoughts of people from every different sector, then we're not going to be able to meet this challenge. And I think the final thing, I love the idea of the ISS as humanity's outpost in space. Um, thank you so much, Samantha. Um, so um, we, I don't think, oh, Jean Bertrand, we, we have a second speaker has just arrived. Jean, um, perhaps you'd like to come and join me just here. Hi, John. Thank you for Hello. joining. I think everybody here knows how busy it can be to get around this conference center. Um, so we've just started the discussion, John, um, and we're looking today at how do we flip the script on what's possible and how do we overcome the barriers to innovation. Now, I know that you work in mobilizing young people in Zimbabwe and across Africa through Earth Day. So we'd just love to know from your perspective, what do you see as one of the biggest barriers in getting the solutions to where they're most needed? Um, so there are so many barriers. Um, first of all, the first one is the interpretation of climate change itself. Uh, it being like a giant that just fell on us, you know, 50 years later after a long period of time. So that ability for you to understand what's happening within your community is a huge barrier because you don't know how to act, you don't know how to adopt. And then the fact that also the leaders or the people that are in power, including the systems that are there, they were not centered, you know, or developed in a way that we can adapt or mitigate. They were set there for developmental issues and other issues that were prevailing. So for one, you know, to start trying to do or come up with innovation, of course, you would face some resistance. One could be the rules within the area that you're living in, um, the system, the laws, and all the legislations that are there might not allow you. For instance, now we are in a decade of action and our mantra is, you know, uh, leave no one behind. But how do you do that when you are living in a system where it was talking about isolation and other stuff? So that's one of like other the barriers that we are facing. But there is some positivity that comes along with it um, because of all the barriers, climate change also gives uh, an opportunity or it presents, you know, the platform whereby we can change our ideology. It doesn't have to be done the same way as it was done before. So given that now we have all these challenges that we are facing, it's good that our leaders are also noting it and everyone doesn't know the answer, but they hope that somebody comes up with the answer. So if, say, if I have an innovation on renewable energy within a community, just like how many young people are doing some initiatives. Um, for instance, we have a problem of water hyacinth within our community, Lake Jero. And uh, some young people came together and then they decided, let's harvest this water hyacinth and use it, you know, for compost. They did that. It was, you know, they tested the manure through environmental management agency. It was good. They gathered it again. They say, let's use it for briquetting. We mix it with horse dung. We briquet it, and then now we are taking the stress off the tree chopping. So those are like some of the opportunities that comes. Or you challenge your mind. You know how a human mind is developed is quite different. And it's surprising how it expands when it's put like onto the corner. So now, the, despite all the barriers, we are challenged, you know. For instance, for me to come here at COP, it wasn't too easy. But for me to get the accreditation, it means you have to be quite creative. So that alone is pushing us to be more creative and better as a, as a younger generation. 
Thank you so much, Jean Bertrand. And I think you've really touched on some pertinent points there. I mean, first of all, you know, people reacting as if the climate crisis is a giant that's fallen on us. I mean, we looked at, um, as Samantha was saying, the power of space technology. We can predict what's coming. We don't need to be surprised. And we can innovate for the future now. And I think your point there about, you know, the changing ideologies. I mean, this is the moment we're in now to change that narrative, to flip the script about how we're seeing these challenges and really to innovate to what we need to get to rather than what we perceive as possible. Um, so thank you, Jean. And you also touched on a point there about the role of young people as innovators. I mean, what unique role do you think that young people can play in really driving innovation forward? Um, you know, I think it's a skill that goes with young people, uh, the older generation. I am old now. I'm no longer <laughs> as young as I am, of course, or I should be. But young people, their mindset is not highly distorted by you know, the reality. They still believe, they have hope, they have visions. Um, of course, you, you have role models, but then at times, as a young person, your role models are things that re are within reach. You, you can like someone, you can envy someone, but the people that you, you want to do or the people that you want to challenge are the likes of the Superman. So your mind is quite creative, and it's even better than, than what e other people expect. So the unique role that young people have needs to be tapped into. Of course, you can never just put a name to it, like what can they do, what can they not do, because it's even beyond what we know they can do. So it's an ability of tapping into that creativity or that unique aspect that they have. Pay attention, listen, also harness it, give them the platform where they can do. So I always use this as a statement. Development partners, they they tend to support or they program throughout the year, right? Uh, we want to do capacity building. It's important at COP, we agreed this and that. But then there are those young people that are in universities. There are those young people like myself that are doing environmental work within communities. And you, if you just give us the resources, this is a million to environmental work and climate change. You are risking the resources, but the research that will come with that money, the innovations that will come with that money, it's even beyond what you might think of. But if you guide us, we want you, we are creating a hub, we want you guys to have a competition with the best innovation. Now I'm more worried about the criteria, what you want me to meet and stuff like that. So there is need for us to be more broad and not focus the young people. Let them fly, let them spread their wings and be wild as they can be that way, then you will notice the new Bill Gates, you will notice you know, the new Microsoft, all that things, all that creativity comes out of thinking without any boxes or whatever. Thank you so much, Jean Bertrand. So, I mean, we're really looking at how do we create a flourishing, an, an enabling environment where you know, people can flourish so they can develop, you know, their own skill sets and their, their insights onto things so that we've got this next generation of, of change makers. Fantastic. Now, I'd like to come on to Rueda uh, next. Welcome, Rueda. Um, so you work in strategic partnerships at the Qatar Fund for Development. Um, so we'd just love to hear your perspective of playing that connector role. Um, what do you see as some of the biggest barriers uh, to innovating for the future needs? Thank you so much, uh, Samantha. Uh, from my side, um, uh, I want to focus, first of all, that there is no doubt that climate change is actually jeopardizing our future generation. And also the lack of our, uh, uh, let's say, uh, action as well when it comes to our own uh, efforts to reduce carbon uh, footprint, for example. These are things that I wanted to stress. However, uh, when it comes to challenges and barriers with climate change and coming from a development agency, we face difficulties actually in finding cohesive initiatives. And this is reflects on what uh, Samantha has stressed when it comes to untap, uh, let's say, uh, perspective from space and also what uh, uh, John has also stressed. Um, we face these kind of difficulties to provide innovative solution mindful of the community itself. We are addressing uh, through our assistance and also finding a collective approach where sustainable impact is beyond the assistance that we provide to ensure what uh, to ensure uh, actually we are empowering this, uh, these communities with the means of production to prevail from the climate change crisis they face and also to help them adapt to these uh, conditions. 
Um, from uh, the state of Qatar uh, or Qatar Fund for Development, we have recently actually launched a climate change um, related uh, strategy. And we focused on the most vulnerable with a small island uh, developing state and also the LDCs as they contribute uh, less when it comes to the, to the climate change. However, they are the most affected. Uh, such a long-term, let's say, uh, strategy we wanted to focus on sustainability and also to ensure that they actually can make and, uh, uh, the ambitious goals of the Paris Agreement and, most importantly, their NDCs. And also to align our efforts when it comes to the strategy to ensure that they actually uh, align with the national adaptation plans of these countries. Um, however, I again stress what uh, Samantha and also uh, Jan has uh, projected when it comes to um, initiative. It needs to be cohesive, it needs to be inclusion of the community and not uh, actually imposed on these communities. Back to you, Samantha. Uh, thank you, Oda. Um, so, sorry, I think you meant Hannah. Um, so, um, when we then think about, we've, we've had a look there at the challenges, but where do you see there to be really opportunities for breakthroughs here? Um, I know that when we discuss, when we, when we caught up the other day, I mean, I know you do a lot of partnerships with grassroots, and I would just love to learn a little bit more about that. So, uh, when it comes to the challenges, actually, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, we need to be actually innovative, we need to be agile, and without with this out-of-the-box, uh, let's say, thinking. And most of the time to find unconventional solution when it comes to addressing climate change, because at the end of the day, climate change is unpredictable and it's challenging. This is on top of the development challenges actually we really face. So we try to f seek uh, to overcome uh, diverse development barriers by supporting, for example, the UNDP uh, Accelerator Labs, uh, it's an initiative that actually offer a new solution that are locally relevant and also locally driven, crucially can be adapted and sustained and also replicated to address sustainable uh, complex needs. And this is one of the examples of the grassroots or bottom-up approach. Another thing I wanted to focus on, which is a recent initiative that we have done with the GGI. So we launched a uh, two green entrepreneurs network uh, in the Pacific and also in the Caribbean uh, countries. Uh, it's actually serving uh, 12 uh, countries. Uh, it is a three-year project which aims to support a green and exclusive uh, job uh, growth by supporting entrepreneurs, and particularly here are women and youth, uh, to develop their green and sustainable business with a sustainability measure uh, of a revolving fund that actually will facilitate the creation of green jobs up to 13 years uh, after the uh, period of the project uh, ends. Also, uh, KFFD has adopted anticipatory action mechanism, uh, particularly towards the most vulnerable groups uh, to act before the hazard or natural disasters uh, strike by engaging in uh, a new financing system in collaboration with strategic partners like Start Network to prepare uh, better in advance for crisis and shocks, uh, creating a comprehensive disaster risk uh, finance system. This is what we should actually focus on when it comes to addressing climate change uh, with the unpredictable patterns that we face currently. Thank you, Rhoda. So, I mean, we're hearing there a lot about this, about the planning and actually anticipating the future demands there. And I think it's really interesting. We heard earlier on this week in this zone, you know, somebody mentioned that, you know, the new normal of tomorrow we're creating today. And I think being able to have that planning cycle and the financing in place, that longevity and sustainability of projects is, you know, it's really valuable to get there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think we're, we're near, the, near to the end of the session, but I'd just love to know as well, um, you know, how, where, what role do you see of creativity and creative partnerships in, in supporting uh, the solutions? Actually, from my side, I wanted to focus on uh, what we have been recently doing with uh, the UN SDG campaign. Uh, and it's uh, actually the one we are part of it currently today and started during the COP26, which is advocating for a different solution when it comes to climate change uh, crisis and flip, flipping the script when it comes to these kind of uh, innovative new solutions. 
We actually acknowledge our strong uh, partnership when it comes to the UN SDG. We feel like uh, such an uh, advocacy moment and also uh, advocacy strategy to ensure the inclusion of youth. One of exa the examples actually um, turning uh, point dialogue, which the UN SDG uh, recently released as well, uh, inclusion of youth when it comes to the discussion and making sure that we uh, facilitate such innovative solution. Um, another thing uh, we look forward actually with the UNSDG, the upcoming uh, United Nations Fifth Conference for the LDCs, which will be hosted in the state of Qatar. And we are trying to also uh, build up uh, towards the flip uh, the script campaign that offers actually a new flipped solution uh, that focuses on women empowerment and also to overcome these kind of uh, challenges uh, with uh, these kind of uh, strategies. Thank you so much, Rueda. And you've really kind of fed in nicely for us to round off the session there so we can talk a little bit more about the Flip the Script campaign and show the video. I mean, really, you know, the essence of this is we've seen over the last year and a half how, well, how everything turned upside down. So it's changed the way that we see the world, each other, even ourselves. You know, we've, we've seen the overlooked become leaders. We've seen unseen people become heroes. And we've witnessed acts of kindness and compassion inspiration and determination, um, cooperation and community on a scale that we never before believed possible. So, you know, we've really seen who is powerful and we've seen how quickly change can happen and what we're truly capable of when we do come together. Um, so, you know, if there was ever a moment to turn it around for people in our planet, it's right now in this moment. And I think we all know that here. Uh, you know, the climate crisis is the most urgent and important issue of our time. Um, and solving it will take everyone. So that does mean people power, not just powerful people. Um, so with, with that, I would really like to introduce our campaign video. So we're looking at how we can flip the script, we can change the narrative. So it's going to be from one of um, apathy into action. We'll turn fear into hope and division into togetherness. Because we know that the climate emergency is actually humanity's greatest opportunity to not just create a livable world, but also to create a better, more sustainable one. So one that, you know, people young and old, women, gender and all identities, uh, indigenous and immigrants, the global south and the global north can flourish. So we really want to tap into that untapped potential of what each person is capable of achieving. Um, so Carlos, can we play the video? Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Rhoda. And thank you, Jean Bertrand. Thank you. Okay.
Deputy Secretary General, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mario. There's a bit of an echo, I think. I hope that kind of counts. So we have a difficult tell. Okay, we've just turned off the handheld mic that was causing the echoes. Malcolm, please, you can uh, continue. So welcome. Oh, <laughs> so uh, let me thank uh, all our co-organizers, UNFCCC, UN Habitat, UNIDO, UNEP, DTU. Thank you all very much uh, for your collaboration in putting this uh, event together. So I'm pleased to, to say ITU has been participating in, in events such as this at climate conferences now for uh, more than 15 years, um, with the aim to increase the awareness of delegates to the significant contribution that digital technologies can bring to climate mitigation and ad adaptation. And I believe that um, over, the, over these years, the message has got home. What is needed now is to look at practical ways of implementing these technologies to save the planet. At each COP, uh, the warnings and the evidence of the influence of human activities on the rapid changes in climate increases. And cities are where most human activities are concentrated. And this makes cities particularly important in the efforts to reduce emissions, as well as they being especially vulnerable to the growing risks of uh, climate change. So cities must become uh, leaders towards a net zero future. And in building climate resilience, formulating meaningful uh, adaptation strategies, in order to uh, minimize uh, these risks. ITU, as the UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, uh, firmly believes that technology is the answer. And emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, Digital Twin, these can enable cities to leverage uh, connectivity and data insight to monitor the change of the climate, reduce carbon emissions, and enhance uh, city planning, uh, the city design, and its resilience. The COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated, uh, as never before, the power of digital technologies and has thankfully increased the, the application of the technology to overcome such huge uh, challenges. Meaningful partnership and collaboration are the foundation for tackling these challenges. And in ITU, we're fortunate to have a very diverse membership of 193 member states, but also over 900 uh, private sector companies, universities, and other international and regional organizations. With this diverse membership, we have been able to contribute through international standards to reduce emissions, monitor the climate and our planet, and encourage the adaptation of uh, enabling policies to attract uh, investments in these innovative digital technologies. Standardization is an integral part of ITU's mandate. And along with ISO and IEC, ITU uh, commends uh, the, uh, the UN Secretary General for recognizing the importance of uh, standards in combating climate change. This was uh, mentioned in his opening address at uh, COP26. And uh, we're always uh, collaborating uh, with the other standards bodies 
especially ISO and IEC, uh, in the initiative to, to make sure that standards are developed to help achieve uh, global net zero emissions. ITU is also collaborating with many other organizations, including municipalities, uh, and the global platform, such as the UN's United for Smart Sustainable Cities Initiative, and also the, the WISIS Forum that we hold in, uh, in Geneva every, every year. So I'm very pleased that uh, we have such an excellent panel of uh, speakers today um, from a diverse set of organizations from around the world. Many thanks uh, to you for being with us. We're very happy to work with you and, and others to bring the power of technology to address this, the most pressing challenge ever faced by humanity. As the UN Secretary General said, uh, cities and urban centers are on the front line of the climate crisis. Investment in recovery is a generational opportunity to put climate action, clean energy, and sustainable development at the heart of cities' strategies and policies. So now more than ever, the key words are collaboration, coordination, and cooperation. Let's pool our resources and expertise together to accelerate climate innovation in cities and communities, and to leave uh, no one uh, wherever they live. So I wish you all a very fruitful uh, discussion, and uh, let's all hope for a very successful outcome to this COP26. Thanks very much. Back to you, Mario. Thank you very much, Malcolm, uh, for those welcoming remarks and for sharing ITU's uh, vision regarding the, the necessary transition uh, to smart, sustainable cities as a solution to the global climate change crisis. And next, uh, we have uh, the welcoming remarks from uh, Ms. Susan Pedersen. She is a recently appointed uh, director of the UN Environment's Technical University of Denmark Partnership, DTU, and who uh, also invite to deliver her welcoming remarks. Susan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's an honor to be here alongside uh, our partner, ITU. Uh, this event comes at a critical uh, juncture for international and city-level communities as we are going through a digital transformation and trying to explore how to, uh, uh, to have uh, the role of digital innovations uh, bring the system-wide uh, changes that we need. Climate change action and digitalization uh, movement should influence each other, and at the strategy level, digitalization should address energy and environmental concerns to lay down a uh, green recovery and low carbon development pathway. We also uh, uh, call on uh, having uh, an environmentally uh, uh, focused mindset among stakeholders, including the ICT sector, uh, to make uh, the necessary actions. We at the UNEP-DTU partnership are engaged with implementing uh, UN environments, uh, climate uh, and energy strategy, and we also host the Copenhagen Center for Energy Efficiency as the global hub under the C for All uh, initiative. And as such, we believe that energy efficiency has much to gain from digital technology solutions. There are many possible technological applications, especially in a city and buildings context. Examples of uh, this uh, are through integration of sensors, communication technologies that can enable smart energy management, etc. But if you take the emerging economies, developing world, uh, uh, there are issues in adopting such solutions. Uh, it could be uh, limitations on con connectivity, connectivity and uh, availability of digital infrastructure. Uh, also, uh, we uh, have uh, seen that the digital infrastructure is uh, now uh, representing an increasing energy um, uh, consumption, uh, basically all over the world, to run uh, connected devices, data centers, etc. 
So uh, when new digital infrastructure is being planned, there should be uh, efficiency, energy efficiency criteria embedded in the overall design so that the best practices uh, and technologies are adopted to limit the uh, energy uh, consumption. And uh, here we at UNEP-DTU partnership do work with, for instance, the World Bank on the definition of guiding criteria for building uh, new uh, and, and retrofitting existing data centers. And we have also uh, worked on uh, um, analyzing the uh, energy impacts of uh, data centers, and we work a lot with cities on uh, retrofitting, uh, street lighting, buildings, and adoption of district energy. Uh, to get, we have also worked with ITU, our partner here today, uh, on um, a brief for innovative data center cooling technologies in China, uh, liquid cooling solutions, which shares the insights into China's experience with the application of liquid uh, cooling technology to improve data center energy efficiency. This brief shares case studies of innovations from uh, client China's leading companies in liquid cooling and provides an overview of technical uh, options in liquid cooling deployment. And uh, we uh, also feel that this brief that we did with ITU uh, highlights well the key issues at play in uh, efforts to introduce liquid cooling at greater scale in China and beyond. And uh, we uh, are, have also uh, generally uh, worked to, to uh, help UNEP, our key partner, in uh, uh, introducing uh, not only an urban uh, integrated approach, but also that uh, UNEP wants to uh, focus more on the digitalization as well. So we will probably in the coming uh, four years work more with UNEP in this area. But to, uh, to uh, end, I would really uh, stress the good collaboration we have with ITU. Uh, we uh, uh, work together, we uh, uh, participate uh, in various things together, and we are really committed to working with uh, ITU and its study group, uh, 20 uh, on Internet of Things and smart cities and communities in responding to the climate challenge. So hopefully uh, in this panel and beyond, we can think outside the box and move from commitments to uh, real sustainable results. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for, for your welcoming remarks and, and for sharing DTU's key initiatives and how the digital work stream uh, plays a key role in your, in your partnerships and, and the collaboration with, with other entities. And I will ask you to please uh, keep your mic because I'm going to ask you to, uh, to be part of the panel uh, and to, kit, to, kit and to uh, get it uh, uh, started. But before that, I will ask all our panelists uh, to please uh, try to keep your responses uh, to up to four minutes in order that we have the opportunity to have equal uh, uh, time for, for all of you. And, um, and in that way, we can also uh, see if at the end we can have a more of an interactive discussion as well. Um, so with, with that, Susan, um, I would like you to, to start the panel uh, discussion. And, and I would like to ask you, and building on, on, on what you just mentioned uh, in your welcoming remarks, uh, with regard uh, with um, the, some of the apparent ambiguities that there are uh, from uh, the, say, the, the national zero, uh, uh, net zero pledges from countries. And if you could probably explain to us what are these ambiguities and, and then also uh, tie in uh, your response on how uh, international standards uh, can perhaps help to disseminate, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate some of these an uh, ambiguities and the importance of uh, also uh, um, uh, int uh, innovation to achieve the, 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 the net zero carbon uh, uh, emissions, particularly with the view of cities and communities. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, I will, uh, of course, in four minutes, not be able to do all that, but uh, there are definitely a, a lot of ambiguity and the whole uh, net zero terminology uh, and the pledges that we hear from all over here at the COP, uh, it makes it a bit uh, difficult. And it is a very technical field. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a technical effort that goes into calculating all these things. But the balance uh, and the zero sum between the amount of uh, absolute emissions emitted and absolute emissions removed are uh, at the crux of the matter. And uh, one of the items is also what emissions uh, do you actually control? What do countries and territories control? What do cities control? We hear many pledges from cities as well, and they probably often refer only to the emissions or removed uh, emissions under their own responsibility. And also uh, in these uh, net zero discussions, you also compare actually avoided, reduced or displaced emissions uh, with a reference uh, scenario. And this is definitely where it becomes a bit tricky. Uh, if you take a construction of a renewable energy plant in India, uh, for example, uh, there, the reference point is quite likely the current national energy mix, which is coal and oil. And then you would calculate the difference in emissions between the two scenarios uh, and, and uh, look at the avoided emissions in uh, installing a renewable energy plant uh, rather than a coal plant. So, it, but it is, does become very um, uh, difficult. And, and getting on to the second point, uh, transparency is really the name of the game. Uh, the fact that uh, many actors publicly pledge here at COP is certainly one uh, way to hold people accountable, but um, standards are also uh, necessary uh, to try to uh, work uh, out um, a consensus-based uh, uh, approach to how to uh, hold people accountable for their net uh, zero commitments. They should also preferably be easy to understand because, as I just tried to explain very poorly, I'm sure uh, it is very complicated, very technical. But I think uh, on an ending note, a particular point is also uh, like uh, the Secretary General of UN said, uh, that we do need standards to measure and analyze net zero uh, commitments from non-state actors as well. One thing is the countries, et cetera, but I'm sure companies like the ones here, coalitions, uh, industry organizations, cities, and whatever, they all come with uh, pledges, and these are some of the non-state actors, and this is also uh, yet another area where it becomes quite difficult. So calling for transparent standards is certainly a, a shout out from our side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. And uh, also thank you for explaining uh, that it's quite necessary to have a common understanding and a clear definition of when we talk about uh, net zero and neutral, climate neutrality and, 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 and so forth so that everybody understands and it's the same page and there's no ambiguity as to what is that is, is trying to be achieved. Thank you. Um, Next, I'm going to uh, move on and um, ask uh, Masamba Tioye from, uh, he's, he is the uh, executive, uh, project executive of here of the hub, uh, Innovation Hub, which as he explained in his opening uh, remarks at the session that uh, this has been initiated just this week here at UNS Triple C. And um, I've, I've been witness to how much activity you have uh, you've been having uh, all these past uh, five days, and we really commend you for for for, the, for that. And uh, perhaps you can share uh, what um, how do you see this hub uh, now and in the future going forward, uh, contributing to uh, accelerate climate innovation and and uh, for cities and communities, and and also. Uh, I've also noted that you have many activities dedicated to digital technologies and the importance of digital. And in this regard, uh, if you can share a few examples of, uh, of these technologies and how uh, they're being used to support uh, climate action by, by cities. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. So um, the main purpose of the 
um, UN Climate Change Global Innovation Hub is to enhance the effectiveness of the use of innovation to serve climate action. Uh, currently, in the innovation framework, there are several barriers hindering the effective mobilization of the potential for innovation to serve climate. So the first is, the, let's say, the framework under which pledge and commitment and objective are set. Pledge and commitment are generally based on what is perceived as possible and not what is needed. So where objective and pledge are based on what is already possible, there is no room for innovation. So what we are trying to promote is a moonshot way of thinking where pledge, objective, and commitment are based on what is needed and the gap between what is needed and what is possible is precisely what innovation will have to fill. So the first thing that is really needed is to promote this um, moonshot thinking. The second aspect is the fact that innovation focus currently on sector and its main purpose is to, let's say, improve what is already in place, focusing mainly on how do we decrease the carbon footprint of existing product and services. This is needed, this is important, but this is definitely not enough to achieve the climate goal. So what we are proposing, and it actually it narrows down the space dedicated to innovation, because only some specific type of innovative climate action can be mobilized with that, under that perspective. So to, to open up the space dedicated to innovation, the Global Innovation Hub promote to go back to the core human need and explore whether they can be satisfied alternatively in an innovative manner using new value chain that are more aligned with the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement as well as the sustainability goal. So just to give a simple example, most of the focus on addressing the problem of mobility is how do we um, move from combustion car to electric, electric vehicle. This is very much sector focus. And if innovation focus only on this aspect, there are important, um, more transformative type of climate actions that are missed. For example, how do we use um, um, mobility as a services with co-sharing co -sharing of sharing of car? How do we design our city differently so that they are more compact, so that they are more self-sufficient, so that all services and product are at biking and walking distance? Or how do we leverage the digital technology to actually meet the core need of access differently? Using, for example, digital technology through telecommuting to replace trip to walk, or using digital technology for teleeducation to replace trip to school and so, and so, and so. So we can see that if you focus at the sectoral level, you miss a lot of innovation opportunity that you can actually mobilize when you go back at the core need that is to be satisfied. And then another aspect that is really important is to not focus only on the problem. So. The approach that has been taken so far is to identify the core polluter and then focus on how they can reduce their emission. We need to give space for the solution provider. So for example, those that are developing this digital technology, we need to know um, how they are contributing to addressing climate change. If I'm a um, startup, developing digital technologies that can be used by others. 
to reduce their emission, I would like to have a framework that will measure the impact of my solution. And I would like to be recognized as a climate actor. And all these things are missing. So the framework that we are creating would like to provide space for a need-based and solution-oriented approach to innovation to better serve climate. Now, if you take that approach, <coughs> digital technology become extremely important because if you want to measure consumption at the individual level, you need digital technology. If you want to measure, um, if you want to set a framework to measure um, the climate contribution of a city using a consumption-based approach, you need also to have digital technology, otherwise you will not be able to, to do it. So digital technology is really important under that framework to support climate action. Thank you very much, Masama, for that. And once again, thank you very much for hosting us uh, this afternoon. And now uh, I would like to pass uh, to our panelist, uh, Mr. Uh, Jordan Verbeek. He's the head of research and innovation at Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, GCOM. And um, Jordan, can you tell us how does the Global Covenant of, of Mayors help cities across all world regions with their innovation journey? And uh, given we are living through extraordinary uh, times with not only the climate crisis, uh, but also the COVID-19 pandemic, has this impacted research and innovation priorities for cities? Uh, and has there been a shift towards accelerating digital transformation that is required? Thank you. Thank you for those uh, questions. And I think, as uh, Susan already said, it's impossible to answer them in just a couple of minutes. I think today, talking about climate, talking about cities, is also talking about complexity, but in a nice way. It's, it's not something that, that should frighten us. If I talk today on behalf of the Global Covenant of Mayors, I'm talking on behalf of more than 11,000 cities. And I think there it's important to, to keep in mind that um, while roughly the challenges or, or the needs are the same, and I'm always happy to come after Masamba, of course, I think we're quite aligned in our approach. I think uh, when you look at this decade, it's not just only about pledges and commitments, it's also about impact and implementation. And that's really important to understand that uh, in those 11,000 cities, there are not all front-running cities. There are cities that are big, there are cities that are small, there are cities that are in the beginning of the climate action journey and that yet have to develop their approach, that don't always have the means, the capacity. So to take into account where cities are at the moment, what are they capable of, and what do they really need to create this impact? And I think there the idea of a journey is really important to unburden cities, to really reflect with them if we go beyond commitment towards implementation and impact, um, what are really priorities, what are first steps to take, um, what are necessary enablers, what are partnerships, uh, and also to come back to, to Malcolm, um, what is the coordination, the, the cooperation uh, we want to, to set up. And I think um, important there if we say unburdening cities, it's really to see what are the solutions that are already there? What are things that we can help cities across world regions, taking all these disparities into account to really see where can we make a difference? And where do we need to invest in the next couple of years to really address the speed and scale needed to make sure that we arrive at those 2030, 2050 horizons? And I think important, um, if we look at cities today, we've been lo long looking at cities as indeed making commitments or just managing the, the approach, I think diving into complexity means also diving into all the differences. And when I was on the train uh, from Edinburgh to Glasgow this morning, I was uh, talking to uh, an old Scottish uh, anthropologist who said, like, you know, human people are tribes persons, but they also tend to stick to their tribe, like NGOs talking to NGOs, businesses to businesses, and city reps to city reps. So how to go across that tribe and how to design a journey where we can really unburden all the complexity and say, this is priority, but this is also the agendas that are maybe different, but that we need to bring together to really, and that's where I uh, join the Samba, go to these needs where we all have a role and responsibility, and we can, where we can start a dialogue to say, this is what we can bring in if we want to uh, achieve the, uh, the impact we put on the table. When we come to the pandemic, I think one thing we've seen in all the cities uh, across the globe is that the pandemic, for me, really changed the narrative. Uh, while before we were focusing uh, from the Global Covenant of Mayors on mitigation, on adaptation, on energy access, I think we've seen that uh, now the dialogue has shifted to how do we bring about this building back better? How do we bring about this green recovery? 
and maybe it's um, it's bold to say, but uh, maybe we are in a period now where climate is not the main driver, but the biggest co-benefit. Where we really think with cities, how do we prepare for the future? Uh, many uh, built environments that need to be renovated, many cities that are growing where we need to build new um, neighborhoods and, and districts, but also rethink uh, mobility in line with uh, built environment, rethink industry, power and energy grids, what will be central, what will be decentralized in the future to address a systemic change, taking this complexity into account, but also taking the priorities into account, knowing that the budget, the capacity, um, and the stakeholder and partnerships are limited. But to really start, and rather than designing a perfect answer or a perfect portfolio, to really think, what can we already address now? What are the partnerships we have? And to build on them and have this also reflexive monitoring as we go to see where we can refine, but also are we on track towards these uh, long-term horizons and where we need to adapt. So I, I think um, as main conclusion, diving into this complexity is not to say like it's difficult, but it's to say like it's an important journey where we can really standardize as much as possible, but customize where needed to deliver this impact. Thank you very much, Jorn, and for sharing what GCOM is doing and how uh, difficult it is to try to navigate through all these complexities and the diversity that exists between different cities and the importance also to go from uh, uh, promises to actual uh, implementation uh, of many of these aspects that are required um, uh, and that's an increasing uh, urgency that we have uh, today. Um, let, me also, let me now uh, turn to the ICT corporate sector. And uh, we have with us here today uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Philippe Tutolino, and he is the Vice President of Environment of the Orange Group. And uh, welcome, Philip. And, and now, um, so you oversee the environment and the organization of climate change net zero carbon objectives at Orange. Um, given and, and given the, the importance of, of uh, the enabling role of ICTs and digital technologies uh, and the increasing technological innovations out there, uh, what, do, uh, what results do you expect from COP26 in this respect? And what, uh, what are the main levers that the Orange Group wants to, uh, to develop to meet the objectives of the Paris uh, Agreement and given the climate cha uh, challenges, uh, particularly for cities and communities? Thank you, Mario, and uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm, I'm very proud and thank you for the invitation for this, uh, for this panel. Uh, yes, for the COP26, we are expecting some something about the two aspects, the enforcement of the NDAC of the countries, because Orange is present in, uh, as an operator in 27 countries and for business in 163 uh, 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 countries. So we implement innovation solutions everywhere uh, in different countries and we have th many thresholds uh, in different part of the, of the, of the uh, continent, in America, in Europe, in, in Africa, in Asia, because we think that the innovation uh, has the not sense and uh, it burns differently around the different city uh, and we have to adapt locally what we want to implement an, an innovation system. And the Article 6 is important too for, uh, for the recognition of the role of, of, of ICT because the transfer of uh, carbon reduction, uh, it will be important and it clones ICT solution uh, to, to be uh, to take into account the carbon uh, uh, cost in the market and if we can uh, put into the carbon market the ICT solution it, it could foster the innovation uh, in uh, in some countries uh, to other countries and to transfer the technical technology and to help to be successful to the Par Paris Agreement recommendation uh, after that or Orange have commit to be net zero in 2040 uh, we have member of Net Zero Initiative for the company. What we say to in this initiative is that a company can be zero. Zero is a nonsense today that will be zero. There are many commitments everywhere. We are net zero, we are zero, we are zero. And the light IPCC report says that the, the global warming is increasing. If it is increasing, there is a problem between the declaration and the results. So it's because we have to act now, not in, in 30 years, in 20 years. How we can act? We, we can act to spread immediately in solution, innovative solution in city with ICT. But we have shown, as Malcolm said, uh, that with the COVID crisis, we have immediately a response. The Tokai cities could be innovative immediately and with solution. But if we want to be net zero, we, ha we have to, to pr 
propose uh, 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 innovative solution, but the solution, innovative solution has to be uh, by design uh, clear, clean by themselves. But, uh, if we implement solution, for example, in city for autonomous vehicle, if we want to avoid to use diesel vehicle to reduce CO2 emission of transportation, we can implement different user, different way, as you say, uh, of use uh, ICTs. It's uh, car sharing for Orange. Or Orange have implement solution of car sharing a car sharing in this fleet. We have uh, uh, 4,000 cars in car sharing in your company, uh, and we re reduce drastically the CO2 emission of a fleet. And if we want to provide this kind of solution, the, we can uh, use uh, autonomous ve vehicle with data center with polluted. So we have to be net zero as the origin of the data we provide to the solution to say that a car sharing could help the cities to reduce the CO2 emission. So we have to have a, co a global, and to do that, we have to measure, to be audit, to be compare, and, and to uh, measure what the, is the contribution to the net zero of a region, of a city, of the planet, is the role of the company. And to that, we need standardization. And we have the chance with ITU, thanks so much for ITU, we implement a methodology. It's the L4770 methodology, which gives the trajectory, uh, trajectory of the sector to be compliant with the 1.5 de degrees of IPCC recommendation. We apply this to a company, and we know that we have step to respect years by years to be sure that we are aligned with the recommendation uh, of IPCC and the Paris Agreement. And we have to work to promote this kind of solution, ICT solution, compliance with this kind of standards, and we have to be auditable to, uh, and, and to, um, uh, to com contribute to the net global net zero of the planet or city of or region. Thank you very much, Philippe, for sharing with us uh, what the Orange Group is doing and uh, with respect to meeting the Paris Agreement. Uh, 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 and also, congratulations, and hopefully you will meet the 2040 uh, to be net zero, and we wish you luck with that. Uh, next with us is, uh, is, is Mr. Silvio Dolinsky. He is the Deputy Secretary General of uh, the International Organization for Standardization, ISO. And uh, which is also an organization that, that, that supports innovation and provides solutions to global challenges for the, with respect to climate change. Um, Silvio, um, thank you for being with us here today. And uh, also, um, the challenges faced by cities uh, due to climate change are, are, are well known. And uh, Malcolm and, and Suzanne have also uh, addressed uh, a bit on the importance of international standards. Uh, can you share with us specifically um, uh, how ISO standards are, are, uh, can, can help tackle these, uh, these challenges? And how uh, can cooperation with other international standard organizations help cities achieve digital transformation uh, and address climate change? Mario, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for ITU for inviting us all to participate. And we are very thankful for the continuous collaboration with ITU and the, the IEC Electrical, International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, well, I, uh, I love to be in a panel when actually the input from my f previous panelists changed my thoughts, right? That's, uh, that's wonderful. And uh, I think the first, your two questions kind of combine it to a large extent. Uh, because making reference to what was said before about unburdened cities, and uh, I think what international standards, and then not only ISO standards. Actually, if my boss hears me, I might get in trouble. But, uh, I couldn't care less whether people use ISO standards. What's important is that people, end users, use international standards, consensus-based developed standards that can be certified and make sure that we are all talking about the same and that we can bring integrity, we can bring trust to the system and avoid something that many stakeholders here in these few days have been talking about, that it's that we are awash in greenwash. So I think the international standards bring that, bring that integrity and trust to the system. Yesterday I was in a very interesting meeting with representatives from Singapore, which is a state, but also a city. And they say, well, we can't, it's simply impossible that we achieve net zero only with our own generated energy, food, everything. We, try, we need to import hydrogen. And the hydrogen we will import will measure whether it's net zero according to whom? It's like the Australian standards, the Chilean standards, the German standards. Having these international standards is absolutely crucial because 
it's impossible for them to achieve that. Otherwise, know w what direction they are going. Uh, another aspect is about, also related to the unburdening of the cities, is about the transfer of knowledge. Not all cities, again, uh, referring to the diversity, it's, like, it's a very fragmented space, the one of cities. It's like across the world. Not all cities are Glasgow, Toronto, or Tokyo with access to expertise, knowledge, resources. We need to support cities that are in remote areas that are, don't have that access to expertise. And how do we bring the knowledge from the best minds of the world and the learnings to those cities to progress with the sense of urgency that is needed? If we want to achieve 50% reduction in nine years from now, actually it's absolutely crucial that we are all working on the same base. If we are still discussing another five years to agree on what we are going to, how we are going to measure things, we are in 2027 already. It's like that doesn't work. And then comes to your second question is about the work together among standard organizations working towards convergence of standards, ensuring the interoperability of standards to all domains of a city, of an urban area that has to go from mobility to infrastructure to physical and digital infrastructure and so on. And ITU, IC, and ISO have a joint task force on smart cities that we are doing exactly that. One concrete example, as you ask it, is about digital twins methodology, supporting cities to assess the uh, life cycle of infrastructures and incorporate climate dimension in the decision-making process of design, execution, and operation of those infrastructures. Um, thank you very much, uh, you. Silvio, and I think you've reinforced uh, some of the messaging that we've we have already had this morning uh, with Malcolm and, 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 and Suzanne. Malcolm, with respect to the importance of cooperation, collaboration, coordination, and also what Susan has brought in about having an international standard so that we don't have any ambiguity as to what is the 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 standard that and, and, and the terminology that we are using and everybody has a common understanding. So thank you very much, Silvio. Um, I will now uh, invite my colleague, Omar Siddiqui, uh, head of UN Habitat Office in Kosovo, who will be uh, presenting our next panel expert who is participating under uh, the umbrella of the UN mission in Kosovo. Omar, it, uh, you have the floor to present uh, our next panel expert. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, greetings from Pristina. On behalf of UN Habitat, the UN Kosovo team and mission, it is a pleasure to be with you today um, and introduce Ms. Vittoria Pazzole, who is a member of the Kosovo Assembly and chairperson of its Committee on Environment. Ms. Pazzole, thank you for joining us. From your experience, how best can one encourage bottom-up innovation that comes from cities and local communities? And what are the key challenges and opportunities for the communities from your region to transition away from fossil fuels? And how can cities be more actively supported in these transition measures? Thank you, Omar, and thank you everyone there. So thank you for inviting us and giving us a chance to speak. So um, cities and local communities are key to local economic activity and to knowledge generation and innovation. Through cities and participation of citizens, we can push for new concepts of innovation, and especially now when we need innovative ideas that come from the ground to better manage environmental transition and deal with environmental risks and innovation to move towards socioeconomic transition. How we uh, encourage bottom-up innovation through parliaments, it is important that parliaments understand first the change that we need to do and the, the push that we need to make forward. So uh, what, what kind of change do, uh, do cities have to, to do if, if we want to move towards um, a green transition of our cities? Our cities are lagging behind with, uh, with innovation, with infrastructure, so we need to start from basic steps. We need, for example, to build, uh, let's say, our uh, public 
urban transport that offers citizens to travel from one point to another and that links cities together and also cities within countries in the region together to one another in order to make it easier for citizens to, to travel and to, to go to work and do their daily businesses. What parliamentarians can do in this case, as me being a member of parliament, is that we can help build a long-term vision for communities by bridging gaps and building synergies between all uh, local and national policies. So, um, and this goes beyond um, any particular policy or fund. It is not only about helping communities and providing funding, but it is, it is more looking at the, our, our looking at our communities and understand their needs and understand how we need need to move forward. Regarding the second part of the question, whether how how what are our challenges and key opportunities for Kosovo and other uh, countries in the Western Balkans to move towards uh, uh, away to move away from fossil fuels? Well, all Western Balkan countries except Albania rely on coal for their energy production. Emissions are mainly generated from energy production, from transport and heavy industry combustion, and also households that contribute to air pollution as people use solid fuels to heat their homes. Um, now, Western Balkans leaders in 2020, they have committed to work in line with European Green Deal towards climate neutrality in 2050. But how can we manage and how can we move towards as quickly as we can? It's a bit difficult and it's, it's quite challenging for us. The key challenge is that since um, none of the countries have developed concrete vision for a clean future, they are not prepared to immediately start transitioning to green energy. In the last decades, on the name of green energy transition, in the Western Balkans, there have been lots of investment in hydropower plants. And that this has been environmentally destructive to our nature and to the future of uh, our, uh, our citizens and also to the future of our agriculture. So while transitioning from coal to renewables, it is challenging and cities can play a role here. So uh, cities can, uh, can help us to tackle source of carbon emitters that comes from transport and heavy industry combustion and households. So reducing transport related greenhouse gases through deep decarbonization is one uh, direction to focus. And we encourage also uh, organizations that work on this direction to, to work with cities and with countries in the region in order to help them to move towards decarbonization. And in the end, I would like to conclude and also, also um, make a statement that in order to help all Western Balkan countries climb the ladder towards transition, one thing is important that since there are no borders in climate change, there should be no country without access to UN vertical funds and thematic funds. So in the region, Kosovo, because of its status, has no access to vertical funds, and this limits Kosovo to Kosovo's chances to benefit. So Kosovo's status and any other country's status shouldn't be an obstacle to gain to UN to gain access to UN vertical funds and thematic funds. Because this somehow is an obstacle obstacle, not just for for us as, as, as a country, but it's, it's an obstacle to the whole region. Because if we move towards transition, we have to move towards as a region together. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pazzoli, uh, for joining us uh, today and for your contribution and the recommendations and particular attention to supporting communities and cities in, in your region and, and also for being inclusive and, and uh, uh, paying attention to the needs of the inhabitants uh, in order to, to, to fulfill and, and, and to pinpoint what are the requirements that, that are needed to, to, uh, to uh, tackle these, the, these challenges that we have with respect to climate change and uh, the, the transition uh, to the net zero from, uh, from fuel. So thank you very much for that. And um, to conclude our panel, um, we are fortunate to have with us uh, Ms. Maimuna Jaffer here with us today. And she is the director of the Iskander Regional uh, Development Authority, IRDA. Uh, who leads uh, the Smart City Iskander Malaysia team and is the Chief Smart City Officer for Jawar Baru. Um, Maimuna, uh, the IRDA is, is the Malaysian federal government body uh, tasked to regulate and drive uh, Iskander Malaysia into a strong and sustainable metropolis uh, of international standing. 
Uh, can you please share with us uh, uh, what you are doing to achieve this mandate and how you're fostering an environment that encourages uh, climate innovation? Thank you, thank you for the question. So as you know, uh, I came from an organization which is actually, uh, we are actually an economic uh, region, driving economy down south of Malaysia. And, and I think when we talk about smart city, uh, we first started with what we call sustainable metropolis of international international standing, and we focus on sustainability. And we have our low carbon uh, society blueprint that looks at how we can actually reduce our carbon emission from our 2010 baseline. But I think like what we've been talking about in uh, every year COP uh, that has been held every year, we know that we are short of time. Yeah, so something needs to be done. So for Iskandar Malaysia, for example, we believe that innovation and, and technology can actually accelerate our target to reduce our carbon emission, and it can actually uh, accelerate the targets that we want uh, related to climate change. So for Iskandar Malaysia, for example, when we first embarked in year 2012, uh, we are talking about that sixth dimension, I think, similar also with EU. We have the smart uh, economy, governance, mobility, environment, people as well as living. So, so I think when we talk about smart city, uh, of course, uh, we need to prioritize projects. So uh, our role is actually to plan, promote, and facilitate. And within our region, there are five local authorities. And, and I think uh, when we talk about uh, ASEAN in general, uh, we have also have what we call ASEAN Smart City Network Platform. And there was like 26 cities has been selected in ASEAN uh, to embark on this smart city journey. So every year, each country actually hosts um, uh, uh, the program. And we exchange ideas, we share knowledge, capacity building, and so forth. So for Iskandar Malaysia, for example, as there are five local authorities, so our uh, our uh, smart city is looking at interboundary issues. Yeah, so I think I agree. It's a very complex issues when we talk about climate. For example, take for example river. So sometimes river uh, issues actually cut across five local authorities, and we need one regional authority that actually see how we can actually tackle or manage the river quality within our region. So, so for example, when we talk about that, uh, then we work together with the five cities. We use innovation. We use what we call smart uh, river monitoring system that actually reduce the time that is taken for them to really understand where are the source of pollution. So we use innovation. We use technology. We use auto uh, method uh, sampling to see where exactly is the pollution. So last time when we started on that, we do it manually. But again, with a system that we have, we be able to tackle that. And, and each of the local authority be able to actually take action uh, in real time, actually. So I think innovation and technology is something that needs to be looked at to actually accelerate. I mean, I know that uh, when we talk about climate change, if we don't do anything, we can still achieve the reduction of carbon emission. But it might take a while. So, so I think one of the important enabler also for smart city is actually, of course, the city is actually the champion. We also talk about internet connectivity. We talk about fast, affordable, cheap broadband. We also talk about that big data platform. So having a smart city will, does not mean anything if you don't actually collect the data from the component of that smart city. You integrate, you collate, you analyze, and you use it as an informed decision. So for Iskandar Malaysia, we are currently forming our Iskandar Malaysia Urban Observatory Platform that do just that. So we analyze, we also actually measure. I think we talk about how do we know that we are um, we, we are actually uh, achieving the things that we want to do. So we use our urban observatory to measure. So for example, uh, we also did our SDG 7 assessment on energy. And, and we realized that uh, to really understand where are the source of uh, energy that we need to take to take care of. What are the actions that we need to do? So I think the big data platform actually plays an important role for us to drive smart city. Of course, the, the last one is actually uh, 
uh, solution provider. I think there are many solutions out there, and I think my my role uh, to facilitate uh, cities within, not only in my region but in Malaysia as well. Uh, the challenge is sometimes they don't understand uh, which project that they should do. So I think, as you know, in ASEAN countries, uh, urbanization is happening very fast. So most of us has many urban challenges. So I always tell them that you really need to understand what are the urban challenges that you need to tackle. Then you start to look at that, prioritize, and work with a solution provider and see if they can actually give a win-win business model, work together, networking, partnership, and so forth. So I think um, uh, I, I would like to end uh, with, with looking at challenges. And, and from, from, from there, I think funding is the most issue when we talk about innovation and technology. But again, uh, for a city to innovate, they can always talk about uh, looking at a sustainability first. Yeah? For, so for example, like us, I've actually do some classification. There is actually a beginner. You can do a simple cycling promote walking, those are also innovation. I know cities in ASEAN, they are not used to walk. But if you innovate, you can still uh, do walking, cycling, and so forth. So the second part is actually intermediate. So we, when we talk um, about intermediate smart city project, we talk about how we can use technology. So solar power, I mean, those are a good source of energy for us cities in ASEAN. Yeah? So, but but uh, if you want to look into advanced smart city, then you start to connect your solar power into other things. Then suddenly you have a complete ecosystem of smart city region. So these are the things that we are doing at the moment. And we really believe that technology and innovation should accelerate, um, able to accelerate our vision to become metropolis of international standing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maimuna, for sharing uh, everything you are doing to transform uh, Iskandar into a uh, model, a uh, smart, sustainable city in your, in your region, and for uh, also letting uh, note, us know to the challenges and, and, and the needs that you require to provide uh, these, these solutions. And we wish you all the, all the, all the luck and, and, and commend you for all these efforts. Uh, dear panelists, uh, we, uh, time is upon us, so um, I would like to thank all of you for, for your participation th this afternoon. And I would like now to conclude the session uh, by giving the floor to my colleague, Christina Buetti, who is the focal point on environment and uh, smart sustainable cities at ITU. And she's joining us remotely from headquarters in Geneva to provide the closing remarks. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. See that there is an echo. I hope uh, that it will go better. So thank you, thank you, Mario, for moderating the session, and thank you for the excellent session. As the event really coming to a close, uh, allow me uh, to quickly wrap up and share some of the key messages that we had during uh, this side event. Um, we, we have discussed the importance of climate innovation in cities and, and communities. We have heard from different UN agency representatives, city representatives, the private sector, on, on how each of us can play a role in nurturing uh, an open environment where digital transformation can be aligned with, you know, the climate target. Uh, we also understand that standards are important instrument for raising climate ambitions and facilitating uh, mitigation actions. Uh, this is echoed by the UN Secretary General in, in the opening day of COP26, where he announced he will, that he will establish a group of experts to propose clear standards to measure and analyze net zero commitments from non-state actors. Um, I have no doubt that many of us are able and willing to contribute to this expert group and will be part of the process to drive uh, global net zero emissions. As we have heard in today's event, standards are certainly a key role to play also in combating climate change and, uh, you know, really ensuring the necessary interoperability requirements of digital systems and other performance expectations that are needed for city to be able to function and to deliver uh, services to their citizens. Um, it was also mentioned that, you know, uh, IQ and I, so together with IC, uh, are working through the Joint Smart City Task Force, and, and of course, that they'll be delighted to collaborate 
on this new uh, UN Secretary General initiative to share existing standards. Um, we have also had the, the excellent initiatives undertaken uh, by the private sector. So, for example, you know, on how the ICT sector itself can really, um, you know, uh, implement uh, a trajectory that will help them to stay below the 1.5 degrees. Uh, it is also important to, you know, note the challenges uh, that were that cities are facing, and and really the uh, great efforts that are being made, uh, you know, to overcome those challenges, and how digital technologies certainly can uh, play a great role. Um, we, all of us participating in this process, have heard from world leaders and climate experts. Uh, that multi-level collaboration is necessary to deliver on climate goals. So I really uh, want to take the opportunity uh, to invite all of you to join our collective uh, efforts to tackle climate change. Um, global initiatives like, you know, the, the United for Smart Sustainable Cities and, you know, uh, that, that were just mentioned provide an open platform where stakeholders, especially city representatives, can really contribute. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, the co-organizer, in particular Masamba, the entire UNFCCC team that did, you know, an amazing uh, work also, uh, not only in uh, really helping us to organize this uh, site event, but to provide the, the, the facilities. I'd like to thank all the UN colleagues involved in the organization of this site event, the speakers, and, and of course, uh, all the participants that uh, are um, attending this site event um, on site in Glasgow, but also remotely uh, through YouTube. Um, have a great rest of your day, and I really wish you a wonderful COP26. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And once again, thank you to our panelists for being here today and for our audience who have joined us this afternoon. And I wish you a nice afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you.
So good afternoon, um, dear participants. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those that are following us virtually. My name is Masamba Choi. I'm the executive of the UN Climate Change Global Innovation Hub. The hub has uh, two components. The first is um, the physical hub. This is what we are currently participating in. It is in the form of pavilion that will take place at each COP. And the objective here is to bring together all the relevant stakeholders um, working on how to best use innovation for uh, climate so that they can um, co-innovate together so that we can promote um, radical collaboration among them. So this is for the physical hub. And then we will have also a digital hub, which purpose is also to, let's say, um, find solution for a demand for climate um, solution. So the specificity of the innovation hub is that we want to explore alternative way of using innovation to serve climate. So far, innovation for climate has been focused at the sectoral level, which is good, but not enough to achieve the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement. So instead of focusing only at the sector level and trying to improve the carbon footprint of product, we uh, will rather go back to the core need, core human need that product and uh, services are trying to satisfy and explore alternative way of satisfying this core need. So it means that um, instead of improving current product and services, we'll explore alternative product and services that are more um, climate friendly. So if you want to measure the impact of such type of climate action, where you replace a product that is very much carbon intensive with another product that is le less carbon intensive, if you want to measure the impact, you need to know the carbon footprint of the product that is displaced. You need also to know the carbon footprint of the new product. Hence, the link with the work Comet is doing, and this is why the UNFCCC Secretariat did not hesitate to join Comet and uh, try to put in place a collaboration that focus mainly on finding alternative way, um, let's say, way to measure carbon footprint that goes beyond that, what is currently in place, and, and uh, work for harmonization. Because the problem is we have a plethora of approach to determine, to determine carbon footprinting, which is a little bit confusing. So if you are able to, let's say, harmonize all these different approach, it would send a much better sin signal out there. So after this introduction, I will pass over to Paolo Natali, who is um, one of the lead of this um, initiative so that he makes some introduction before handing over to the moderator. Paolo, you have the floor. Thank you, Masamba. Uh, thanks, uh, Masamba, to your team uh, who has been uh, uh, wonderful uh, working with us in the last uh, few months, uh, UNFCCC Secretariat. Uh, thanks uh, to you all who are here today. Um, to hear us uh, talking about uh, the future of supply chain emissions and carbon accounting. Um, my name is Paolo Natali. I am uh, uh, leading the supply chain emissions initiative at uh, RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute. I'm here today with uh, Jordi Lee of Colorado School of Mines, the Payne Institute at Colorado School of Mines. Together we will give you a short presentation about uh, the comet uh, project and uh, we will go actually into some depth uh, on uh, uh, what uh, uh, the principles for harmonizing carbon accounting in our view um, look like 
and then uh, we will have a panel discussion that I'll introduce later about halfway through this hour that we will spend uh, together to have a bit of a discussion about uh, uh, the problems and actually more importantly the, the solutions. So let me take a step back, uh, a little bit further back to what Masamba was saying about uh, the, the creation of the Innovation Hub. Uh, I want to go back uh, to, uh, to actually COP22 in Marrakesh a few years ago uh, when uh, the Marrakesh partnership was born, uh, when it was established that in order to solve the, the problem of accurate uh, accounting for national GHG disclosures, uh, non-state actors uh, had to be an important part of the game. Um, that is very true because in order to uh, accurately account, especially for industrial emissions, uh, you have to take into account private sector disclosures. And uh, without collaboration with uh, um, business actors, and uh, as we will uh, as we will see, uh, uh, me the methodologies that business actors use, uh, it is quite difficult to come uh, to an improvement of uh, of national GSG accounting. So that's how we started. The Comet project has been um, seeking a partnership with UNFCCC exactly for this reason. We were born. As a, a, as a coalition of uh, partners, uh, some, uh, some in the NGO sector like us at RMI, others uh, academia, the Payne Institute at School of Mines, uh, Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment. Uh, we, we started uh, with the idea that uh, we would want to harmonize uh, carbon accounting practices for business, for, for especially hard to abate sectors. But then it's, it very quickly became apparent that there was a national level uh, of, of GHG accounting, uh, everything related to nationally determined contributions uh, that needed to be linked. And so we, we sought that link and, uh, and we found it. Um, now, the, the main problem that we are addressing with uh, the Comet framework that we will be discussing uh, uh, briefly today is that there are uh, a few carbon accounting methods too many. There's uh, over 250 ways uh, to account for carbon as you disclose uh, emissions uh, as a company. And so this is a very uh, um, uh, acute problem in, uh, in the private sector. So we started a journey of uh, trying to understand what it means to harmonize, to consolidate uh, those, uh, those methodologies. Uh, and, and we came to the conclusion that it's a big problem because, uh, uh, because companies are more and more under scrutiny to, uh, to try and understand uh, uh, what is their actual footprint. You have, uh, uh, and now, now, now is the time when I'm trying to click and change slide and it, doesn't work. So if I can have the next uh, slide, please. Thanks. And it, so th the, this is the, the shape of the, of the issue we're trying to address. The tide has turned on private sector disclosures. If we were here discussing this issue 10 years ago, we wouldn't have the problem because simply so few companies would be under pressure to disclose. Uh, today, uh, over Half of uh, S&P 500 companies uh, have sustainability and uh, climate-specific goals. Financial institutions are elevating climate risk in their investment considerations. And uh, uh, finally, governments are starting to mandate uh, disclosures. And uh, even, as I said at the beginning, uh, and, and hopefully as a result of, uh, of this COP26, uh, NDCs will come under scrutiny. So if I... If I, thanks. if I fast forward to 2025, which is not very far, it's only in four years' time, we will have NDCs uh, uh, coming under, under higher scrutiny. Actually, it, it's the news of today that there are proposals uh, to um, uh, check on uh, the progress of NDCs on an annual basis, not, not uh, every five years anymore. Uh, higher scrutiny requires better numbers, better metrics. Uh, and, and then companies, uh, look at look at 20. 21 here, there's over 2,000 companies that have uh, some sort of relationship with the Science-Based Targets Initiative, either because they have committed to, uh, to SBTs or because they have actual approved SBT uh, targets. This will require more robust uh, disclosure. And, uh, 
And the situation on the ground today looks like my next slide. <laughs> it looks like this. Environmental disclosures come in all uh, shapes uh, and forms. Uh, and uh, the journey that we need to, to, to walk together is one of convergence. It can't be so difficult uh, to understand what is uh, the uh, performance of a company or of a country. Um, and, and, and the sticking point uh, is that the tools that we've had, the main protocol that we all uh, uh, conceive when it comes to the taxonomy of emissions, uh, scope one, scope two, scope three, is the GHG protocol. It was written 20 years ago. It was never intended to be a, a tool for making comparisons. It was intended to be a tool for a company to understand their own uh, path. Today we need to make comparisons because these things are starting to become uh, uh, used by decision makers to discriminate between one company and the other, for example, as they make investments, or by consumers uh, when uh, they buy products. Uh, we need a much, much more consolidated uh, situation than, uh, than this. So we need to, to put a ha the house in order, so to say, and ensure comparability, which is uh, problem number one. Our solution, the solution that we uh, propose is the Comet framework. Next slide, thanks. Um, the idea here is not to create uh, a new carbon accounting methodology, let me be clear. The idea is to provide uh, some guiding principles that we will briefly uh, talk about today, and uh, then provide sector-specific guidance uh, for how those principles uh, uh, can be uh, ap applied in each of the key sectors. Um, the key sectors that we've selected, uh, you can see here as a sort of periodic table representation that is you know, far from perfect, but this is the, the way we, we think about the problem. They are the most important uh, emitters in, uh, in hard to abate sectors. Uh, it's, you see the building materials on the left, uh, you see iron and steel, which drives about a quarter of industrial emissions just on its own, non-ferrous metals, oil and gas, and, and so forth. Uh, each of these sectors will have its own specific guidance. It will be a guidance uh, that is uh, both uh, a sort of uh, Rosetta key for translating, for applying the principles to the existing methodologies, and it will also be a guidance uh, that will specify, as Masamba was saying at the beginning, we have a problem in supply chain emissions in, in particular. Uh, the, the GHG protocol doesn't really tell you how you allocate uh, emissions uh, from uh, a, a producing assets, so from a factory, on uh, to its products, uh, and how those emissions from for products uh, travel along the supply chain. So there needs to be a supplementation of GHG protocol in this important area, and, and, GHG, uh, and, and the Comet framework uh, will, uh, uh, will address uh, this uh, problem. Um, now, coming to the overarching principles, I, um, I, we've been working on the Comet framework for about two years now, so we've had all sorts of conversations about what these principles should be and how they improve, how they bring value into the ecosystem. Now, in my next slide, these are the principles that we want to promote and also have a bit of a discussion today. We've encountered, <laughs> we've encountered a lot of um, pushback sometimes on, uh, on the need for, for improvement in, uh, in carbon accounting practices. So we would like to touch briefly upon uh, those principles and, uh, and why we believe are, uh, that they are uh, so, so key. So let's start uh, from uh, the principle number one. We need to ensure a layer of comparability between companies and methods. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, the existing tools, as I said, were never designed to enable comparisons uh, between uh, companies uh, within industries uh, and uh, and so we, we need a we need a way to uh, implement uh, the, the possibility of, of making comparisons and here is where uh, where Jordi can tell us a bit uh, a bit more in depth uh, how uh, the comet framework is going to address that as its first uh, principle thanks Paolo uh, yeah next slide please mark yeah so there, you saw earlier from the slide with a huge kind of mess of environmental disclosures, um, there's not a lot of comparability between companies and methods. So the way we can fix that is if we harmonize key methods by providing detailed material specific guidance so that companies and disclosures are measured and reported in the same way. So an example of how this might work is if you look on the right side, 
this is kind of the basic uh, flowchart for how steel is made. And then we can get more specific with each company and in which each, each disclosure requirement saying that this is the exact type of data we'll need if you want to have this disclosure approved or be under the Comet framework. So the hundreds of initiatives are each asking hundreds of different questions, and they're all trying to get to the same point. But the difficult part comes in, and you have to really understand these different industries, and you have to really understand these different processes before you can hold companies accountable and request the appropriate data from them for comparability. And that's really what we're looking for, for comparability between companies and methods. We want to standardize the data that companies are disclosing so that there is that innate level of comparability. If everyone's answering the same questions in the exact same way, then you have comparability. All right, now coming to the second principle, um, the idea is that um, scope three emissions, so supply chain emissions, uh, uh, pass uh, through the product level. They, your scope three emission as a company are uh, the emissions that come from your suppliers or that are implied in your customers' emissions, but they're not all of, of your suppliers' emissions. They are the ones that have been emitted by this supplier in producing the products that you have purchased. This uh, level of, th this scope of emissions can only be estimated accurately if uh, you use the actual data and uh, have a way to track the primary data as they flow in uh, supply chains. Um, otherwise, you come to an estimate, like in the chart that you see here in the slide, which uh, uh, would assume that at every step of the supply chain uh, there's roughly um, a, a similar contribution. Every step of the supply chain makes a similar contribution. But the reality is quite different, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So, like, like Paolo was saying, if you're using estimates, you have a very simplified view of the actual emissions embodied in a product or along a supply chain. And to get better data, we need to start requiring measured data instead of estimates. Um, this will enable primary data to flow through, but it will also create uh, a lot of incentives for companies to communicate and really understand how to decarbonize the supply chain. So if you look at the chart on the right, um, compared to the last chart, it was very steady and slow. But in reality, supply chains um, are much more complex, and there's actually very obvious areas of focus that are kind of pain points for decarbonization that need to be focused on. But if, you're, if everyone's estimating along a supply chain, it's not really clear what that point is. Um, you know, if downstream companies are estimating and upstream companies aren't communicating with downstream companies, then we'll never be able to find the actual decarbonization point or the areas that are useful for decarbonization. So because of that, this scope three disclosures need to be based on primary data. They need to be enabling this conversation between companies so that we can really achieve uh, productive decarbonization instead of just assuming that we're all kind of working towards the same goal. And finally, principle number three, which is uh, a smart uh, and contextualized uh, rules uh, to incentivize decarbonization. This is something that we actually learned along the way. Uh, it is not enough to just uh, have a system that enhances transparency in supply chains to, to let you see the actual uh, emissions. It's also important to understand for the specific supply chain, what sort of incentivization we need to provide uh, in order for that sector to truly decarbonize, to avoid uh, creating incentives that simply shift uh, uh, emissions uh, from uh, one player to the other, for, from, from the player that maybe cares less about uh, their own uh, GHG disclosures to the one that cares more, and there is no real decarbonization in the process. So we're also going to address that problem in the Comet framework, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so if you have smart contextualized rules, um, you can really start to play with what green definitions and decarbonization targets actually mean. So we spoke earlier about having primary data and really understanding these industries, but that's when we start to get some of the difficult questions. Um, if you're just looking at emissions as kind of a baseline number, then uh, you know nickel is much worse for the planet than copper, right? But we produce over 20 million tons of copper and about 2 million tons of nickel. So the numbers don't really work that way. And there's obviously different decarbonization aspects, right? For nickel production, you want to focus on electricity. For copper, you want to focus on diesel and transportation and, and ore grade. So there's, there's these relative challenges that really don't get captured in the current carbon accounting ecosystem. A lot of these different methods and the, the kind of mess of the chart we showed earlier is 
isn't specific enough to address these, these corporate challenges, these industry-specific challenges. And then when we get to decarbonization, it's a similar issue. Um, you know, if, this is a, a chart showing Chile's relative preparedness for, for solar panels for the copper industry. So they're in the middle of a desert. They're obviously in a very good place to, to implement solar panels. Um, but what does that mean if you're comparing Chilean copper to copper in the DRC or copper in another country? They have very different decarbonization pathways. And without this context, these green product definitions aren't going to make a lot of sense. They're not going to make the progress that we want them to. We shouldn't be comparing apples and oranges. And again, that's, that's what Comet is about. You really need to understand the, the industry. You need to understand the data so that the companies are talking to each other. And then you need to move one step forward and give context to it. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do. OK, so before we move to the panel discussion, I want to go back to why we're doing this. There are main, mainly two cases. I talked about national level GSG disclosures, and I talked about private sector disclosures. So these are the, the two use cases for, for the Comet framework, national and business GSG accounting. Speaking to the national side of the story, um, the problem here is that there aren't really methodologies available for uh, countries as they um, uh, compute their, their national uh, accounts, their, their, their inventory, and, and the NDCs, of course. And that's because uh, the corporate data is unreliable and there is no formal connection. So the idea here is to provide the um, countries with a tool that they can uh, choose to use uh, in order to uh, provide more robust uh, accounting. Yeah, in, in that sense, the, the Comet solution is once you harmonize these, cor these corporate disclosures, you can start using them for these nationally determined contributions, for meeting the Paris Agreement. And this really enables countries and regions to really have a, a more comprehensive picture of what their climate impact is like, how they compare it to other industries in other countries, how these different industries uh, in, or incorporated into their national contributions, whether they're on target or not, whether they should be shifting their different goals. So really, just once again, enabling uh, the different nations to have this data and make these smart decisions. It's We're in the information age, and we need to have better than estimates and better than, than just guessing, especially when we have hundreds of environmental disclosure tools, and every company in the world is trying to prove that they're on target with the Paris Agreement. That should be a conversation they're also having with the country they're located in. All right, and then finally, private uh, disclosures. Um, as I said, at some point, uh, companies are required to report against far too many standards. So the idea is uh, uh, that we will ensure uh, the, the same set of underlying data that can be used across the sectors, uh, so that especially as at the, at the back end of a supply chain, when you have a manufacturer that needs to collect all the data to create an eco-label for a product, it will be very important uh, to have uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the metrics uh, uh, for different materials and fuels that have been used in the production process to have a common basis so that these eco-labels can be uh, constructed. So these are the two uh, use cases of the, of the Comet framework. Uh, just a quick word about the plans. Uh, we have, as, uh, as, as we said in the beginning, formed a partnership with the UNFCCC Secretariat to develop the Comet framework. We have already actually started doing some of the research and, and, and highlighted already the main principles that we are going to work on. Uh, it's going to take us uh, next year and probably the following to go uh, through sectoral guidance uh, documents uh, for specific sectors. Uh, so uh, watch this space, and uh, and now I would like to uh, to have a bit of a discussion uh, here today. We have invited some guests, uh, and uh, and we will have a sort of. Uh, um, discussion because I, I want to, to, to let you see how uh, the other players in the ecosystem uh, think about uh, the, the importance of harmonized carbon accounting and some of the initiatives that we have started putting in place. So I would like to invite on stage uh, uh, our guests uh, and we have some virtual guests as well. Uh, so I will start with our moderator today, John Kreitz. Uh, John is uh, the Chief Program Officer at RMI um, and also my boss. <laughs> So welcome, John. Um, 
And then we have Anna Stanley, who is the manager for uh, the Carbon Accounting Pathfinder at the World Business Council on uh, Sustainable Development. And uh, then we have two virtual guests uh, that I am uh, uh, quite curious to see if we can have online. Uh, I, see, I see some nods uh, from the technical room, so probably we have them. Uh, there you go. Okay, so let me, let me quickly introduce them uh, uh, and, and then I will hand over to John for the discussion. So we have Maria Fujihara, who is uh, the CEO and founder of Sinai Technologies. Hello, Maria. And uh, Martin Brauk here, who is one of our Comet partners uh, uh, from uh, the Columbia Center on uh, Sustainable Investment. Uh, I believe that Maria is calling in from the Bay Area, so it's probably quite early for her. And Martin is in New York City. We, 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 live, uh, we live nearby. Okay, uh, with that said, I will hand over to John, and uh, uh, I look forward to an interesting discussion. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Paolo. Um, so we've laid out here the context and the need for harmonizing all of the different standards, and we'll get a view on some of the practicalities of how exactly we do that through the vantage of, of three or four different partners, depending on who else we pull in here. But maybe starting out with you in the room here, Anna, maybe if you could tell us just a little bit about your institution and how does harmonization of accounting uh, play out in the work that you're currently pursuing? Yeah, um, thank you very much, and thank you very much to uh, RMI for having me here today. Um, as Paolo said, I am uh, representing the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, where we've launched an initiative called the Carbon Transparency Partnership. And our aim really is to build on some of the work that's happening in different industries. Um, you know, the, the great work, for example, in the heart of aid sector by the, the Comet project, um, but also looking kind of into other industries where, the, where there's work that's ongoing in this space to make sure that there's collaboration around harmonization and accountability and to make sure that all the different players that are setting up for example you know you saw the the slide with all the different pathways of, of uh, for, I think it was steel production and kind of what the elements are that have to be harmonized across that and what we're trying to do is try and help set a baseline for kind of the more basic elements that sit behind it that not necessarily have to be dealt with on a sector by sector basis but can kind of be dealt with on a more overarching uh, basis. WBCSD is a co-convener of the Greenhouse Gas Protocol so we have a kind of a history in, uh, in setting some of these standards and so we're building on that to really help these different players connect to each other and um, yeah harmonize the, the kind of the, the baseline before the sector specific work gets, gets going and I think this harmonization aspect is really important to make sure that the different sectors have have, you know, like in comment, for example, have their what they really need in that sector to be able to to have a clear understanding of the emissions and actually then tackle those emissions. Because as Paolo said today, there just isn't emissions transparency. Companies don't actually know what emissions are associated with their products. So it's really important. It's this harmonization issue is critical, and we're gonna we're gonna see that kind of flow through different parts of the conversation here, and we'll return back. But first, let me jump over to Maria. And Maria, you at Sinai are doing uh, some of the cutting edge work, putting this into practice, and some of the data analytics around it. If you could just tell us a little bit about Sinai itself, and also how you think about the harmonization of accounting standards from your perspective. Of course, thank you so much. Um, it's um, so Sinai is a software. We are a decarbonization platform. Um, as Paolo mentioned, we are based here in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, and our system helps companies to actually integrate all this information, not only for themselves, for their own operations, but also throughout the value chain. So um, this, this new partnership and this new um, harmonization framework is so important because like Dave mentioned, um, they are still using LCAs for estimating emissions across the supply chain. Um, and we need to get to product level um, emissions um, using allocation methodologies that are available per sector. So basically what we did um, also in partnership with the RMI um, is to, um, to build a system that help companies to connect through software to exchange data uh, in a much easier way. So we, we build an interface for both buyers and suppliers. 
um, where they can use a suggested allocation framework based on the industry that they are uh, working with um, and, and exchange data in a much more automated way um, that you know, increases efficiency, increases collaboration, um, bring the right information to the surface so they can actually reduce costs um, and produce more precise information, um, for example, for ROI or positive NPV decision-making process. So um, in the future, uh, we, our goal is to actually include, include advanced data sharing security, such as blockchain or specific recommendations with machine learning. But we're just starting. Uh, we're actually launching the system uh, today here at COP26 um, and very excited to, to see how things are going to work out m moving forward. Awesome. It is so important that we get this practical experience. And I'll come back to you, Maria, here in a minute, just to think about some of your initial learnings as you've, as you've built out some of the system. Um, but why don't we shift over here? Uh, and Martin, you at Columbia have a unique perspective, especially on some of the integration issues here. But just if you could tell us a little bit about Columbia and what you're doing there, and in particular, how that fits in overall to this harmonization effort that Comet is leading. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you all. Uh, at Columbia University, we have the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, which is um, uh, an applied research center. And we work with mining companies, uh, especially in um, various projects, including decarbonization projects. And we have been highlighting to governments and companies and civil society that we work with uh, in our day-to-day -day wor day -day work the need for more convergence in in um, in carbon accounting and and also getting this feedback from the stakeholders that we work with that um, this um, whole ecosystem needs more convergence and, and harmonization and I think uh, a lot of what um, Jordi and Paolo have already presented uh, resonates a lot with the uh, stakeholders that we interact with. The need for a, a, an alignment or more alignment between the GAG protocol, ISO standards, European EN standards, other national standards, IPCC ones as well. They need more clear and uh, clear fixed boundaries and attribution principles, guidance on what to measure, but as well on how to measure, how to obtain the primary data that Jordi was talking about earlier and how to choose and use uh, data that's available when measuring is not viable. Having a database with more specific emissions factors to make it easier for companies to, to, to calculate emissions factors that are calculated based on actual up-to-date data from various world regions, not global averages. And ultimately to achieve this methodological alignment across companies for the various private sector disclosures, but also between private and uh, and public disclosures uh, on the national inventory side of things uh, that um, uh, Paolo was was uh, talking to us about. But I, I would just uh, like to, to to maybe finalize with a, a comment um, that is very close to our heart here at, at CCSI because we work a lot with regulation and how um, regulation is important in um, achieving this harmonization. So uh, developing a harmonized accounting framework is, of course, the first step for companies to start to generate these reliable and comparable, comparable emissions. Uh, we need that first to, to, to uh, sort out the uh, ecosystem that's uh, so fragmented, as Paulo has shown in that beautiful slide. Uh, but then the next step is, of course, to guarantee that this framework that Comet is developing to harmonize actually has the uptake that it, that it's needed. And the uptake has to be driven by national and international legal and regulatory frameworks. As we know, mandatory disclosures are starting to pop up here and there, various countries, but they're still in their infancy. And, and the COP, and I don't mean the event here itself, but the Conference of the Parties uh, has a fundamental role to play in, in this regard. We understand that there has to be a mandate from, from the COP uh, driving countries to nationalize, to, to domesticate, so to speak, these um, requirements in a way that's harmonized and comparable so that we can finally reach those accurate, accessible, transparent, comparable, and actionable disclosures for, uh, for better um, accounting and, and uh, climate action, ultimately. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Martin. And I think it is all about action, right? And it's about getting the, the messages in and out that are data-based here to allow people to make decisions. And, and, and I know you've worked quite a bit on Pathfinder and thinking about eco-labels and versus supply chain evolution and how we think about scope three. Could you just comment a little bit about how we get out a signal that is actionable in the end and compare and contrast the different approaches and why Comet is so important in this context? Did we lose? Yep. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah. So I think one of the uh, one of the key things in this space, and I, I and I think you can't emphasize it enough, is collaboration. And I know it's kind of it sounds so so basic a thing to say, but um, I think it's really important that the parties that are working in this space, you know, no matter their sectorial focus, no matter what aspect of the project they're kind of tackling. And I think the the slide that Paolo showed with all the different disclosure entities, um, I think it's really essential that everyone actually talks to each other and tries to figure out what their role is in the game and how they can leverage what they're doing best to bring together this yeah, this really important topic and, and to, to drive it forward. Because I think if we, if we all go off and do our own things, we're going to end up with a you know the same problem but just in a different shape somehow. So to me, that's that's a really key thing. Um, under Comet and the way the WBCSD works, you know, for us having having really really close collaboration, exchanging on ideas, exchanging on the content we're working on, making the connections across different industries or or also different parties. I think that's really part of the. Um, part of it. Um, as you see here today, you know, we're very three different types of people sitting on the panel. And I think that's also the aspect of it, making sure that everyone's represented, making sure that, that startups are represented, SME players, that the academia is represented. And I think what, what was said about engaging um, policymakers and, and regu the regulatory side, I think is also really important. Likewise, disclosure bodies and, and reporting organizations like CDP, so yes, it sounds very simple, but you know, getting that collaboration and space and kind of in place and getting everyone to understand that, that that's actually how you're going to move forward is is sometimes actually quite a lot of hard work, and it's you know what a lot of what I do in my job is is to make sure that these parties are actually talking to each other. Are there any any surprises or or breakthroughs that you've seen in the course of the comet work or the disclosure work that have excited you? I think what I find quite surprising is given that this topic is it's quite a it's quite an academic topic somehow, and I feel like it's becoming much more mainstream. and And it's great to see big organisations, big companies, um, you know, really showing an interest and wanting to make changes and and wanting to have data transparency. So in that sense, I'm really I wouldn't say it's surprised, but I think I'm really encouraged to see how many how many companies are out there that want to create emissions transparency. And and you know, I mean, for a company, it's it's not normal to to want to kind of sh you know shout off the rooftops what you know what their emissions footprint is, for example. It's, it feels uncomfortable. And I'm really, really encouraged to see more and more companies talking about wanting to put real carbon labels based on primary data from the supply chain onto their products, um, from wanting to really drive this scope three emissions transparency. So it's maybe not a surprise, but it's, it's an encouragement, I see. Yeah, no, no. Um, and part of the challenge here is, isn't getting that data, which yes, it seems like an academic exercise, but it's actually really important because the numbers matter. Every tenth of a degree matters right now. And we've got to have the fact base to ultimately make and drive those decisions. And, and Maria, I know you are sharpening your pencil and kind of checking on the numbers here and have done a lot of the data analytics, but what are, from your perspective, you know, what are, what are the big successes we've had so far on the data analytics front? And what are the big needs, right? Where are we, uh, where, what are the big challenges that we still have to figure out here in order to get some really good ledger that starts to help us understand where the emissions are and how to reduce them, right? Awesome, thank you for the question. So I think the the biggest um, benefit or the biggest um, progress we've seen so far um, is actually to be able to compare um, LCA databases with primary data collection. So really um, understand how uh, how this um, this data is different 
and not only for one single product, but for multiple products in multiple industries. So Comet is very focused on the metals and mining sector and, and material sector, hard to abate sectors. But we also have a parallel um, pilot happening in the agriculture sector, and we are looking at the food uh, supply chain. So when when you look at those uh, <laughs> infinite databases with thousands of different numbers, um, and and now we are actually able to compare those estimations with primary data collection, I think that's a huge advancement for research in general, but also for um, helping companies to understand the real value, right? So what, why this is needed and why they should be looking at this. Um, and, and regarding challenge, I think um, it's the scalability. So how do we scale this across, again, more industries and more companies? And I think this is where software and technology can play a very important role and, and participation. So allowing to make these evaluations uh, more affordable or give the support that is needed to smaller companies like Anna mentioned, um, it's really important and is honestly the base of the pyramid, right? So um, we are starting with the top and looking at um, amazing organizations, companies that are leading this way, but we need to scale this to, to all other parts of the world. And I think the only way to do this is with software. I can dive into more details within software if you like, but I think uh, my perspective on, on challenges and, and benefits would be those main two. Scalability is essential, right? In order for us to, to work across industries, to think about, you know, kind of how we work across geographies and make it all together. Certainly software is, is you know, kind of one of the key tools that we have in order to promote that global scalability. Is there is there any one thing that you would wave a magic wand and have, you know, kind of zapped immediately here, Maria, that would make your job easier in terms of creating that scalable platform? I love this question. I, I always ask this question to our customers. If they had a magic wand, what would they point at? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I, I think um, at the end, I think the limitation is in our heads um, more than in technology, to be honest. Um, I think if we are able to convince companies and governments to ad adopt the frameworks and to um, adopt these concepts and, and make you know, the right decisions, I think, I think we, technology will follow easily. Um, and, and, and research will follow easy, right? So if we have the right funds allocated to the right things, um, we can develop anything. So maybe, maybe my magic wand would point it out to, to, to people's heads and minds um, so they can make better decisions. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we need companies that lead, we need customers that signal, we need uh, banks and financial institutions that demand, and we need policymakers that ratchet, right, and keep everything moving in a, in a virtuous cycle here to really raise ambition and delivery against this aspiration. Um, Martin, you know, this, this idea of convergence is hugely important, right? And you sit at a unique place from an academic institution perspective and in helping shepherd and see what's required. How, how do you think we get from 250 down to a more usable, you know, more directed uh, leadership platform here? And what role could Comet play within that? I think the... Um some of the contributions so far pretty much answer your question. We we have we know that the problem is there. We know how to fix it. We have the technology to fix it. We have the knowledge to fix it. We need to gather um, to to convene really all these stakeholders that were just listed to get to this convergence. We can't get to convergence without actually getting people to agree uh, around this concept. So companies are of course fundamental. Um, governments civil society, ac academic institutions, international organizations, international financial organizations, all of them need to, to, to come um, to the table and discuss this uh, pressing issue to actually get to a methodology that, that is harmonized, that is applicable across the board, enforced th through regulation um, that uh, also allows a consistent application throughout the countries. And I think um, that's one of our biggest roles at CCSI, convening, we, we host events, we um, 
try to get these people around the table. And I think that's also one of the uh, uh, the strengths of Comet, also being a multi um, stakeholder and multidisciplinary um, framework. I'm constantly, you know, speaking with with colleagues that have. I'm a lawyer and an economist. I, I don't have that, uh, you know, in-depth expertise in carbon accounting, but I'm working with people who do have that expertise. And this is precisely what we need for, for convergence, a platform like Comet that brings together all these pieces. Awesome, awesome. I, I'm going to call a ringer in from the audience here because Mark, Mark Johnson is over there, and he was on Masamba's team uh, and had a chance to work a little bit here uh, uh, with the UNFCCC. And, and Mark, if you could, just a little bit on the role of technology, and in particular, uh, Maria has talked about the importance of digitalization uh, in order to make this uh, successful transition. But from your perspective, what's really required uh, to, to achieve that scalability in the end that we need? Yeah, certainly. That's a great question, John. Um, and Maria really touched on a number of those points earlier, but I think that one crucial aspect of leveraging technology and specifically software uh, that will enable us to more comprehensively track and trace these emissions through embodied, or excuse me, embodied emissions through industrial supply chains is making sure that there's a certain level of veracity associated with the data points that are being collected. It's one thing to incentivize the individual actors to report on primary data. We also need to know that the data that is being reported is truthful, that it is valid. And there are a number of um, specific type of technological components that we can use, um, particularly you know, distributed ledgers, decentralized identities, verifiable credentials uh, that we can use to uh, provide uh, uh, cryptographic hashes and provide another layer of transparency and veracity associated with the data points that are collected. Yeah, so we've got an emerging opportunity for some of the some of the existing Web two solutions, but also some of the emerging um, areas of blockchain to help solve some of these problems and hopefully create a trusted environment that that flows through supply chains. Um, I do I do want to offer Masamba. I'd love to get you up for one final question, but before that, are there any questions from the audience here for our distinguished panel? Yes. Could I grab the microphone here and we'll, oops, you got it. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think that we share the same goal and the same vision. Uh, my name is Salio from uh, Quebec City in Canada. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, IROKO, uh, uh, I-R-O-K-K-O. And uh, four years ago, we developed the first app that helped people to calculate their carbon footprint and compensate by using the, 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 their phone. So they can plant trees uh, in uh, six countries, Guatemala, Peru, France, and, and Canada. And we are currently working on, on the software uh, dedicated to, to, to companies to help them to calculate their carbon footprint and uh, uh, offer them um, mitigation uh, solutions uh, directly with the, with the software. And we work uh, with uh, the National Institutes for Research and uh, Science, uh, for Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique, I don't know how to say that in English, National Institute for Research and Science of Quebec and the government of, uh, of Quebec uh, on, that, on that project. So I think that there is uh, many things that uh, we, are doing, uh, we are doing similar things and uh, uh, it would be great to, 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 to have a discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. So, so my question to you all would be, Samuel works right now in forestry offsets. What coaching would you give him about the opportunities in supply chain here related to Comet? How soon are those coming? When do you think uh, he'll be ready to, to engage with this team uh, on the standards that you're creating? 
I can take a first pass at that and just say that as Paolo mentioned earlier, you know, we're actively working on a number of guidance documentation in these hard to abate sectors, uh, such as steel, we're looking at aluminum, cement, and others. Um, but we are always open uh, to having conversations, to collaborating with other institutions, with other organizations, uh, to make sure that we're taking all those perspectives into consideration, that we are developing the appropriate solutions that solve unique challenges across all types of industries. Anna? Yeah, and um, from our side, um, as I mentioned, I think if you're looking at all the different industries which are out there and all these supply chains are interconnected across different industries, having a kind of baseline for more harmonized data accounting and also the exchange for data in a very harmonized way is really essential. Um, and it's kind of, you know, the, the first step to then kind of really go into the focus bits of the different industries. So. WBCSD is actually launching a methodology for this harmonization next Tuesday, which is kind of like, you know, we really want that to kind of then serve as a blueprint for different industries. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, the, the, the next point to engage with us on that topic. Awesome. So next Tuesday, everyone, and where is it going to be? It's in the Climate Pledge Theatre. In the Climate Pitch Theatre? At with the w 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock with WBCSD for another round of this conversation. Uh, Maria or Martin, anything else to add that you'd want to chime in with here? And either with respect to Samuel's observation or anything that you'd like to close with. Um, I'll go first, Martin, then, then you go right after me. Well, um, I think this is a great opportunity for us to um, move into the right direction, right, uh, and, and bring technology where is needed and be able to allow this technology to solution to be scale. So I'm very glad to hear this is being done in other parts of the world. And, and I think it, it is a collaboration um, and also allowed to scale to multiple sectors and, and all the products in the world. So we can actually understand what is the intensity associated with producing products and how this information is exchanged among companies from multiple tiers. Um, so I'm very excited to see all these results and to, to be part of this. So um, thank you for the opportunity, and, and I hope to collaborate with many of you. Um, thank you, Maria. Martin. Very briefly, just to say that I think the challenge is clear and the way forward is clear, and we have people in Glasgow. I think my last word has to be, you know, just to call on you to, to help bring others on board. Uh, this initiative, which is advancing, uh, and we would like to, to expedite it, to move forward as fast as we can to address um, the, this pressing need for greater harmonization and for convergence. Thank you very much for, for allowing this. Thank you, Martin and, and Anna. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the one the one thing I'd like to still say is that um, you know I think it's really important to work on scope three in the supply chain. I think it's a, it's it's one of the the big you know carbon is one of the big challenges we have. But I also want to make an appeal to everyone working on this topic to not forget about the other data transparency aspects, which are really important around biodiversity, around water, around social factors. Because I think the the kind of baseline and the the structures we're putting in place and and you know together in these kinds of projects can translate very easily into other areas. So I think it's a really important thing to not just think about our, our silos, but to really connect beyond that as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Martin, Anna, Maria, and, and Mark all for joining us. Masamba, I really want to thank you as well for hosting this discussion today. You're a man of great passion, and it's not often that passionate people get excited about accounting. Um, and we're here in the innovation hub, right? What, what do you see as the role of this type of innovation in helping solve climate? Well, thank you for the question. And if you allow, I would like to come back to some of the great ideas that have been shared by the panelists, starting with Maria. She was saying that the only limitation that we have is our mindset. I think this is really important. So we need to have moonshot thinker. What is happening is generally people are setting objective and target and commitment based on what is perceived as possible. So if your objective is based on what is already possible, you do not provide room for innovation because this is precisely the gap between your objective and what is possible that will drive innovation. 
So this is really a very important aspect. Second aspect is um, the demand for such type of uh, um, accounting system. Uh, I just would like to say that some uh, key stakeholders have already understood the value addition of having a GSG accounting system that is based on primary data. They would like to differentiate their product from the product of others because if you are performing well, you do not want your product to be just put into the group of other products. So we had, um, for example, um, some mayor of cities who came here and would like to work with us to develop a GSG accounting system that will allow us to uh, determine the carbon footprint of the product and services consumed within their cities. And I think this is really a very important point. And this led me to the point that Martin was making. So definitely, regulation is needed. But generally, you start first with something that is adopted on a voluntary basis. So I think we need to just encourage more and more cities, subnational and nationals, to adopt such type of uh, framework, and then you will see regulation uh, following. Finally, DLT is key. I agree with you that uh, this type of GSG accounting system cannot be put in place if you do not have DLT. DLT is a key element to make it uh, operate. So this is why the Global Innovation Hub, particularly when it comes to um, GSG accounting for cities, because we consider that for cities, the only type of GSG accounting that is really relevant is the consumption-based GSG accounting. And this is why we are promoting the development of such a type of uh, um, uh, system that will allow those that are performing and those that are leveraging innovation to be able to claim their um, impact. So I'll stop there. And uh, thank you again for your participation. Thank you for your contribution. And we are looking forward to have um, this collaboration uh, between the different entities within Comet uh, to further develop and uh, hopefully achieve its, um, its objective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masamba. And as Masamba has indicated, this is a collaboration. It's a collaboration of these entities and all of you. If you are interested and want to be in, uh, involved here as we try to move forward toward harmonization uh, and create powerful tools to help measure carbon accounting here going forward, please reach out to UNFCCC, reach out to RMI, reach out to Columbia, reach out to Sinai, reach out to WBCSD and the rest of our partners. Uh, only together are we going to be able to solve climate change. Thanks so much.
Let's start our next session. Again, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all our participants, those that are physically here and those that are following us virtually. So our next session is, I, must, I could say, a continuation of the session that uh, took place just, just before. This is still about consumer-based GSG accounting on supply chain. And uh, to discuss the topic, I have um, three panelists. Martin Weinstein, Executive Director, OEF. Uh, Catherine Atkin, Director, Stanford Codex Climate Data Policy Initiative. And uh, Anna Stanley. Um, I guess the difference between the session before and this session is that the session before was focusing more on carbon footprinting and uh, why it is um, needed. And this session will focus more on um, how actually to measure carbon footprint along supply chain. So our first speaker will be Martin Weinstein, Executive Director of OEF. Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Masamba. Such a pleasure to join uh, everyone. It's been an exciting uh, panel already, so hopefully we could do a, a good job at continuing that, that dialogue um, and sharing a bit some of the uh, projects that have been already on the ground that can nurture a lot of that, that discussion. Um, I, I'm under the understanding that we would be able to show a video from uh, British Columbia uh, on a specific pilot that we got to um, do with them and actively uh, are on, it's actively in, in development. Um, just as um, um, for way of, of context and introduction, the, the Open Earth Foundation is a, is a nonprofit organization based in California. We work on user systems thinking to tackle planetary scale solutions for environmental challenges. And we do that by um, realizing the important role that digital transformation has, but even a more important role that collaboration has in creating open digital infrastructure. Inspired in many ways by the role that the internet has to create global interoperability in our economic system, we see a very important analogy with the uh, vision of an integrated climate accounting um, system. And the project that we've been, um, uh, we've been doing research on, on a vision for how to align subnational and non-state actors with the UNFCCC process in a way that we create dynamic synergy be w between what everyone does and the broader goal that's laid out by the Paris Agreement, uh, that took us, that journey took us into a, a very good um, connection with the province of British Columbia, who is particularly interested in, in, in the role and they've been pioneering um, the use of these distributed ledger technologies, particularly as they apply to decentralized identifiers and how can they be used to create digital trust between the seller of a product, a buyer of a product, and a network that involves public sector, private, uh, private sector investors, and uh, different actors across the supply chain. Um, I think that it would be great at some point that uh, maybe uh, Nathan, um, who's also here online, can introduce the, the video. I'll, I'll just wrap up the, the, the context before uh, passing it over to, to him. Um, what we thought was particularly important is if, if we look at um, the interest in distributed ledger technology such as blockchain in the process of climate accounting, because the core value proposition is to avoid double counting, the context of blockchains is to be able to have a common trusted record. Um, often those implementations do not look at the intersection between public and private sector. So um, in, the, in, in some sense, the vision of the evolution of how a subnational actor can issue a credential, a very simple credential that we receive from our subnational actors is our driver's license. How do we establish a relationship that we kind of solve one of the most important dichotomies that we have in the, in the climate space, particularly for the private sector, to convey transparency alongside privacy. And uh, often that is now possible thanks to new innovations in cryptography and mathematics called zero knowledge proof. 
uh, where someone that can query uh, a data set that belongs to an actor can get and trust the response without having access to the core data set. So why is this? This is kind of like convoluted in how I'm describing it, but what this means is that if your private sector uh, actor has a whole bunch of data set of transactions, but they don't want to share it because that is very relevant to their uh, business um, competitive advantage, we still require government to have an important um, clarity on the emission intensity, for example, of that actor. And things that, that hopefully Catherine also can allude to, who has uh, also been working in that, in that policy space. Um, so that was, that was really key for us to be able to work with the ideal pilot that we could, where we could test that. And furthermore, what we find very important is to move from uh, strictly climate data to data assets. A data asset being a distinct object that can be moved around and that can also be used to convey um, information. Uh, and if when it pertains to a product or a supply chain, that data asset can be queried by the buyer. And as I said before, if it belongs to a company, uh, that can roll up to information that is relevant to the investor as it pertains to ESG. But this is where our crossroad came uh, to a very exciting point, whereas we were particularly, we are particularly uh, focused on how do we get non-state actor data to roll up to inventories so that we can track that the actions of the private sector, the subnational sector, actually end up in inventories showing the progress towards NDCs. So our logic is to look at spatial jurisdictions and geotagging, as in like giving that data asset a spatial property. So as it moves along between a supply chain or between a seller, uh, an exporting country to a to an importing country, that can be traced, irrespective of the rules of how we're going to um, account it or reconcile it. Of course, the benefits for consumption-based accounting, hopefully those were already addressed and, and, and this is something that we we're particularly interested in. So uh, we've had the privilege to be able to work with the, with the, with the BC government um, in and perhaps uh, outlining and illustrating how structuring that, um, that digital infrastructure from the private sector actually eventually, our thesis goes, could help rapidly create uh, climate inventories to the subnational uh, sector, which furthermore would help the national inventory. Um, so that's, that's, that's where we came um, uh, with, a, with a very uh, key interest and uh, Maybe that's, that's good enough to pass it on to, to Nathan to introduce uh, the, the narrative from, from his angle on the subnational side, and maybe that's a great way to then um, go into um, a video to, to show everyone. Over to you, uh, Nathan. You have the floor, Matt. Um, good to see you again, um, Masamba and Anna and, and Catherine. Um, I'm Nate Eamon Blake from the province of BC, Assistant Deputy Minister in Energy and Mines and Low Carbon Innovation, and really excited to be uh, pioneering this, this work with, with Martin and other partners to really understand how we can have confidence in our data, how we can utilize our regulatory data, because in BC we actually have, uh, under our regulations, some reporting requirements for scope one, scope two, third party verification, that sort of thing. So what we're looking at and exploring is how do we then uh, provide confidence into a, a more global system? Um, and it's uh, it's piloting work right now, but we're, we're making a lot of progress and pretty excited to show you. So maybe with that, I'll just, I'll let the video speak for itself. Hi. I'm Bruce Ralston, Minister of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation for British Columbia, Canada's westernmost province. Here in British Columbia, we're blessed with abundant natural resources, including gold and copper deposits throughout. BC is well positioned for the transition to a low carbon economy as we maintain our high environmental, social and governance standards. Our mining sector has some of the cleanest operations in the world due in part to our province's clean, renewable hydroelectricity and the high level of industry innovation. This industry remains the largest private sector employer of Indigenous peoples in Canada, providing economic opportunities for rural and remote communities 
while advancing reconciliation. BC's mining sector provides the responsibly sourced minerals and metals needed for the growth of emerging technologies such as electric cars, wind turbines, and the transit systems the world will need to fight climate change. We're a critical part of the global supply chain and we're constantly improving on our world-leading ESG standards. That's why we're working to create a system in which our BC mines can easily share their emissions data with investors and buyers. This will provide BC mines and exploration companies with a significant advantage in terms of branding our metals and minerals to global ESG investors. I'm pleased to share with you the work we have done here in British Columbia on the Mines Digital Trust ecosystem. My name is Nate Eamon Blake and I'm an Assistant Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Energy Mines Low Carbon Innovation in the province of BC, Canada. I'm excited to be introducing this interoperability demonstration of BC's Mines Digital Trust ecosystem. In this demonstration, we are showcasing one particular use case that will be of interest to the COP26 audience, namely, how, with a few mouse clicks and keystrokes, a government-issued operating permit and carbon emissions data from a mine on the Pacific coast of Canada can scale into the global carbon accounting platform being pioneered by the Open Earth Foundation through the use of open source technology called Hyperledger Ares. We've chosen this technology as the means for information sharing because it's highly transparent, it's secure, tamper-proof and immutable. In BC, we have strong climate legislation. BC implemented North America's first carbon tax, and we've committed to 40% reduction of 2007 GHG emissions by 2030. BC is the first province in Canada to set GHG emission reduction targets and mandatory reporting for major sectors of the provincial economy, which has resulted in government-held data about the emissions performance of our industries. In the following demonstration, you'll first see the province making a secure connection with the IB IBM Digital Wallet of Copper Mountain Mine, located in Princeton, BC. This will follow with the issuance of a permit and GHG emissions data. This includes carbon intensity, scope 1 and scope 2 data. This is the start of the supply chain tracing journey. The information can be amended, say if a permit is revoked or invalidated, but a transaction history will always remain in the system, thus validating the origin of the data. In this demo, the Government of British Columbia will issue an emissions profile credential from their digital wallet, on the left, to Copper Mountain Mine's wallet, on the right. First, Copper Mountain Mine and the Government of British Columbia need to make a secure connection between their digital wallets. Copper Mountain Mine then asks the Government of British Columbia to issue them the 2020 emissions profile credential for their facility. The Government of BC sees that the 2020 emissions profile credential is being asked for and they are ready to issue it. On the Secure Connections page, they click on Copper Mountain Mine. They start the credential issuing process and select the credential to be issued. Upon clicking Submit, the data contents are checked for errors and the emissions profile credential is issued to Copper Mountain Mine. Copper Mountain Mine sees the notification, clicks on the credential to review its details, then accepts it. It now shows this new credential in their wallet. At any time now, they can click on it to inspect the details and add a label for it. With this credential, Copper Mountain Mine now has the ability to provide proof upon request to its other secure connections. The next step is the linkage between Copper Mountain Mine's IBM digital wallet and the Open Earth Integrated Carbon Data Accounting System, which is called Open Climate. Because of the tamper-proof cryptography of the credential, Open Earth does not need to check back with the government of BC about the trustworthiness of the information. This screen shows the login process. The Open Climate Portal is asking the authorized representative of Copper Mountain Mine to provide their login credential. It's being done using a QR code. Because it's using the same digital trust network and the BC government is a trust provider, the user from Copper Mountain Mine can scan the credential and log into the Open Climate system. Copper Mountain Mine presents a proof showing that the BC government has issued them an emissions profile. Upon logging in, the system will detect the information that comes with the Copper Mountain Mine's credential, namely, the GHG emissions report, where the mine is registered and from which facility it comes from. The Copper Mountain Mine user is asked by the Open Climate System to confirm the import of the climate credentials. 
The Copper Mountain Mine user gets to decide whether their data can be stored, used, and disclosed in OpenEarth's platform. Once the Copper Mountain Mine user has confirmed they want to import their data into the OpenEarth network, they are taken to the Open Climate Portal launch page. From there, they can go to the Copper Mountain Mine profile, which shows the specific mine for which they have submitted information and the emissions credential itself. The Open Climate System allows users to understand how the actions they take to reduce emissions have an impact on a regional, national, and global level. This screen shows Copper Mountain Mine's emissions inventory in map view. This screen shows Copper Mountain Mine's emissions inventory, as well as illustrative trades and transfers, and how these scale up to a global emissions calculation. In the credential box, on the bottom right of the screen, you'll see the emissions credentials issued by the government of BC, which have been transferred via Copper Mountain Mine's IBM digital wallet, and are now nested into a regional, national, and global carbon accounting system. What makes the Mines Digital Trust ecosystem unique is our commitment to interoperability, traceability, and open source technology. In essence, we see this digital ecosystem as a public good. The technology will enable our business community, auditors, third-party verifiers to leverage government-held regulatory data and contribute credentials to meet the global market's demand for transparency and trust. In the coming year, we will continue to advance the interoperability of the Mines Digital Trust so companies can choose whichever wallet solution they wish and still be able to participate in the Digital Trust ecosystem. At the other end, consumers and investors can determine what credentials are important and who they trust to issue them. And finally, we're excited to continue to contribute to the ambitious work of the Open Earth Foundation and the UN Global Innovation Hub in exploring how to understand and transparently track the carbon footprint of our consumer products, company commitments, and jurisdictional reporting. Please join us on that journey. So thank you, Nachanel. So um, I'm always very pleased to, to look at this um, um, video. It's um, well done, and the, the content is um, extremely inspiring. So looking forward to have many cities and uh, um, many jurisdictions um, following this um, approach and being interested in leveraging technology to have more transparency on carbon footprint of product and services. So I would like to uh, actually um, direct to you one question. We had a discussion just before the session before, and uh, one of the questions was, why don't we push to have a regulation in place that would, um, let's say, require to all industries to uh, measure and track the carbon footprint of their product and services. My understanding is that for the time yeah, being, what you are um, trying to put in place would be voluntary. And, um, but what can be the value addition? So yes, if I'm a company, hours. private sector, what is the value addition for me to have the carbon footprint of my product measure and, and my product label? with this carbon footprint. Thanks, Masamba. Maybe I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. Um, the first being, in British Columbia, it is, it is actually a requirement. So under law, uh, these large emission emitters, uh, like mines and, and other industrial emitters, have to uh, report to us. So in, in one way, um, uh, that that's already done, and that's why we can pilot this information and in, in this technology. Uh, but the broader question, I think, is a really good one, and, and, and probably the more important one, which is actually it is in in all of our interests. Um, and I think that's that's to the miners, to the end users along the supply chain. There is a desire, I think, by by customers and consumers to be lowering their own carbon footprint and to know their choices, to know the effects of their choices. And to the extent we can actually enable that decision in an informed way and allow uh, customers to actually be choosing lower carbon footprint, I think that will actually have a, a material effect on their decisions. 
uh, and then upstream, uh, those who can produce those commodities with the lowest carbon footprint will actually have an advantage. So, so I, I believe there is a voluntary or a, a self-interest that will drive this. Uh, but at root, where we're piloting this is also a requirement by law. Excellent. So it shows that, that you, you are really in advance compared to um, many other um, place because now the discussion is whether such type of thing should be regulatory or vo voluntary. And in British Columbia, it's already in re regulatory, which is really a great move. So I, I will actually, if, if I could also add... Yes, go the ahead. Disclosure, the disclosure is actually voluntary. So in this case, Copper Mountain is choosing to disclose all the information. So the reporting is by law to government. The disclosure, and this is where Martin was pointing out, the public and private uh, trust and that issue. Um, so that's the interesting part, is this kind of pilot um, requires a company to, to be... Uh, voluntarily disclosing of the information that's held by government. So it is an interesting area, um, but I, I just wanted to point out they don't have to be doing that. This is a voluntary, that the disclosure part is voluntary. Well, thank you very much. Now I would like to move to uh, Catherine Atkin. So you have seen this video twice. You have also um, heard what Martin said and the discussion that took place the session before. Yeah. Um, what um, is your view about that? So particularly this debate, um, we need to put in place the policies that will actually uh, push people to do it or how do we, or whether we should provide some alternative incentives that would make it um, that would make it attractive to, to people to, to implement it or maybe awareness raising, raising for people to realize that um, this is their interest mm -hmm. to, to do it. How do we combine the different policy levels so that um, it takes place? Well, that is a great question. Thank you, Masamba. And I just want to say that the conversation that happened in the last hour was a focus on sector-based GHG accounting. And I know we're going to be talking about consumption-based accounting and how that is a paradigm shift of importance to the Innovation Hub. But either way, the fact of the matter is that we, needed, we need to know what is the embedded carbon in our products and our services. And so, you know, I'm of the opinion that we do need to push. Uh, it's clear we do need some better alignment of standards. And I, my question is whether politics and policy can force that to happen. Because I think we are moving slowly towards more alignment. I come from the state of California and we see ourselves as, you know, leaders on the environment. And I'd like to say that with the uh, being the fifth largest economy in the world, the number of corporations that are actually doing uh, what we have, I'm sorry, your name again. Nate, Nate what, what Nate is doing, if we waited for those folks to make the difference, uh, I think we'd be waiting too long. So I think we need some carrots and some sticks. So I think those that are uh, you know, being transparent and accountable for their footprint, we should figure out ways to um, highlight them, to show that uh, consumers should make decisions uh, to use their products and services. But I also feel like Nate and companies like Nate's are at a disadvantage because in some ways they're putting themselves out there and being transparent. Other folks are saying, I'm, we're, you know, we're great. And yet, underneath that, the standards that they may be using uh, may not be um, as stringent. So I think we do need a standard, and we need to start saying that's the standard you need to go to. So I'm, I, I think we need a little of both. And I, I think there's an important point there. Nate, coming from government, um, gets to do a pilot to show to the private sector how if, if they decide to do a more regulatory, like more stringent rather than voluntary, how that would work. And this is something that I think we've talked about in the past, Catherine. Mm -hmm. that to me, it's very relevant why these initiatives are, are key. That often, and I would love both of you, Nate and, and you, Catherine, are involved with policy 
Nate, you roll out policy and, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and are part of it directly, but, but you're also sort of researching yep. it and, and, and figuring out where it needs to be implied, that we often think about policy and rules based on, on the theoretics of it, mm -hmm. but we don't try it with the private sector before deciding upon it. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a problem and we need to be able to change that problem. Because often we go in and, and negotiate a policy, we put out a policy and get resistance from the private sector, say everyone has to uh, uh, pay a, a carbon tax, but exactly how it rolls out, the efficiency in the process, or what we are gonna expect probably inevitably uh, in the United States and then in other jurisdictions um, is that if you are a company over X amount of revenue, you're gonna have to disclose your, your carbon. If you've made a pledge, we're gonna ask you to do accountability around that. Um, if, if that's a policy, uh, the knee-jerk reaction of, of private sector is no, I don't want to, <laughs> right? But because it, it could be feel like a lot of work to do that, filling forms and reporting and bureaucracy, where what we just saw is, is a very automated process where the private sector can preserve privacy. So I think that we're in the frontier mm -hmm. of, of responsibly launching these pilots to show to those that have to decide the policy and how they interface with those that have to abide by the policy of what is possible uh, yeah. uh, rather than we'll put the policy and then we'll figure out how to implement it. Yeah. Just can I add to that? I, mean, I totally agree with you. I also think though government isn't aware and we see it here every day of how far technology has come. And I do think that I mean, we've got large um, Fortune 500 companies now all investing in GHG accounting. I mean, they are buying firms up life to, life, you know, left and right. Salesforce has a whole, you know, a whole solution. So I think we're, we've hit the tipping point where basic carbon accounting is really not that difficult and it can be automated. I do, ad, you know, I do admit in the, in the scope three, in certain sectors, we still have some work to do. Um, but I think that we um, are much closer to being able to make that, as you said, easy to do, um, not that expensive, and with the use of blockchain, we're protecting privacy and creating a, you know, open source accountability for information, so. Maybe I would like here to uh, add one aspect and ask Nate to, to confirm whether this is how they would like to um, move forward. Generally, policymakers uh, are facing a challenge because there are three elements that are important and that they need to take into account. The first is what is needed. And the second is what is feasible. Mm -hmm. And the third is what is acceptable. So as policymakers, they need to do the right thing. They need to do what is needed. And I think it should be their starting point. We have to do this. Mm -hmm. But then um, they would like, once they have decided to roll it out, they would like to have it feasible and they would like also to ensure that it is acceptable mm -hmm. by those that um, uh, need to implement. And this is where I think this type of uh, project pilot testing, where you dem demonstrate feasibility first, and then you engage with the potential user to ensure that it can be accepted is very important. And, and, and I think this is why I was thinking about a first phase where it is voluntary and people will use it and see that this is something feasible and this is something that does not provide a lot of burden. And then the next step being to make it mandatory, use regulation. Is it the approach that you, you are taking, Nate, to put in place such type of climate um, policies and, and, and regulation? Samba for the, the question. Uh, it, it's an interesting one, and, and as I said, in terms of the, the standards in BC and the requirements, those are law passed by the legislature, and so the, the reporting and the targets, um, that is, is, those are the rules. What we've added on, and I think is the fascinating part of the subject of this discussion, is, is showing how and trying to pilot and demonstrate how not only are those the rules, but there's an advantage to that. Mm -hmm. And that is the voluntary part that we're trying to demonstrate. And, and I will be, be frank, there's a lot of interest um, 
obviously Copper Mountain, one mine put up their hand to actually try this out with us. Um, but just by showing that it's possible and being at a, a venue like this and, and having interest, uh, that actually builds momentum. I think the, the voluntary nature and the interest of saying, hey, if we have to do this anyway, uh, why don't we actually be transparent and get credit for it because we're actually doing good and interesting things? I think that will get a lot of momentum. Um, I think internationally and in terms of the standards, those do have to be uh, codified and, and brought together. And I think, uh, Catherine, you, you were saying, in terms of what do you count, scope one, scope two, scope three, we do have to have a common understanding of those things. So that is where it does become, you need a, a rule book of some way, but that wouldn't be invented by BC. We will have to, that's an international system. Um, so I, I think that gets at your point. I think it is a both, it, it's a combination of things that, that are mandatory, but then I think there's a lot that can be uh, pushed along by showing the art of the possible. And I think the open earth, open, open climate, system where you could actually see how it all comes together, I think there will be an advantage to being part of that system. Um, uh, can I follow up also on that one? So I, I understand that products that are developed within British Columbia have this mandatory reporting system. Can we expect in the future to have a situation where even products that are coming into British Columbia would need also to disclose or to, to, to give information about their carbon content? Uh, I'll say that's, that's beyond my, um, <laughs> my ability to predict. Uh, we in the, the province of BC just launched our, our Clean BC Roadmap uh, just last week in terms of all of the, the various actions and plans we intend to, to, to take. Um, it's quite ambitious, but it's got, you know, a roadmap out to 2030. And, and so all the different things that we'll have to put in place to, to get there, um, I, I, can't, I can't really predict if, if that one uh, would be a, a role for a jurisdiction to take or whether it would be more the... Uh, the consumer demand that would drive that. I, I, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to offer a guess on that. I think that is a that is a great point because. Um, I mean, I think what you're what you're asking, Masamba, is, are you willing to adjust your inventory based on the products that are coming into your region? Um, and there is a role of consumers. Uh, it could be, if if it's a decision of the consumers. Does that imply that um, the jurisdiction has to follow through it? Uh, and where does that line, uh, where we draw that line? This is elegantly explaining some of the broad dynamics that we're dealing with um, uh, broadly at this COP. Um, and I, I think that um, there, there's, there's two things that I, that I, that I, I think I want to point out there. One is, as, in, in the old adage, as above, so below, as we're thinking about Article 6, as we're talking about transparency frameworks, as we're thinking about these mechanisms, it applies equally whether we're dealing about countries or we're dealing about subnational jurisdictions or a city. Um, and so it's very important for us to be able to innovate at that um, city and small jurisdiction level because there's a lot of information that can roll up to the, the broad level negotiation. Now, the second thing I wanted to point out is if you go to any restaurant uh, or, or food place here at COP, you will see that every product has a disclosure of the content that it has. And this is a bit of what we're talking about here. We sat down the other day and it really, for the first time, decided what we're going to eat because, the inf because of the information that was provided to us. And then you realize, well, if it has dairy, it's going to have a lot of carbon content. But when you go to the supermarket to buy something, um, you might not know that. So we are adjusting our behavior just by the virtues of that disclosure. We have to trust the calculation happens. Um, but we were uh, doing the thought experiment that if you get a badge in a future cop, you get a, a budget of carbon. And every time you consume something, you consume out of that budget. So if suddenly you have a budget for the day, you might have to get a salad, or you might have to pay to increase your budget. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Or buy somebody else's budget. That 
I think ahead. that's really provocative. And I, I mean, we've talked about this, you know, it should be like calorie counting on a restaurant menu, right? That, that's where we do need to go. And I think just a little bit on this um, consumption-based accounting and looking at the innovation hub and the need to actually empower citizens. I mean, the reason why consumption-based accounting, you know, according to many major institutions like the C40 is actually a better measure of your carbon footprint. It also allows us to look at the carbon footprint as it rolls up in a geography, which has a lot of actionable qualities to it. When you do a sector-based approach, when, you know, that's good too. But when you, when you start looking at your scope three, you're everywhere, right? Whereas when you're doing a consumption-based accounting approach, you're rolling up consumption of your citizens, and that may include uh, carbon consumption outside of the jurisdiction. But that, to me, is a, is a powerful frame, and I think really do, starts to align a lot, of, a lot of these things, right? If Then if you have your carbon wallet and you know what that embedded carbon is, we start to create some synergies. I did want to just reference uh, the uh, incredible president from Green Inclusive, who is featured on another panel. And I have to say, when you look at what they're doing in China, I was just that we learned a lot from them. They are creating a consumption-based accounting wallet that they are then able to roll up to the city level. They use the mobile app, um, all the mobile apps on the phone. And so they're making it also easy enough because that's the big issue. If you ask me to have a carbon accounting for my transportation and another one for my eating out, like nobody wants to do that anymore. And I learned the hard way working as an entrepreneur on a mobile uh, carbon counting approach and you just has to be seamless. So I like the synergies of these things as well to, to your point. And that also relates to the, the analogy with the financial side, like submitting your taxes every year is an onerous process, right. but the more that our financial data is integrated into our banking systems and our expenses and we're able to in ingest all of that and put in the right format, um, if we have a carbon turbo tax, then it, it makes things a lot easier. Uh, and it's also led, interesting in the private sector, to when how fast we can do reporting. Yes, there's a different reasons why we, we focus so much at a quarterly level and, and, and that relate more to short-termism, but we're able to do financial reporting at, 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 the, at the quarterly level because we have that data at hand. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require that you have to turn the company upside down every quarter to, right. to put your, your quarterlies, right? So it, it's, it's, it's also that level of data um, tangibility and insight from it that allows you to have that sort of like traction. So we, we got to really do the same thing in carbon. So, um, any last word from you, Ned? I'm very happy to be part of the conversation and looking forward to seeing how we can take w what we've demonstrated here, which was the very start of a uh, you know, supply chain or commodities journey, and how do we actually track it and add the carbon footprint along that supply chain. So that goes well beyond the borders of BC, which is why it's so critical that we're, we're making these linkages. Uh, so talking to a lot of different innovators around this conference and, and elsewhere about you, how do we use the same standards and then actually add in so you get a, a proper footprint along the journey. So plenty of work to do, but really excited by the feedback to date. Thank you, Ned. Any last word, Katrin? Go ahead. Um, just to bring out the concept of uh, corresponding adjustments, um, that it, re it, it, it implies that something reconciles between where it leaves and where it receives. Now, that might seem onerous, but it is where the role of technology needs to tell us that it's possible and can be done in a frictionless way. And while we can think about corresponding adjustments at a macro level, um, we can also see that it applies at the individual level. Um, and that the, the difference between the policies at each jurisdiction could actually produce a, a sort of a, a mismatch where the one jurisdiction is, is fine receiving the carbon of its consumption um, and its production, but it interacts with, the, with one that doesn't. The important thing there will be to bring transparency to that, mm -hmm. right? To say, hey, which are the jurisdictions that are part of that my uh, digital trust and um, accounting network 
because that also will produce the level of incentives to say, hey, I'm willing to pay for a premium for your low carbon product content because I'll, I'll take responsibility for it. So I'd rather, I, I'd, I'd rather get it from you. And that's a very interesting thing from a competitive standpoint at the international level, um, uh, but also at the provincial level. So I'm, 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 I think this is very exciting and, and more and more, I think that as this progresses, the more we'll see that it can influence some of the key uh, topics that are discussed um, at COP. Thank you, Martin. Catherine? Yeah, just um, I think there is so much to do, and I think the innovation hub frame around needs just aligns perfectly with this, right? Which is if we're thinking about housing and clothing and nutrition, those are all the things that we need and deserve to have. And so I do think one of the things that'll be important is that we're not saying people shouldn't have those things, but we think they should have better alternatives, low, co you know, low carbon and no carbon alternatives. And we have not created a marketplace, the private sector and government to allow consumers to want to have the information, but also the alternatives and options. And so I look forward to building that into this process so we can start to show um, all the possibility that, that exists. So thank you to all our panelists. It was very inspiring. Um, now, uh, with that, with this, with your last word, we can close this uh, session. I will, in I will invite you to provide them a round of applause.
So let's move to our, our next session. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our physical participant and our virtual participant. My name is Masamba Choi. I'm the executive of the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. The Global Innovation Hub has two aspects. One aspect is what is going on currently, which is a pavilion that will take place at uh, each COP. Actually, this is the first time that it is taking place. So the purpose here is really to bring together all the relevant stakeholders that can make the use of innovation for climate action more effective and make them uh, co-innovate, make them um, collaborate, but um, radical collaboration. The other component, the second component, is a digital hub that is facilitating the matchmaking between demand for climate solution and sustainability solution coming from ambitious target and then solution on the ground. So what makes really specific this global innovation hub is the vision that is behind. We consider that Innovation is not used in an effective manner for climate for several reasons. The first is that most of the time, ambition and target and objective are not based on what is needed, but they are rather based on what is perceived as possible. And because they are based on what is already possible, they do not provide room for, for innovation. So what we are promoting is ambitious target, ambitious commitment, and then the gap between the commitment, target, objective, and what is currently possible is precisely what innovation will be feeling, that gap. So the second thing is that um, innovation is very focused at the sector level. And the main objective is to reduce the carbon footprint of existing product and services. So this narrow down the applicability uh, of innovation to climate because many innovative ideas cannot be captured if, if, you, fo if you focus only on, um, on sector. So to address this issue, what the Innovation Hub is, is doing is to go back to the core need, the core need of nutrition, health, shelter, um, leisure, clothing, access, and ask the question, how do we satisfy this core need with supply chain and value chain that are aligned with the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree goal, and hence resilience, but also that provide to people flourishing life. So here, really, it is about mainstreaming innovation for climate within innovation for um, sustainability, focusing on people. That's a very important uh, aspect. The, the second thing is that when you say innovation, most of us will consider technology innovation. Techno technology innovation alone will not address the climate crisis. We need to have innovative technology, but also innovative policy instrument, innovative financial instrument, innovative business model, innovative leadership, innovative governance, innovative way to collaborate, and social innovation also. All these things need to be integrated to form a cluster that can provide the right response to demand for climate um, solution. So um, this is the beginning of a movement. We hope to have many of you joining this journey because we really would like to have it inclusive and have within the UNFCCC Innovation Hub as many perspectives as possible. So with this, I will hand over the floor to uh, our facilitator, um, Tim Damon.
thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you very much to the Innovation Hub for opening up to us on the Youth and Public Empowerment Day so that we can take this very important look at how young people will contribute and are contributing to innovation. And definitely echoing this view of addressing what is needed, not what we think is possible. And I think we see that demand coming very clearly from the young people who are making strikes and demanding us to do what is needed. And the question then becomes, how do we get there? And all those elements that you've just mentioned of beyond technology, of the finance and the policy innovation, we see that young people are the innovators bringing those to the table, but they are also facing many barriers in terms of how they are able to carry forward that innovation, get it recognized, scaled, integrated. You know, financial innov innovation is going to be very key for that. And you know, one of the proposals that young people are really pushing for out of this is this notion of a, a marketplace that would be able to support youth-led and well, everyone's <laughs> projects for the Action for Climate Empowerment Agenda, all six elements of that, also for capacity building. So this would be a way to integrate more people together, get more collaboration around these projects, mobilize the necessary finance, link up those who can provide it with those who can. And we know, again, in this sense of what is feasible or not, finance is always being seen as that limiting factor on what is possible. And since that's largely been tied up in public finance, having a marketplace that is geared toward harnessing private sector and other sources of finance is going to help us to get around that. There's really no excuse for, for parties to object <laughs> to creating this marketplace here as part of the, the ACE decision, which is right now, uh, we hear maybe by 6 o'clock they might actually uh, convene for a decision on that text. We'll have to see. So keep out for that. It would be nice if at the reception later on we would be able to celebrate a strong decision. <laughs> we, we will see. Fingers crossed for that. But we also have today a lot of very exciting panelists who are all in their own ways contributing to youth-led climate action and innovation across these different areas of technology, music, finance, policy, and governance. So I'm very happy to be moderating today and to hand over to our first panelist who will be Eric. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for the opening remarks. Uh, I don't think anyone needs to be convinced that innovation is important and helpful. So uh, I'm going to skip that part. Uh, I, I feel like innovation has brought us from, you know, before we were able to even use cars, to using cars, to using sustainable cars, hopefully, eventually, and, you know, decarbonizing electricity, innovating in finance, innovating in blah, 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 everywhere. Um, one thing that was actually kind of skipped is education. We've been doing education the same way for way too long. Like I studied at the University of Cambridge and the buildings are still the same and the teaching styles are still the same. They were hundreds of years ago. Uh, and, and you know, I love the people there. I made a lot of good friends and, and spent, spent a lot of time with them now. It's great people, but the education is like, you know, sure, interesting stuff, smart people, smart teachers, but yeah, it's, not, it's a bit outdated. Um, so I, I'm Eric, I'm co-founder and CEO at Climate Science. Uh, you can find us at climatescience.org. Uh, we try to innovate on uh, climate education. We provide uh, resources, everything from children's books to courses, the Olympiad, which by the way, if any one of you are still here uh, on the 9th uh, at 6 p.m., we have the finals and the announcement of the winners over in the green zone in the cinema auditorium, where 12,000 people participated this year uh, to propose their own solutions to climate change for a global scale, not just, you know, use fewer plastic bags, but you know, how do we fix the big scale problem? Uh, and, and I can say that we have a bunch of uh, really, really cool finalists. They're aged, aged from, from 14 to 18, uh, beat all the 25 year olds actually, uh, without age normalization, it's cr quite crazy. So, so young people, you know, young people have the, the, the capacity to innovate and, and I actually want to use that, that single learning we made from the Olympiad that the, the 14 year olds and the 17 year olds often beat the 25 year olds so that the longer you spend in that uninnovative education system, the less innovative you become. You just keep writing those proposals that sound like the proposal from next year, like from last year. Like every single cop, this is my only, this is only my second cop, and it's already getting boring to hear, like, you know, let's start moving. It's like, how many cops? Like, like, is there anyone here who's been at many cops? Like, how, how many cops have we said, let's start doing blah, let's start this movement, let's start this? Blah. Is that like every, is, is that always the same thing? Is it really that? It like, doesn't sound very innovative, right? Um, I, I feel like it would be great if we continued something for once rather than starting a new thing every time. But uh, sorry, just, just to complete my, complete my point, uh, 
I feel like we changed the education system, and, and not necessarily just uh, by, by, by really you know, removing universities or anything crazy like that, but we just adapt how we convey information from this linear, you know, here you go as a standardized three-year curriculum, get your undergrad, and then you get a job system. If we move towards uh, learn more curiously, solve problems, not here is the standard stuff you need to know, but solve problems and learn that way. I feel we'd be finding a lot more innovation and we'd be finding a lot more progress on problems such as climate change. That's not a thing that you know you see like the impact of next year necessarily, but if we did that 30 years ago, we would see the impact now. And I feel it's better to start now than to start in 30 years. Yes, we definitely need to start now. And thank you for really helping us to see how the educational system needs to catch up and transform. I will take a moment to add on to that on behalf of some of the delegates. And I also, I was excited to introduce, so I didn't introduce myself earlier. <laughs> I'm Timothy Damon. I am founder and president of the Global Youth Development Institute. And we have an amazing international youth delegation from more than 10 countries who are here. Some of them are, you may also hear from later on from the audience. And some of them are also, the youngest are 16 and 17 years old. And so they are skipping school. They're skipping out from that, that educational system that's not working for them to be here at the COP. And so we really need, as part of that innovation, on their behalf of the, really the youngest climate activists, to think about how do we reconcile school and that whole tradition of obligations and structures and you're supposed to buy into this and the theory is you know oh if you just do this you do your 12 years of school then you go to university then everything will be fine only that system is not leading to a future where everything is fine right so we need to think about how to make sure that this climate change activism and action becomes compatible with education and that these are not at odds and only increasing the climate anxiety that these young people are being crushed under so having added uh, on behalf of their voices, they're at the strike, otherwise we might have been able to, to have them join us. But <laughs> So next, moving then from education innovation to finance innovation and related areas, we have Juliet, who is going to be able to speak to us about the Global Youth Climate Action Fund and some of your related work. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really don't know how to compete with Eric's introduction, <laughs> but uh, I totally agree. We really need to move away from that traditional go to school, get a degree, and then find a formal job, grow old, retire, and die. That's really... <laughs> we, we really yeah, we really need to move away from that. I have a friend who has been in the UN spaces for a while, and they keep on telling him, go and do a PhD, go and do a PhD. But he has refused, but he's doing amazing things. Does that PhD really mean if I don't have a PhD, I can't do anything? Uh, speaking of education, I feel like we are uh, moving away from informal education. I am so happy to have the indigenous people in our Midis. I've been at their pavilion and the knowledge that they come with, how do we protect our lands, how do we grow our food, how do we store our food, we are losing out on that knowledge. Why? We are focusing on that classroom knowledge, yet these people are here, but will they be here for a long time? That's a question for all of us to ponder on. I, the project support for the Global Youth Climate uh, fund. Very ambitious. Why? Uh, because we are talking about climate finance. We want to be able to finance the ideas of young people from across the globe. But yes, you'll tell me about the other funds that are available. Why don't you tap into those? The requirements for those funds are very hilariously hard for us to tap into because the asks are many and we do not really qualify. So the question that we are trying to answer for the young people is how do we simplify these asks? If you have an idea, can we grow that idea together? Can we find the funding for that idea without me asking you for how big is your CV? How many PhDs do you have? How many degrees do you have? Can we just tap into the idea that you have and then find money for that? So that's the, one of the gaps are trying to bridge. Again, even when I go to a bank and I'm trying to find a loan, what's the equity? How, what's your value? How much are you worth? I'm just 26. I've not worked for even 10 years. I'm just straight out of the university. So I don't own property. Where I come from in Uganda, land ownership is a huge issue for young people and for women as well. Yet you would think that should be the quickest equity that I can 
show to the bank, but I don't have access to that. So how do we answer the question of access to finance to make sure that the ideas, the innovations of the 16-year-olds that he's working with actually get to their fifth, tenth, a hundredth birthday without actually necessarily telling them your idea is weak or you actually do not qualify for the big monies. So yeah, in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, and again, an example here of going for what is needed rather than what seems feasible, because I'm sure there are many who are not breaking out of that traditional finance architecture to, to see the need of a Youth Climate Action Fund and to see, see the missed potential here for all of these youth-led projects and initiatives to catalyze climate action. So we need investors to catch up and, and see that you know that's that's what they need to be channeling their finances toward, not this very restrictive model. Now, next, we're very happy to hear from Miro, <laughs> who has done so much to bring us together today and so many other events, so the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you very much, Masamba, for the opportunity to have our young uh, climate activists, uh, innovation leaders here and to envisage uh, alternative fu futures, pathways towards a climate safe future. So my, uh, my name is Miroslav Polzer. I'm with the International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges. And our name says already that it's a very uh, a good fit that we are here. We feel very much at home because uh, Global Innovation Hub and innovative approaches to global challenges fit uh, well together. So uh, we have the aim to engage, inspire, and empower everyone to take climate action. And we have three pillars. One is culture, technology, and organizational innovation. And uh, with this, uh, we uh, try to build intergenerational partnerships also with young people, because uh, there are such great uh, idea generators, entrepreneurs, uh, Whatever, it's uh, so much potential which needs additional resources uh, to really flourish. And uh, for this, there's needed um, intermediaries, uh, an enabling ecosystem which connects the local action, the local people with global goals and with global resources. And that's what we are working on. Also, especially in partnership with the UN, but also uh, building new st structures, new institutions for this new thinking. And on Wednesday next week, we will present our plans to setting up a United Citizens Organization for Action for Climate Empowerment, which will be a blockchain technology-based uh, quasi-international organization, which will collect resources and uh, then distribute it uh, collaboratively and transparently to this youth climate action. And I would like to conclude by uh, asking Sylvie to uh, screen now to show the ah, here, uh, to show now the video from our digital art for climate initiative. Uh, we have invited artists uh, to contribute their artwork. We have received 205 submissions, and we are Hi, going. I'm Anna Dar from Exquisite Workers, and I'm absolutely delighted to be invited to speak at COP26. Uh, uh, could you perhaps go? In a challenging year for so many, we are excited to introduce you the results of the art competition for climate change led by the Digital Art for Climate. We hope the stories of the artists from all over the world can inspire us to forge new and deeper connections with ourselves and others and the planet Earth. 208 applications are received from 58 countries to inspire climate change. All sorts of media represented, digital and animated artworks, digitized watercolor, oil, acrylic works, mural paintings, collage art, generative art, films and dance, installations and voice, jewelry, fabrics, even magic tricks. 30 finalists which make COP26 collection come from Morocco, Iran, Serbia, US, Mexico, Switzerland, Russia, Philippines, Australia, UK, Spain, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Guatemala, Canada, Kenya, Chile, France, Slovenia, Kazakhstan and Ukraine. The youngest artist finalist is only 10 years old. 
Submissions introduced deep awareness and understanding of the climate urgency, personal, original, and creative responses to climate change, displayed a high level of technical art skills, and showcased interesting approaches and emerging new talent. Really difficult to select the winner. We are blessed with having the opportunity to impact our world with the transformational power of art and eco-friendly blockchain technology together. The NFTs reflect a historical moment and a shift in the modus operandi of the art world. The NFTs make us think in a scale of millennia. With the digital art for climate, we hope to create something greater together that the world will remember. And this starts right now and depends on us. Cast your winner at www.digitalartforclimate.space. Thanks and see you next year. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Give you the been uh, done by Anna Dart, our creative director, and it's uh, really inspiring to see. And this helps us also to get out of the old patterns and uh, look for new thinking, new solutions, new society, no, new global society that works more effectively together. And uh, if I briefly may give the floor uh, to Catherine. Catherine, if you could uh, say a few words uh, about your success with uh, this kind of approach with Open Earth Foundation, that it, it inspired us as well, very much, and Catherine is a key partner also for this. Oh, thanks, Miroslav. Very unexpected. I, I really do want to congratulate all of you for your initiative and uh, for your expertise. And before we talk about Carbon Drop and uh, the work that Open Earth has been doing, I do want to say, and I repeat myself consistently, that Back when I was a Canadian diplomat on Human Security Network, we managed to bring in youth as experts, not just as witnesses, not just as voices, but as delegates to the UN General Assembly. To me, this was a major accomplishment for a number of reasons, because youth are experts, not only in their own experience, but actually bring skills and knowledge and capacities to the fore, and actually manage to innovate on the ground during very challenging times. So I, I think we are witnessing that here today. Second, I want to say thank you to Miroslav and to all of you. With Open Earth Foundation and the Social Alpha Foundation, we managed to have one of, I think, the most successful NFT digital art drops and raised um, $6.6 .6 million for Open Earth Foundation. And this funding was made possible because of the inventiveness and the initiative of being able to bring the digital world, the art world, and the climate world together. And I think it breaks down silos. It speaks to the need for new innovative financial models, finance models for, um, for climate especially and for youth initiatives. And we also want to call out all of you and Beeple, the artist who, um, and Refik Anadol, who will be here next week. Um, all of the artists, there were seven artists who also made a statement on NFTs and their energy consumption. So it flowed both down the value chain and up the value chain and across all the actors and ecosystem. And to me, this was the, the key part of the success, the message that our digital world has to be more sustainable and that the digital world does bring with it the capacities for new models for innovation around climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and with this I would uh, conclude and say to the young people here as well as to the UN system, we, you have a partner here in our organization, IAI Glotcha. We will innovate the space and we will mobilize resources and there will be a more effective response if we work all together. And with this I give back the floor and wish everyone again a wonderful young and public empowerment day at the COP26. Uh, and we have a, a reception, 6.30 upstairs, you are very welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Miro. And yes, definitely again showing how technology has a role to play in innovation, but links surprisingly over to art and all these other areas of human expression, which are so very critical to humanity and how we're going to be able to move forward. And on this note, we have a perfect segue into our next speaker, 
who is going to connect us into youth and music. So, Sol, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you, Mirza, for organizing this and everyone who's involved and for hosting us here uh, in the Hub. Um, my name is Moran Sol Broza, and I grew up with music in my home. My father and mother are from the music industry, singing about peace, love, and harmony all my life. Um, when I was a child, UNICEF uh, chose one of my father's songs as the anthem for their 50th anniversary, and it really shaped who I am today because I was chosen as one of the children to sing on that song. We ended up inviting all of our friends from uh, high school and, <clears throat> and uh, elementary school to sing with us. And we felt as though we were doing something significant that was really going to help other children in the world. I carried that song in my heart all my life and about 13 years ago, I was a chef doing relatively well in my uh, career, working in Michelin star restaurants in Europe, um, some you might know. And I realized that while I'm preparing food for the rich of the world who can afford eating in that restaurant, there are so many hungry people everywhere. And I thought, there has to be something that can be done. And I started a research project that became an educational uh, pro uh, project uh, where I started collecting value-based experiential education from all over the world, thinking if we could all learn certain skills and values and principles at an early age, could the world look a bit different? <laughs> and today, 13 years later, and sitting up here, standing up here with some of the people who I call my favorite people on the planet, um, who I think are really leading the way, I mean, Technically speaking, anyone who's here at COP26, it's a real honor to be here amongst these people. Out of the 7.6 billion people on our planet today, we are here doing what we can, connecting together. We are here, we're finding each other, and the answer that we found is that together is the way that we're going to be able to overcome climate change. And we need a critical mass to make a change. If every single one of us did something little every day, then the world would already look better. In addition to having system change and policy change, which we're also working so hard to do, even the last two years since the last COP, day and night some of us haven't slept trying to figure out what we can do to help, to help the leaders change and pave the way for us. So. I thought, why not bring back that song and teach the world? It goes like this. I'm going to read you some of the words just so you can understand. And um, it says, Even though they have the least, the innocent seem to pay the most. The highest price, the greatest sacrifice in a world not of their making. Everyone in their own little world wondering, how did it get this way? We all start out as a boy or a girl with hopes and dreams. We pray that life can be full, that life can be fair. There's plenty for all, enough for us to share. And then it asks a question. It says, how? And the answer is, together, together, together all as one, together, together, it can be done. You can't turn from your fate and expect it to go away. It'll be in your face, leave a bitter taste that returns again and again. Kind of reminds me of climate change. And then it says, so gather up your strength, go out and tell your friends. Any action, even a fraction, makes a difference in the end. The future starts here and now and can be bright. The hopes of tomorrow are born this night. Together, together, together all is one. Together, together, it can be done. So with these friends here on stage, watching and observing how everyone's working on really, really using our voices to help the leaders hear that we need to implement mandatory climate change in all ministries of education if we're going to really get it right and if we really want to get that critical mass in the small window of opportunity that we know we have, then wouldn't we be better off if we all knew what was going on? Therefore, climate change, I mean, climate education, because that's information. Once we know the information, we can't unknow it, and that's when we are really activated. So I'll 
close off with teaching a little hand signal and uh, a 30 second little video to show you. We're going to launch uh, a campaign inviting everyone to sing together. And with that, hope to also raise awareness and raise funds to raise uh, money to build a platform to collect the educational content that's out there and sustainable solutions that we know we have. And it goes like this. Tim, can I ask you to hold the mic for a sec? Maybe you can follow me a little, but at the end, yeah. OK. So just hold it on speak. We are one. Open it up. It's a B. See it? Together, we are being based on three principles of respect to ourselves, others, and life. It's about me, it's about we, and together we are being and D, doing. Together they create an infinity. Together we're building a home made with love. And together we rise up to be one. Thank you. Here we go. Thanks for the opportunity. Very inspiring, and again, showing us how music connects to innovation, connects to youth-led climate action. To Because again, it, it's not the planet that's at risk, it's humanity. And so all these humanistic elements of our existence need to play a role as well in how we get ourselves out of this mess that we created. <laughs> so with this, uh, we're very happy to open the floor for reactions, questions, discussion, other ideas. Anything that anyone may wish to share or react? Yes, and is this, just give it this microphone, okay. I'm Dusan Borevich, I'm professor of electrical engineering at Virginia Tech in the United States. Uh, uh, first, a comment uh, that you said uh, it's a couple hundred year old way we are teaching. You're wrong. It's a couple thousand years old. <laughs> it's way outdated, and I agree with you 100%. <laughs> and this is most outdated activity, I think, of all we do. And I'm a professor, and I'm ashamed of myself. <laughs> so that's, that's really true. <laughs> um, and the second is, uh, as uh, Catherine mentioned, about learning from the young. OK, you guys were the first fun I had here in five days. <laughs> Finally, I know why I'm here. I mean, the only other fun thing was to get the espresso there. This is unbelievably much better. And that's the last point, just a message. Uh, we are not, you know, let's save our planet so we don't die. That's horrible. I'll just die right away. <laughs> let's have fun while we are saving the planet. And that's what you're telling me, and I'm so happy to learn it from you. Thank you. All right, that may be a tough question to follow, but yes. <laughs> hmm? um, yeah, are there other questions or comments? <laughs> Admittedly, that's a difficult one to follow, perhaps, but... No, I have also a comment related to, to education. I agree that there is a lot of things that can be improved when it comes to education. And uh, I was mentioning last day I went to a restaurant, and when I get into the restaurant, the first thing I saw was a cut from Albert Einstein saying that smart people, uh, clever people, know how to solve a problem. And wise people know how to avoid problem. 
I'm wondering whether our education should not be more focusing on making wise people and on building wisdom. Now it's switched on. Yes. Uh, yes. I think that's the most succinct panelist response I've heard today. <laughs> uh, okay, yes, I'm seeing some more hands. So yes, I think I saw it here and then we'll go there. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this was incredible. It al I also thought it was so fun and very inspirational. Um, my name is Emily Perry. I'm a graduate student at Duke University in the US. Um, and I'm here with, well, next week, it'll be 12 other Duke students. Um, and so my question is, how do we bring this energy and this innovation back to Duke? You know, also a very large, older institution that can be you know, set in its ways in some ways. but. Um, yeah, anything in innovation and, and music especially, I loved that idea. Um, and so, yeah, any, any ideas, I just, I wanna be able to carry this back. Uh, I think I'll attempt that. So you've been here and then you say this is, has been one of your most inspiring sessions. Go back and tell your story. What is it about the COP that actually stood out for you? Go tell your lessons and the things that you've learned because the people that are not here, when they hear your story, they would want to actually, how do I get involved? How do I be like Emily who made it to the COP, learned these lessons and now is coming back home and applying them? Then there will be more other Emilies and then the cycle continues. Thank you so much. Thanks for the great sessions. My name is Jin Chaka. I'm from Japan as a member of the Global Youth Development Institute. And uh, I'm so right, uh, loved to the, these sessions. I'm so happy to join to the, these sessions. So I have a question for you. It's like, uh, now we are facing to that to enforce. And we, don't have, I, we, we, we are sure we have already convinced that we don't have a time to, uh, to reach out to the climate change engagement before the, some uh, some point, I mean tipping point, and that time to be, we have to innovate uh, some technologies, cultures, everything. So that time I would like to ask the, how can we enforce to collaborate to the many sectors like a country, uh, companies, industries, uh, NGOs, governments, and so on from the youth. Just I want to know. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I think that's what everyone is kind of here to, to solve. Um, I, I feel like you, 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 you said force, right? You said force collaboration. I don't think you can force collaboration. If you, if you tell two kids to play, they, they don't play. Um, but, you, sorry, is there something you want to add? Just I would say, not force, like manage. Manage, yeah. yeah. A, a big part of, for, first of all, I think there is a lot of collaboration happening. Um, it, and then there is a lot of innovation happening. I, I guess on the, on the timeline and urgency point, uh, I, I like to say that patient people succeed fast and impatient people fail faster. Uh, so, so one of the biggest mistakes we can make is to try to do things too fast. And I don't mean this in a way that, you know, hey, look, we have time, climate change, whatever, you know, let's just keep doing. It's not what I mean. Uh, but I, 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 what I do mean is that we should take time to Re to plan things and, and think about what we will do, both you know locally, nationally, and globally, and then execute. This is why, like every COP, is what I said before. Every COP, it seems like people say, "Let's start this." Stop starting things. It's like you could do things for a couple, like for a decade or two, and get them done. Um, and, and, you know. Uh, so I, I feel like collaboration is already happening to a large part. N international collaboration has taken a huge hit over the last few years. That's just a political problem. I don't really know if we can do anything about that except just knocking on doors and being like, hey, you two, like, please. But, you know, uh, on, a, on a sector and industry piece, 
I, I think in collaboration has been happening, and innovation, as long as it is incentivized and as long as we don't subsidize fossil fuels, knock, knock, um, which we do now, knock, knock, uh, we, we will get innovative and, and clean approaches uh, piercing through and, and entering the market. I mean, the market is very, very simple. If, if you make something better and cheaper and you don't subsidize the other thing to kind of artificially push that thing down, it's, it's going to succeed. So. Um, what can you do? What can we all do? We can know about it. So again, it's still education. The more we know, the harder we are to fool. And if, if we're easy to fool, the carbon footprint, by the way, was popularized by an oil company. So if you go on through life and tell people to reduce their carbon footprint, you're a free marketing employee of, the, of oil companies. Uh, I'm not joking. I know it's funny. It's so, it's so good that it's funny, but it's true. This is, this is true. Uh, so we should all go through the world and tell everyone that climate change is incredibly complicated, that it will take decades to solve it, and that we need a good plan to do it, that we need both innovation and urgent action on what we already have, that we need collaboration and all that stuff that everyone at COP talks about, but actually go do it. And do it thoughtfully, do it mindfully, do it as fast as possible, not faster, and don't let the oil companies influence the communication around it. I'm going to add to that um, because I agree. And I think it's, um, it's places like COP that can make those collaborations accelerate and expedite because we find each other. And if there's one thing I've thought about how um, humans develop technology and now we can use technology to work for us, uh, Zoom was a great example in the last two years that helped us all connect, find each other. And then places like that, we're meeting in person right now. We're able to swim in a sea of people right now who are either developing solutions, looking for solutions, creating solutions. And I'd say, you know, the people sitting here, I know them because of and thanks to COP and technology. And we've been able to merge our minds and our hearts and our visions and our missions to even from here moving forward, many more things are going to be able to move faster. But what we need is also what was said before, is for each of us to use our voices, to bring it back home, to amplify it on all our networks. We have to, our voices and our choices are what matter. And it's a uh, you know, choice of what to buy, also what to do with our time. It's what we create and it's what we leave off. And that therefore sharing our information, if it's on social media, to share the, the things that inform us um, so that other people can have access to that. And at the end of the day, I would say uh, there are a few people in this room pushing for that mandatory education, climate education. Um, hopefully it'll be implemented as soon as possible because then it'll reach a critical mass. But each one of us has our own influential impact uh, whether it's 10 people, a million people, or a billion people who hear us, but we just need to keep telling other people to use their voices so more people are aware. I just wanted to put in two cents because your questions are so pertinent. And um, my past roles have been really quite... Uh, quite interesting because it's involved youth, but it's also involved innovation and bringing partnerships and collaborations together to the fore. So with my old, or the organization I previously worked with, Climate Kick, we scaled up over thousands of startups and, you know, at least um, 15 Forbes 30 under 30. And what I'm finding, especially in the culture, the, the, the student from Duke, for example, you know, North American education, I grew up in Canada, North American education is still very siloed, it's still very uh, sectoral based, it's very subject based. And it was revolutionary for me to come over to Europe where um, the EU climate kick, for example, one of the partners of the hub has this this thing called a journey, and it's a summer student, a summer student program, but it brings masters and PhD students from all disciplines together for that, edu you know, revolutionary educational um, approach with inputs from top experts from all fields, and it engages them in bringing out innovations themselves and new business models. And the second part of that, I think, is the culture of innovation and collaboration. Collaboration and innovation are a trope, aren't they? They're, they're used so ubiquitously that they've almost lost meaning. And I think what we need more of is more meaningful collaboration and, and um, 
innovation and the tools to do that. You know, SDG 17 is partnerships. Well, where are the tools for that? Where are the frameworks? And I think it starts here too. You've brought forward some awesome tools and a lot of that is the digital platforms. And I think that's why something like the hub is so important because it's going to bring out a new approach based on needs, based on the needs voiced from all actors. And I think that is going to really shift the way we collaborate and the way we innovate. So thank you all very much. I just wanted to add one more piece, which I think uh, was mentioned earlier as though it's something that we less talk about in climate change, and that's funding. Um, money is energy, and it's a resource, and it's a joker card. and. Um, the world is shifting, yeah, the pandemic is here, we're all still trying to adjust and find ourselves. We have to reorganize and reorder and, you know, it's, it's happening step by step. Um, but if we can get the funding in a place where we can then find the projects and the people who are willing and wanting to put their time forward towards moving in the right direction and getting the critical mass to be informed with the education that's out there, it will organically happen and I just wanted, uh, wanted to talk about that because by putting it on the table I think it's uh, important that we sustainability community people be more comfortable to say hey world we need to find you know we need to funnel in the the resources so that we can empower the right people they're out there there are lots of us and with that we can amplify and multiply thank you I'm looking for other comments or interventions from the floor. And uh, uh, yes, please. Miro, Miro, go ahead. It's emerging, it's emerging. Uh, join us next Wednesday, 12.30, in the press conference room where we will announce the United Citizens Organization for Action for Climate Empowerment. Blockchain technology based. We will uh, have digital art for climate as one of the resource mobilization streams, uh, voluntary carbon footprint compensation, crypto stamps, uh, where we think that an annual European, uh, average uh, uh, European should pay around 500 euros per year investing in local and global communities' capacity to handle the consequences of our. Uh, damage that we're doing with the current high carbon uh, lifestyles. We will have uh, initial coin offering, social impact investment opportunities, technology projects as an investable uh, point, uh, digital bonds, uh, something that uh, Catherine is also an expert on and also EverCity. So there are many new ways how we can mobilize resources and we really are aiming for a multi-billion ecosystem uh, where climate action impact uh, will be traded because these initiatives here they are creating uh, climate action impact uh, very valuable public goods uh, for which the society nowadays is not yet organized to identify it and reward it but this is the most critical resource of uh, on the on earth and we have to find uh, this mechanism to have uh, data and evidence-based identification of relevant action and impact and to channel resources, as so has said. And we aim to lead in this field together with you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so in all this talk about money, who here has been doing voluntary climate work? You're not getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah, who, who has a project that you could do it tomorrow if you had money? <laughs> hey, okay, good. So, see, see, all right. So take note, investors. You know, there's going to be a lot of these exciting platforms coming up, whether it's an ACE marketplace, a Youth Climate Action Fund, or the Hub, or Global Citizen platforms, you know, we are doing this. We're putting the innovation in place. And there are people who need it, and we can scale it up. Are there, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, indeed. I'm Aladdin Yusuf from Sudan, founder of uh, Center for Feminist Studies in, in Darfur, uh, eastern part of Sudan. Uh, I think one of the things that we need to develop uh, throughout the innovation 
it's not the it's not the technology itself it's in a cultural innovation and the social innovation <coughs> why is that we are seeing that indigenous people here fighting for the rights with no with no support so what we need to do there um, and we had a lot like an, an a incredible experience in this field in in, in the area of uh, Jebel Mara in, in, in Darfur. So uh, the people, they need it, that uh, they need to put their effort uh, in in innovative way in order to combat the, 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 the climate crisis and the impact of climate change and in their own field. Uh, <coughs> as we all know that Mara Mountain or Jebel Mara Mountain is um, uh, classified as uh, one of the uh, uh, rich zone of, of rainfall throughout the years. Right now, people there they suffering of lack of uh, of rainfall creation because because of this climate change. What we need to do there is to develop the issue of uh, social innovation, cultural innovation, in order to uh, be able to adapt their, their 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 life within the new circumstances of the climate change. Cultural innovation and adaptation, also very crucial. Yep. Now we are running down to our last few minutes. If there are any remaining comments, it's been an excellent discussion. Ah, oh, yes, panel responses, please. I think I wanted to speak on social innovations, especially in line with finance. Uh, back home, there's an organization called the 40 Days Over 40 Smiles Foundation, and their focus is on literacy for young kids. When they started out, they knew it was going to be very hard for them to tap into grants, to tap into funding of the likes, and also getting loans. So what they do is how they run their campaign is they put on events, like she said, use ads, and then people will come and pay entry fees, and that money is now the money that actually supports the literacy programs in the communities. If I'm able to tell him my story, him my story, and they buy into it and they relate to it, even that little, even if it's as little as one dollar or in my currency, a thousand shillings, which is not even close to a dollar, that can go a long way in actually supporting the work that we do. So even when we are looking for funding, the money can actually come from ourselves. The little that we put aside, even our time, we all raise our hands that we are volunteering with the work that we are doing within the climate change space. If we are to equate that into money, how much would we be paid? That alone is the funding that we are actually contributing. So we should not beat ourselves down and say, oh, actually there's no funding. No, we're actually funding ourselves with that time that we are actually investing to get the work done. All right, last chance. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> you know, I will. I will just conclude saying that this has been a very amazing exchange, very uh, energizing, um, and full of of hope. So for me, it's really interesting to to. Uh, see again that we can be hopeful because the younger generation got it right. And that for me is the most important thing. So it means that things will, will, will happen. We just need now to put more effort to accelerate, but things will, will, will happen. I'm completely convinced that the change that we are contemplating will, will, will take place. So thank you for your contribution. It was really amazing. Thank you.
Thank you. I think we're going to be setting up for the next session. Thank you. We're going to be setting up for the next session. Thank you very much. The next session is on Project Genesis, the Bank of International Settlements, Digital Green Bonds. It'll be starting in just a few moments. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the UNFCCC Innovation Hub. My name is Catherine Foster. I am the Community Director of Open Earth Foundation. We are having a session now. Thank you. I'm here to present on behalf of the Bank of International Settlement, Project Genesis which is the first green finance project. It explores the green art of the possible through combining blockchain, smart contracts, internet of things, and digital assets. It was developed in consonance with the takeaway from the BIS Green Swan Research Report, which we can also find online, which basically stated that climate change involves complex collective action problems that require increased coordination among governments, the private sector, civil society, and the international community. The Bank for International Settlement Innovation Hub in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority joined forces with the tech industry. And the aim was to build a prototype, a digital infrastructure that can enable green investments and help issuers and governments to meet environmental and sustainability goals. The work is guided by a panel of experts, of which I am honored to be one, and Masamba is also on this advisory committee, and private sector, civil society, and international community. The next slide, please. In fact, there are three reports. You can click through to the next bullets, please. There are three reports, and the invited participants um, basically come uh, based on area of focus and expertise to explore the tokenization of green bonds and enabling investments in small denominations combined with real-time tracking of environmental outputs. So the aim is the tokenization of a government-issued green bond to retail, and the goals are to mobilize and engage the retail investors, achieve government's green targets, and the development of a new fintech ecosystem overall. 
The next slide, please. Now, when we think about why, why digital green bonds are really important, and to date I note that there is still no end-to-end -end digital green bond prior to these pilots. There have been elements on that end-to-end -end value chain, but none that actually achieved the full arc. And this actually comes from one of the reports that I brought in to my own chapter in the report based on work with the Green Digital Finance Alliance. It basically states that investing in green bonds can be extremely cumbersome and complex. It involves many steps and many parties. It typically requires a considerable financial commitment from the investor for climate and green projects. There is uncertainty about whether the bond issuer is delivering the positive impacts it's purporting to and which it committed to at issuance. And typically there is no liquidity and no transparent secondary markets for retail investors. And as I said, to date, no end-to-end -end digital bond. And the reason digital technology, blockchain, etc., are important because we can minimize the number of intermediaries, there's immediate distribution, there's enhanced security, there's real-time proof of impact, and all of this means efficiency as well as finality of settlement. Next slide, please. Project Genesis is actually three core reports. It was guided by, as I said, a multidisciplinary panel of experts in environmental, social, and government, ESG, green finance, bond markets, law, and regulation, each of whom contributed an article to the first report, giving their views on key aspects of their areas of expertise. And the first report is actually a compilation of these articles, each produced as a standalone contribution by the authors. They can be read individually or in conjunction with the rest of the report, and they're clustered really quite logically. The views given are, of course, those of the authors um, and may or not be those of the BIS, but it was really important to bring in that expertise to really understand the robustness of the business model and the demand and the need. The report offers a broad perspective from these experts on how finance can drive the transition to a green and sustainable future. It's quite visionary and forward-looking content. Um, and it includes a number of really core themes, including the prototypes themselves, the rise of the global green bond, the spotlight on tokenization, a perspective on the millennial generation, green transparency, how to prevent greenwashing, for example, and a glimpse into the future, as well as a glimpse into what they call the book of Genesis, including carbon markets and nested climate accounting. Next slide, please. The requirements for blockchain utility in this case was to develop a software to manage beneficiary interests over its life, lifestyle that featured a registry, a transaction validation and data storage capacity. Next slide. A coupon and notional payment. And a minimum uh, notional investment. Retail user app is all, was also really important to this. Next slide, please. As I said, there were three reports. The first is the experts. And each of the other reports were the technical prototypes. The prototypes outlined in these um, were actually based on the input and the, the builds by the chosen partners. And these are vendors who were chosen to develop the partners and they included six altogether across two consortiums. And they bring to life the vision that an investor can download an app and invest in any amount into a safe bond which will develop a green project. Over the bond's lifetime, the investor can not only see the accrued interest, but also track in real time how much clean energy is being generated, how much impact is happening, and the in terms of the consequent reduction of CO2. Emissions linked to the investment. Further, the investor can sell the bonds in a very transparent market. And report two sets out the prototype with the Liberty Consortium, including SC Ventures, Standard Charter Bank and Shareable Asset SMF Alfrina Hong Kong. It is built, this is interesting, it's built on a public permissionless platform 
decentralized open source blockchain network on Stellar in production use with IBM Wire and Circle. And this is important because it actually brings in low freeze, low latency, and an energy efficient consensus mechanism. It is purpose built for financial assets with flexible transaction and asset mechanisms. The third report, a prototype for green bond tokenization by Digital Asset and GFT, targets the full bond life cycle, deploying multiple permission distribution ledger platforms. And this highlights the advanced capacities uh, and interoperability that complements the Liberty solutions. So these two prototypes were built in parallel to be complementary. This course blockchain agnostic and hence not direct competitors to the other build. And it is private permission network and is able to support multiple ledgers, including the potential for the Stellar network. Next slide, please. And here we have actually the link um, I've created a QR code here. The two links actually go to two videos that we can now show, produced by the BIS on these reports. Could we show the first video, please? Did you know that a third of all adults are unbanked? That's 1.7 billion people around the world and that the safest asset any citizen can invest in are inaccessible by most, especially in emerging economies. One of the biggest issues in our financial system today is that it wasn't built for the average Joe. But Liberty is here to level the playing field. Liberty is on a mission to make government bonds more accessible to retail investors through a secured digital financial ecosystem. Liberty will be the platform that extracts the best aspects of blockchain technologies to directly connect citizens with the government and allow any citizen to buy the nation's safest asset. Anyone can now save and grow their savings with improved retail investor experience and a quicker turnaround, leveraging traceability of assets and transactions on the blockchain and allowing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. at your fingertips. But that's just the beginning. The Liberty prototype for Project Genesis is innovated and designed in conjunction with the BIS Innovation Hub Hong Kong to help residents take direct ownership in Hong Kong's green future. Retail investors can not only directly purchase the green bonds in minimal denominations, but also check their contributions live and measure their real-time impact on Hong Kong's environmentally friendly and sustainable growth within this secured financial network and with the ability to exchange bonds peer-to-peer, -peer, the possibilities are limitless. By making it easy for citizens to save and grow their wealth while contributing directly to the nation's future, the social impact Liberty will have is undeniable. By increasing accessibility, breaking down existing barriers for wider bond adoption. Liberty hopes to become a medium for greater economic inclusion and sustainable growth. Liberty will be a true democratizer for your nation's financial system. Thank you, that's the video for the first prototype, Liberty, the Liberty-based consortium. And I'd like to now show the second prototype video. If we could have that video. I think it's really the important. The Bank for International Settlements Innovation Hub and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority have joined forces to deliver the next generation of tokenized asset infrastructure. This new digital infrastructure will not only offer greater efficiency and transparency across green investments in the Hong Kong market, it will also help issuers and governments meet their environmental and sustainability goals. To alleviate many of the complexities associated with green bond issuance and to demystify uncertainties surrounding green impact, BIS and HKMA launched Project Genesis. Our first goal is to empower retail. 
we want to make possible investing in government green bonds in a simple way via an app that shows accrued interest and green impact in real time. Furthermore, we want to empower retail to own green bond finance projects in their neighborhood. Our second goal is to foster achieving Hong Kong's green targets. The Hong Kong SER government has set ambitious carbon emission reduction goals. Tapping retail to realize aspiring green projects helps Hong Kong to fulfill its climate obligations under the Paris Agreement. Our third goal is to explore and foster a new financial ecosystem. Distributed ledger technology is becoming an important building block of future financial systems. Project Genesis helps familiarize market participants with this new technology architecture. Project Genesis demonstrates that digital assets residing on blockchain can enhance efficiency by shortening bond settlement from T plus two to near real time, while also connecting the segregated order books managed by multiple banks and brokers. Project Genesis is guided by a panel of experts in environmental, social, and governance specialties to ensure success across the Hong Kong financial ecosystem and to ultimately drive meaningful impact on global environmental change. Thank you. I think what's also very important to note here is the capacity that the digital prototypes have what I would call accessibility. We have here accessibility of the user through an app and through those prototypes, as you see how easily they are accessible to the, the bond and financial markets. The second part of that is the capacity to aggregate smaller green projects into an investable unit. And I think that is also extremely revolutionary and necessary to to impart here. I would like to now ask Masamba if he would speak to perhaps his chapter and to the UNFCCC framework and how this relates. Thank you. Now this is an, uh, so first of all, good after, good morning, good uh, evening, good, uh, um, afternoon to those that are following us um, remotely. My name is Masamba Choi. I'm uh, the executive of the UN Climate Change Global Innovation Hub. And uh, I'm also part of the, of the advisory committee of this project, uh, Genesis. This project is very important and uh, linked to what we are trying to do under the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. Within the hub, we have a space to mobilize low-cost finance for um, potential solution developer, particularly from, from the south. So it is very important um, if you want to, let's say, um, support innovation, particularly from, from the south, to address two barriers. One barrier is uh, market, and the second barrier is access to low-cost finance. Because finance is, cost, the cost of finance is very high, and uh, particularly for projects that need uh, vertical transfer, uh, for um, innovation, innovations that need vertical transfer and are not yet mature, um, having finance to support them is very costly. So we wanted to have within the innovation hub space where um, a specific type of green bond that could be tokenized can um, actually issued by, by um, jurisdictions. It could be a government or a subnational. This type of um, um, green bond can provide financial resources that could then be used to um, finance those that are developing uh, climate and sustainability solution. So this is something that is very much um, um, aligned with what we are trying to do. And um, because generally what we have seen is there are many, um, there are many platform for solution, but there are filing solutions that are never implemented on the ground because of these two barriers. They do not have market, they do not have finance. So it was really important for us to have on our platform 
financial solution. Thank you, Ms. Amba. And I think an element also, it's financing uh, that can go to those very localized projects that actually are on the ground, that capacity to aggregate them and to add in programmable money on uh, programmable elements. So in the chapter I did, for example, bringing in solutions like Hive Online or AWAC, which is um, an association of women agricultural, climate-friendly agriculture, gender support, you could have a mixed gender bond in that, in that solution. Right now, most of the green bonds actually go to to your typical sector's energy, for example, um, and the capacity to aggregate smaller energy projects is really exciting. But imagine what we can do in the forward thinking about this, using the programmable smart contracts, AI, IoT, et cetera, to actually start aggregating and, and linking in those existing local community projects and being able to build them and bring them into this type of financial uh, mechanism. I would like now to uh, open for any questions, uh, recognizing that I am neither a financial nor a technical expert. I am the person who bridges uh, the three of those, if you will. Hello, uh, Matthew Baldwin, European Commission. Thank you very much, Catherine Masomba, for a fascinating uh, presentation. I'm interested from the perspective of trying to put together uh, a program of 100 climate neutral cities, and I'm very attracted by the local investor potential here. We've seen this in one or two cities in Europe that have already taken the plunge, like Leuven, bringing local investors in to invest. And what better way to 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 to, to drive people towards uh, the, the, a, a green future than being able to invest in their own neighborhoods? So my question is, um, you're doing it in Hong Kong, which is a financially alive community. Um, uh, there's lots of small investors in Hong Kong. Um, how's it going? What are the, how's it rolling out? What are the drawbacks? Um, I mean, all the, all the advantages you explain in terms of reducing the number of intermediaries, increasing the transparency, in increasing the, well, the individual investor transparency in terms of uh, interest accrual and CO2 reductions. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you very much for that question, and I, I think we'll have to, to be in touch definitely in six months and a year's time, um, because the, the reports and the prototypes were actually released uh, on the 3rd. Uh, so we're at the very beginning of this very interesting trajectory, but absolutely, I think your question is exactly on the mark of what we need to be exploring, um, because this is, this is done in its own sort of little ecosystem, and I think the plan right now for the BIS is to say, okay, Hong Kong Authority, here here are the uh, two prototypes. Do what you will, develop them, let's see how they go. And at the same time, in a parallel track, the BIS will probably be exploring, again, the, the, uh, the research about what comes next, how this can be expanded, scaled up, etc. cetera. Um, do you want to? Go ahead. So for the time being, this is the pilot testing phase. They have not yet implemented implemented the, the, this thing, they are just pilot testing. With how many people in how many neighborhoods? That's the next stage. Yeah. Right now, the technology, the, the technology has basically just been produced, um, and the apps are now um, going out to those the authorities to see you know what the next steps will be. Um, we can put you in touch um, directly with the, the BIS on the exact plans, but uh, I think that is absolutely the, the key next step is what will happen with the pilots, who will the, the users be, um, what will the results be. Uh, this is absolutely the next steps because the, like, like we are doing with the innovation hub here, we've now just got the prototype mocked out through those, that expertise and it's really about the testing phase coming forward. Masamba, did you have something to add? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that the next phase for pilot testing will be done in collaboration with the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. And uh, what we are trying to explore is a new concept of, of, of green bond, where, um, let's say, we have the concept of mitigation outcome security appended to the bond. So a green bond would be a normal bond with appended to it a mitigation outcome security that can be traded. 
together or separately. So this is what we will um, be working on next year. And then one thing that could be really interesting, and I think you make a great point, to test this in different type of environment, not yeah, like in Africa, and see what would be the result. Yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Unfortunately, I think we do have to wrap up the session uh, for the next one. I am open to having additional discussions um, and to put you in touch with the, the core team. And I want to thank Masamba and thank the Innovation Hub for hosting us here today and thank all of you for coming to today's session. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Are you ready to for his video? Are you ready for uh, the next session? Yes. What is it? It's a video. It's uh, this one. Yeah, yeah, it's that one. The first video? Yeah. yeah, I think the video before. Um, Rishan, first the video. Yeah, yes. First the video. Well, they're there, yeah, yeah. First okay. the, well, I can say a few words and okay. then, then we can have Okay. So he would like to say a few words. First a few words, then the video. He, he would like to speak a little bit yeah. and then the video. Okay. He, okay. he gives me a uh, signal word or so, such a thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 work, I'm talking with him yeah. and then we will make you a sign. So you're there? Yeah, I guess we'd like to okay, introduce so you. Here. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's move to our next session, last session today. So thank you for uh, joining us here. Uh, my name is Masamba Choi. I'm the executive of. This initiative, the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub. Um, our next session um, will focus on global intergrid for sustainable energy abundance. Um, I will hand over to Dushan to present this uh, very interesting project. Dushan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Masamba. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Yes, uh, this. Um, opportunity to talk here is really, for me, unique. It's kind of a dream coming through. Uh, 15 years ago, after working um, on, um, uh, you know, how to do electrify electric cars, ships, airplanes, and so forth, I came up with the idea, why not help electrify the whole world in a way that we will not pollute anyone? And started developing that idea as a professor at Virginia Tech with some support uh, from different funding agencies. And then uh, things started happening. And uh, you know, Global Innovation Hub uh, started this year and with the idea of uh, how do we bridge the small incremental, all the good things we are doing with the big goal of 1.5 or no carbon and how the two things connect. And that's a great challenge. And then another one, <coughs> also for Global Innovation Club, can we focus on what's needed 
uh, regardless of whether we can do it right now, let's see what's needed and develop the technologies and innovations to achieve that, if at all possible. And with that, uh, that was really something where I think my ideas fit extremely well. And then we just had a great session now with young guys just before the last one, uh, where it was really inspiring. And today is a youth day at, at the COP, and that's so nice. I'm so glad that I was 30 years a professor and had the opportunity to learn from my students. So whatever I'll be presenting, actually, it's their work. I'm just here to present it to you because they went to other venues in their lives. Uh, and that's, that's a great thing to do. And so many things are happening just in the last three days. Uh, uh, global power system transformation started in April, uh, also as a part of this initiative. Global Energy Alliance just started two days ago. And then One Sun, One World, One Grid was also initiated just a day ago. And this movie or this talk that I will present is actually that topic. Except what I will be presenting, it is revolutionary. And it's not fixing the grid, but let's have the world we want. Mm -hmm. And that's what this topic will be about. And uh, with that introduction, can we go with the movie? If we do not want to pollute ourselves out of existence, and if we want to leave a happier planet to our children, we must seek transformational innovations. This global integrated video is a hopeful story about how to reach sustainable energy abundance when every human being will have all the energy they need and where all the energy will be supplied with net zero carbon emissions. Earth receives over 14,000 exajoules of energy each day from sun, which is 10,000 times more than human daily usage. Even if in 30 years we would use 10 times more energy to supply 10 billion humans using per capita twice as much energy as an average American today, it will still be only about 0.1% of energy that is continuously received by Earth from sun every day. The trick is to use the energy from sun immediately while it is being received instead of using it after it was first stored over millions of years in the fossil fuels. To simplify the discussion, let us assume that all 14 exajoules of the daily energy will be coming from PV panels. With today's technology, this will still be less than 20% of unpopulated sunny deserts in the world. However, Energy consumption is not where production is because we do not live in deserts and our activities change with seasons and between day and night. So it is absolutely necessary to establish a global energy transport network that would continuously balance the varying renewable generation with the variable consumption. There are two big issues though, global transport and the need for extremely fast power flow adjustments. The first issue of global energy supply is over 100 years old. Today, more than one third of the world primary energy is traded internationally, although the adjustment of power flow is extremely slow. Still, over the last 70 years, humanity has succeeded to keep the global energy supply chains almost uninterrupted, even in the face of many geopolitical crises. And the pandemic is reminding us that global problems must use global solutions. On the other hand, in the last 25 years, we built a global internet for instantaneous information delivery between any two humans anywhere around the globe. So we know how to transfer electrical signals freely, instantaneously, and reliably around the globe. Can we use this experience to change the power grid? Well, the first thing is that we cannot just attach internet to the old electromechanical grid and hope that it will solve everything. What we need is a completely new electronic power grid that can balance varying generation and variable consumption with sub-second time delays. The latest advancements in power electronics enable us to adjust huge energy flows in a fraction of a second. 
High voltage direct current technologies are already being deployed around the world for instantaneous transmission of vast amounts of energy through underground and undersea cables over very long distances. It could be calculated that the global intergrid would need thousands of fast HVDC lines around the globe with cumulative power rating of around 9 terawatts to enable instantaneous balancing of the continuously changing peak power demand and generation capacity. Thus, we already have all the basic technologies needed to build the global intergrid, which will be sending packets of electrical energy at the speed of light between any two points on the Earth connected by electrical conductors. Based on these calculations, the total cost of the global intergrid including cables, HVDC stations, and PV panels, is estimated to be around 6% of the global GDP over the next 30 years, which will keep global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade. So the question is not whether we can do it, because yes, we can. The question is, do we want to do it? And why shall we do it? Because we owe it to humankind. Okay, thank you. So that was the introduction. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, Masamba. I just want to mention that Masamba three years ago published a paper called Global Electricity Interconnection, right? Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, that was before the Global Innovation Hub uh, was formed, and I was a part probably of motivation why, why we, this was started, and I'm so glad that this fit uh, perfectly into that. So at this point, I think uh, it's between Masamba and me and you to answer the questions and uh, open any discussion. Well, probably we should not keep them too uh, long because the reception is starting soon, right? So <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I'll open at this point up uh, any questions, comments, or I, you know, I could be talking more, but I did talk quite a bit. Any question if you want some aspect of this to be further elaborated? I kind of got where you're going with it. Can you explain a little bit more how you think it would be transmitted globally through the currently existing power lines or the structures or the cables or the submarine cables? Is it to utilize and, and run on the backbone of that? Is that what you're doing? And my answer to that is no. So this is a new grid that needs to be built. That's why it needs $160 trillion to do it. Uh, now, it must be, obviously we're not stupid, uh, it must be such that as it is being built, wherever it connects to the traditional grid, it's compatible. So like when we were building internet, it had to be compatible with the phones. And you still had, could use your rotary phone to call anyone in China. So that, that thing has to stay that way. But eventually, the uh, whole thing uh, has to be rebuilt in order to do instantaneous uh, balancing across the globe. And, and uh, on the physics side, you can send packets of energy as fast as you can send this to China. That same electricity, same electrons, just going, yeah. You need bigger cables, uh, and it costs more, but uh, uh, the speed is the same. So it could be balanced, but it has to be new one. The old one is electromechanical. It has mechanical switches, and actually somebody has to send a message, either a computer or a person, to say, go and switch this, and then adjust this to happen that. This will happen like the internet rerouting automatically. Okay. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, just to understand, uh, I mean, it seems to me $160 trillion is highly unrealistic against the backdrop of some of the other things going on and the, the huge investments pouring into wind and geothermal and other uh, aspects. So my question is really, is it, uh, do, you get, do, you, do you believe we can derive a linear benefit from uh, a scaled down version of your grand model, is it one for one or do you need to be, to coin a phrase, all in to get any of the benefits? No, it's not scaled up, uh, scaled down, but scaled up, yes. I think yes, it must be done that way. 
by the way, 160 trillion, I mean, actually, the, the, this network itself is half of that. Sure. The other half is wind, solar, and the sources of energy. So this is, so 160 trillion, half is connections, and half is the sources of renewable energy. So, so in your view, you wouldn't be disincentivizing all the existing investments no, 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 into no. alternative. Okay, all I thought it was purely of the PV. Are okay, there, all right. Uh, but what is being disincentivized or being traded? Okay, and that I know. That I don't know the answer. But uh, what is here? The trade-off is between sending electricity and balancing instantaneously around the globe, versus uh, battery and storage. So versus storing it here and not sending it anywhere. Now, storing is a great thing because for nationalistic, it's mine, it's not yours, I'm not going to share with you. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but there will be trade-offs, and it's also financial trade-off. I do believe that this technology is cheaper and requires less resources than doing the same thing with the batteries. But there will be trade-offs. And the second thing is hydrogen. We could be using all this energy, distilling the water, uh, you know, converting it to hydrogen, oxygen, going back and forth. And it will be used for some things. We need hydrogen for steel production, for the uh, transportation fuels and so forth. So there will be trade-offs between this. I still believe that that fundamental number, that we need probably 5% of GDP. However we do it, over the next 30 years, if we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, and not poor carbon neutral. That's a big thing here. Big proposition here, we will be using almost 10 times more energy 2050 than today. Because we'll have 10 billion people and we will convert everything to electricity. I mean, you go to electric cars, it says you're cleaner, you're not cleaner. I'm just burning coal somewhere else to give you electricity for your car. This one is trying to address to solve the complete chain I don't think this is unique, but the scale, I think, is correct. Thank you. Uh, a couple of related questions. So uh, I gather you're talking about solar in, in deserts as sort of the primary energy source. Well, this was a full the calculation example. You're 100% correct. Yeah. Uh, just order of magnitude, how many thousands of gigawatts of solar are we talking about? Well, we are talking uh, how many thousand? Uh, yeah. About a five or more thousand gigawatts. Five, five terawatts. And in, this, in the rectangles that you showed on the map, that's available? Yes, yes. A and are those zo zones are not used by anybody for anything? or That's correct. I mean, no, well, I did not go there to check. Yeah. But I did uh, source, or my team did source the things. Uh, the total size of hot deserts, we didn't look Antarctic and Arctic, but uh, the central deserts that are sandy and unpopulated. Yeah. And there is data on GIS that shows that. And that percentage miles versus how much area ended up 20%. To talk about in to going incrementally, obviously, because no one's going to write a check. Of course. Have you, do you have a path? Like, which is the first line you would connect? The first one would go here, and, it, and that okay. would cost $5 billion? Uh, I, I have a plan. <laughs> Does anybody else want to listen to me? I don't know. I just proposed to our secretary, uh, Greenholm, today after a meeting to build the first line across America, uh, from Washington to, uh, to San Francisco in the next three years. It will take about uh, five or s between five and $10 billion to do that, connect all the national labs and connect the deserts in American deserts with hydro, big hydro that's on that way uh, to demonstrate this as a demonstration project. If we can finish that by the end of this administration, they will be great, Good luck. we can. Yeah. Uh, then extend from San Francisco to China and extend from there to Dakar, Senegal. And, and have you thought? <laughs> so that we build this line and, and this line and the other one and show that it can be done and what are the problems, what are the things that need to be solved and so forth. And you, have you tried to evaluate the rate impact for the Americans that would be served by that system for the electricity that they use? No. The answer it, it would is be no, high, but it would but be it high. Will, it? Yes, at the end. Okay, um, and that's a big part of this. This has to be sold as bringing to population something new, not just survival from, yeah. uh, 
from. Because, uh, I, mean, I mean, we've seen, I don't know if you know, in, in Ontario. Selling this on Africa. And. Uh, yeah. In Ontario, there's a feed in tariff, and it was great, and then rates went up by 5-10%, and everyone blamed the wind power, and big political crisis, you know. Rates I'll are make one big comment. Um, we won't, however we do it, we need to collect that, mu that much, hundreds of trillions of dollars, many estimates, to solve it by 2050. Yeah. Who we charge for that, that society is Somebody else's problem. It. That's the first statement. And the second statement is, Actually, energy from the sun is free. Nobody is charging kilowatt hours. You'll be just taking subscription. Nobody's charging you for the calls here. You pay monthly subscription and you talk as much as you want. This is the system that will work because uh, sun is not perishable as long as we will live. So that's a very different paradigm, but that's what this innovation hub is around. This, is, this must be completely new business model, completely new market strategy, completely new society's commitment. This is an alternative. But if it doesn't go with everything else, like feeding tariffs, forget it. If we start going back how we do the operate the grid today, this will not happen, and we will all suffocate. No, and I, I, I must say that this is very much aligned with what we are trying to promote in the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub, particularly this moonshot way of thinking. So the starting point should always be what is needed, not what is possible. We start with what is needed, and then we look at what is possible, and then the gap is exactly what innovation has to fill. Obviously, there are some issues that are not yet solved, but I think what I like with this type of approach is to be extremely ambitious and say, if you want to solve this global challenge, this is what is needed, and then we use it as starting point, and this is what allows us to formulate the problems that need to be addressed. And then innovation is where it can serve. This is where innovation can serve. Any other question? Our last comment that nobody brought up is actually this piece here. And this is not related just to this, this is related to other solutions, batteries or whatever. Do we have enough? This 160 trillion was using uh, today's prices of the, this technology. Actually, it, it is deployed sporadically in China. Actually, they're building it all the time, but um, sporadically around the world. Um, the prices could go down because maturity, uh, technology matures. And when it scales up, it will go down. But if we really are building something around the whole world in 30 years, there'll be huge scarcity and prices will go up. And uh, I don't know, that estimates could be very wrong. That's one thing. And the biggest thing is, will we run out of the basic materials and resources? And uh, Again, we did the one-day research to say that these critical ones are good. But this is one-day research, don't believe me. <laughs> Somebody has to do much more serious work on this before we can go that path. Yeah. And this is an essential one. And by the way, 6% GDP, 160 trillion is good, horrible money. 6% of GDP, that's the total number of unemployed people in the world. Let's just get them to work, build something for them and all of us. Great. Any other question? So thank you, Professor, for sharing with us your uh, research. It's a great pleasure. As I said, this meeting is my dream come true. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.